majestic mountains, in the middle of a clearing, two men are standing with a shovel and a flag in their hands. It has a black and white pattern on it. One of them was named Kim Su Ho. At the feet of the men stood cute little creatures saying short phrases. Oh no, here the man's name is Roy Frontera. Roy swings a shovel, aiming at the spot. The shovel is firmly embedded in the ground from Frontera's confident movement. A large blue digital grid spreads across the lawn from the point of impact. It is so large that it reaches the foot of distant mountains. This is the story of an ordinary civil engineer. Particles from the grid are transformed into a digital model of a metropolis. This engineer has completely changed the world. All those present watched this fascinating process. Roy turned to his assistant Gabriel, excitedly telling him that it was all money. Roy laughed out loud, which led Gabriel to believe that he was now crazy. A few years ago, when the city was at dusk, Roy received a message congratulating him on being chosen by the Absolute and having the right to make a wish. The man was lying with his head on the table and noticed the message. It went on to say that he had become one of the heroes of the novel The Steel Knight. Roydy was surprised because it was the same novel he had read yesterday. The message ended with wishes of inspiration and good luck. The man is puzzled because he's not even drunk enough to dream about it. Could this be an out-of-body transference, which is so common in web novels? Is he really in another world now? Roy was lying on the ground in the suburbs, but why did he wake up from falling to the ground? He sat up and felt a strong cold chill on his body. His face twisted in confusion as he wondered what was happening to his mouth. The message was about a change in condition, namely a curvature of the mouth as a result of sleeping outside. Royd had already realized this and was getting annoyed by the messages. He realized that he had inhabited the body of the novel's hero. But who did he become in the Night of Steel? A man who lives in a village and sleeps on the road. Suddenly someone called him Master. He was approached by a man in a suit who had been looking for him for a long time. Royd noticed that he had a sword hanging from his belt. The moon was shining on the stranger's light hair. He said, that he would be better off returning to the estate. The stranger turned out to be the protagonist of the Steel Knight, Gabriel Azrahan. Royd was sweating because he looked exactly like the pictures in his novel, and also because of his name. As the story progressed, Gabriel became the most famous swordsman on the entire continent. But at the beginning of the novel, he is just a knight who guarded Baron Arcus Frontera, and also the name of Baron Frontera's eldest son. Did he really mean to say that he was the same prankster, Roy Frontera? The men stood opposite each other, and Roy did not hold back his discontent. Gabriel denied it, even though he said his name, but did not say that he was a prankster. But it's good that he's judging himself correctly. Message. Gabriel looks pleased, and this makes Roy even more angry. In the middle of the forest there is a wealthy mansion, and it's evening. Gabriel lights the fireplace and tries to find out why Roy was lying on the road. After all, the day before he had been drinking since lunch and broke all the dishes in the inn. And then he got homesick and fell asleep on the road, as expected on a prankster's day. The Baron began to worry and sent Gabriel to fetch him. However, even if his son was a prankster, the Baron would feel bad if he was gone. Roy sat on the bed wrapped in a blanket and remembered that there was no heating. Gabriel recommended that he rest, and he would report to the Baron in the morning. When the servant was leaving, Roy turned to him. With a smile he asked if there was much light in their house. He was surprised by these strange words and left the room. Roy sat on the bed and watched Gabriel slam the door. Roy tilted his head and thought, because he knew the whole story. After all, he read the last chapter lying in his narrow room. Therefore, he knows what fate awaits the swarm. At the very beginning of the novel, the Baron and his wife came across vile robbers. In an instant, they lost all their wealth and decided to commit suicide, holding each other's hands. Meanwhile, the swarm begins to beg and drink alcohol incessantly, thus repeating the fate of his parents. 
The man was annoyed by the fact that although they were aristocrats, their lives were as insignificant as in Korea. Was it the absolute or someone else who was up to something? He received a message that he had been chosen by the absolute and had the opportunity to make a wish. But why did he put a man in this body? The next day the weather in the city was beautifully clear. The sun was shining through the windows of the Fronter's mansion. In the hallway, a worried mother of a swarm named Marway Frontera was walking with Gabriel. The mother wanted to know what had happened at the inn yesterday. But Roy denied it because he had been reading a novel that evening. The mother asked her husband to go and apologize. Roy immediately agreed to take responsibility for what he had done because it was his body for which he was responsible. Reports that the mother and Gabriel are surprised by this reaction. The sun was at its zenith. An old man standing in the street was barely loading hay into a cart. Suddenly, his attention was drawn to the men passing by nearby. Gabriel and Roy were walking casually down the street. Roy also noticed the loader, who for some reason suddenly hid behind the cart. The men were puzzled by this reaction. As they continued walking, they noticed that all the passers-by were trying to run away from them. Freud was very concerned about this. A little boy looked out of the window of one of the houses. His father suddenly grabbed him and told him not to look at him. The man immediately closed the window. Royd received a message that the villagers hated him, and he realized it himself. But why was Gabriel following him? The servant refuted that he had to guard him and keep an eye on him so that what happened yesterday would not happen again, but not to protect him, but to protect the residents from him. After all, the swarm is kind of a scoundrel. Moving on, the man thought about the fact that he needed to clean up his image so that he would not go hungry in the future, or at least somehow to deal with the family debt. Then, as the heir to the village owner, he could live in prosperity for the rest of his life. Looking at the messenger, Roy tried to find some kind of cheat and found out what functions it had. He received a message about Roy's skills, namely, being a naughty and drunk. After all, he knows how to make others nervous and become a dog after drinking. Roy was very annoyed by this and started waving his arms as he walked forward. Gabriel called the owner and asked where he was going. After all, the inn was here and was what he wanted to apologize for a lie. Royd replied that he was just thinking. Gabriel looked into the owner's eyes with a serious look. He stood there, not understanding anything. The servant sighed and asked to enter the inn. Royd cautiously opened the door and looked inside. At that moment Gabriel realized that something was wrong with him. It was as if he had become a different person. There were pieces of broken wooden furniture on the floor of the tavern. There was a crack on the wall with a bull skull hanging next to it. Royd sat down on a chair and told the owner that he wanted to apologize to him for his mischief. There was a report that the owner of the inn was on alert. But the owner asked the host to stop with a trembling voice. Or maybe he was even more frightened because such a lowlife as Royd spoke with respect. Then he decided to change his tactics and speak a little rudely. Although this is an improper manner of a person who apologizes. However, the innkeeper said that everything was fine and he did not have to apologize. Royd was embarrassed by this answer. White clouds slowly floated across the sky. Walking along the road, Royd noticed that even after apologizing, the owner's face did not look good. Gabriel agreed with him. After all, all the dishes and furniture that he had broken were purchased with hard-earned money that should have been compensated. Royd was angry because he was already in debt and could not even look good in the eyes of the tenants. If he didn't pay off his debts, nothing would happen. But how? Gabriel added that due to the cold winter, the health of the innkeeper's mother deteriorated, and Royd also made a mess. Royd recalled that it was cold in the tractor, and one fireplace could not cope with such a building. It will be difficult for old people to survive in such cold weather until a floor heating system is invented. Suddenly, the swarm stopped in his tracks. His face showed that he was concentrating. An image of a light bulb appeared in his mind. 
It was as if a current was passed through it, and it lit up. Then the man felt something. Something came to his mind. The light bulb began to emit bright electric discharges. In the owner's eyes was a previously unknown realization of something. And then an idea came to him. The light bulb emitted extremely strong electric discharges. They turned into green particles that flew in different directions, forming complex structures of blocks. Royd realized that there were no underfloor heating systems here. And if you create one in this world, it will definitely sell. For the foolish Royd Frontera, this was not even a dream. But for the real Kim Suho, who was in Royd's body, it was possible. After all, he was a civil engineer, and while in the army, he tried to build a house on his own. Day and night, he worked hard on construction sites. That's right. This is exactly how he would pay off all the debts of the Baron's family. Royd was full of enthusiasm. He turned around and told Gabriel that they were going back to the inn to get the first order. The man received a message about the beginning of his real journey, and he also received points called RP for relationships with others, which are currently zero. Royd thought about what he read in the messages. He thought that it was some kind of experience, even though nothing was explained to him. A new message came that he would be able to get RP by improving his relationship with the main characters. Suddenly, the rogue noticed that a blue sign appeared above Gabriel's head. It indicated the level of interest in the swarm was minus 30. Most likely this is a low level. The man turned to the servant with a smile. He wanted to increase the interest by complimenting the servant. But this reduced Gabriel's interest in him by one point. Having been defeated, the man decided to postpone the matter for later so that it would not get worse. A sign for a beer tavern. Roy carefully filled out the contract, naming the innkeeper as the customer and himself as the contractor. He also specified that all construction costs would be deducted from the amount of compensation for the damage. Roy held out his pen for the owner to sign, even though he didn't believe him. He was not satisfied with this problem of distrust. He couldn't ruin his grand plan from the start. He did not want to use this method. So he decided to talk like a jerk. Royd said that they should trust each other because they would see each other here often. And it worked. The tractor driver immediately signed the contract, even though it was a real rag. Nevertheless, the first contract was signed. Royd was pleased with his plan and assured the owner that he would not regret it. There were white fluffy clouds in the sky. Going out into the yard, Royd shared with the servant that there was no need to make precise calculations, since his plan was not perfect. Gabriel turned to the owner. He called the signing of the contract through blackmail a new level of arbitrariness. Royd gave the servant a suspicious look. Royd assumed that Gabriel did not think logically at all, and was not familiar with the concept of cognitive distortion which meant that if it was like this in the past, it will be like this in the future. This occurs because brain cells contain bad thoughts and stereotypes. Gabriel rephrased it as experience and statistics. But experience and statistics are all in the past, aren't they? Gabriel didn't understand what was happening. Had he ever been so clear before? The servant looked at his master, who said they would smile. Both the innkeeper and his mother would laugh with joy. Roy began to dig with his shovel. He believed that this smile would be the foundation of his livelihood. He dug, carried, tamped, and repeated everything over and over again, while the servant silently watched. He took lumber from a warehouse on the estate and built a central wooden frame as a foundation. This was a traditional Asian method of building from dense wood. Then he applied river clay, and the hull was ready. Roy lay exhausted on the ground chastising the weakness of his body. Gabriel was surprised at the speed of construction in three stages, even though a week had already passed. He seriously wondered where Royd had learned to build. Had Bayan Royd Frontera really decided to honor the agreement? The owner stood bent over in pain in front of the new building, but there was no time to rest. Completely exhausted, he still had to cut the wood. With the last of his strength, the man took a swing. 
and he felt as if something was holding his hands down. Gabriel grabbed the handle of his master's axe. Roy did not understand this gesture and was surprised. But when the servant took the axe out of his hands, he realized that he intended to help. Roy said that he needed boards measuring two to one heel, showing the approximate parameters with his palms. Gabriel confidently throws a few logs up. He makes a clear swing and aims with concentration. And with skillful movements, he chops the logs into smaller pieces in midair. Neat, finished boards of the right size fall to the ground. Roy stands in a stupor with his jaw open from the show he saw. He shows his appreciation for Gabriel. The man considers the servant to be a true sword master who does not need any modern devices. He approaches him with his hand on his shoulder. With a smile, he says that when he is done, he can help him with the digging. Gabriel is shocked that the owner doesn't thank him and makes him work. He had already forgotten about his character. Roy thought that he helped him out of interest. He would definitely cheat someone someday, but how? The man wanted to finish the job as soon as possible to see the result. To do this, they had to work together. Gabriel was embarrassed by his host's approach. But he thought that although Roy had changed in recent days, he still could not trust him. He could only test this by completing the construction together with his master. Sweat ran down Gabriel's forehead as he continued to dig diligently. Roy, though tired, kept up with his servant. The earth was flying out from under their shovels. And at one point Roy stopped, raising the shovel above his head. It was firmly embedded in the ground as his feet ran. Both men stood side by side and looked at the finished house. Roy confidently announced that the construction was complete. Gabriel asked what kind of hieroglyph was depicted on the roof of the house. He replied that it was the logo of his brand. Roy decided to arrange a check. How exactly he had deceived the innkeeper. The servant did not understand how this would happen. There was a dense forest nearby. From there, the man brought wood and lit a fire in a special hole in the house's foundation. Smoke came out of the chimney on the roof. The innkeeper and his mother enjoyed sitting on the warm floor. All the tendons in the old woman's body could finally rest. The innkeeper could not believe that this was possible. Royd was pleased, because the people of this world could only wonder. Because this power of floor heating is almost like magic. The innkeeper sincerely thanked the owner for the smile on his mother's face. Gabriel was dumbfounded that they were smiling just as Royd had said before. In one morning, he changed not only his behavior but also his work ethic. He also fulfilled the agreement. Was it all for the sake of seeing smiles on these people's faces? It was impossible. Royd is not that kind of person. But he saw the sincere, warm smiles of satisfied villagers. They were really happy. Royd received a message that Gabriel's interest level in him had increased by two points. Now it was minus 29. And because the relationship with him had improved, Royd received 36 points. The man was happy to read all this. He assumed that Gabriel's opinion of him had changed. In any case, the first order was fulfilled, despite the fact that he was in the red now. After all, he built this model home to advertise his services. A few days later, there was a line of city residents waiting outside the new building to try out the new development. Everyone left saying that they had almost melted. Royd was sitting at the table next to him, offering everyone to make such a room in his house. He offered two models to choose from, with the possibility of either completing one room or rebuilding the entire house, adding a discount. The peasant was confused because he did not trust Royd. The man decided to reiterate that they needed to trust each other. He also proved to the potential buyer that such a price was almost nothing. Suddenly, someone approached him. It was his father, Arcos Frontera, who was interested in what his son was doing. The level of interest in Royd was minus 20. The man did not expect to see his father here. The estate of the Frontera family. In the middle of a large room at a long dining room table, Royd was having lunch with his father. The man looked at his father. He had been avoiding him so much, and now if he forbids his son to build, 
What will he do? The man's thoughts were interrupted by his father, who said he was ready to hear Royd out. The father wanted to know what he had come up with this time. Royd said that the innkeeper had given him an order to create floor heating, and he had fulfilled it. And now he makes contracts with other residents of the town. But for his father, the townspeople are very important and valuable, and he will not forgive deception against them. Royd assured his father not to worry, even though no one believed him. With that, the man decided to leave. My father assumed that he was doing this because of the financial situation in their family. After all, he has eyes and ears, and he must have already realized everything. The father assured his son that he shouldn't worry because he would solve the problem himself. At that moment, Royd remembered something. He had heard these words before. When his father had said that everything was fine, and that he shouldn't worry, that his main concern was his studies. Royd really thought that everything was fine. So he said it was a lie and nothing was wrong with them. He didn't want to be miserable because of someone's bad money. Royd supported his father and said he would try his best too. A few years ago, he should have said those words to his father too. Walking down the corridor, Royd counted the number of orders and the deposit he had already received. And then he met two men in the corridor. They were two lone sharks. Their names were Methoff and Silo. The men passed by and did not even greet the Baron's son. Royd was interested in their behavior. They went into his father's room. The moneylenders expressed their dissatisfaction with the delay in payment of more than five days. They said that if they continued to delay payments, they would not sit idly by. Arcos was embarrassed. Silo suggested that if they sold the items in the house, the money would come. A swarm was watching through the doorway, just in time. The money lenders appeared just in time. The swarm's RP was 36 points. He got a few points by improving his relationship with Gabriel, but he didn't know where to apply them. The messenger explained to the man that he could invest the points in talent and thus improve his skills. The messenger started downloading. A shining blue circle appeared under the man's feet. It began to reveal the man's knowledge of mechanics, soil hydrology, structural mechanics, water supply systems, and the design of steel and concrete structures. The messenger was surprised at how much the swarm knew. Based on his knowledge, he could improve some skills for 15 points each. The man did not quite understand what was going on here, but he would have plenty of RP, so he tried to improve his knowledge in two skills at once. First, he gained knowledge of basic topographic surveying. His eyes shone with green light. He did not understand what was happening. Opening the window, the man realized that even without using GPS, he could calculate everything himself using his own eyes. Then he acquired the skill of basic level design. It was a great help, because only recently he had been struggling to draw a project on a piece of paper. In the future, it will certainly be much easier for him. But will Gabriel's help alone be enough? If only he could get some heavy equipment. The messenger encouraged the man by telling him that he had something. Roy could not believe it. He was given a random choice of a phantom partner who would help him with everything. The man was skeptical. In order to start, he had to give 50 RP. The man was annoyed. He did not have enough points, and he had only one time left. Roy seriously thought about the phantom. After all, if this is what he thought, then their combined strength would be equal to that of heavy machinery. He needed to collect the RP. And to do this, the man had to get the main characters to be interested in him. The money lender banged his palm on Baron Frontera's desk. He wanted to tell him a way to get the money if he didn't have a penny. He suggested selling his wife and children, for which he could get a lot of money. Arcos was furious at this suggestion. After all, even though he was a creditor, he still had to keep his decorum. Suddenly, a moneylender came into my father's room with a sack behind his back. The moneylender was surprised to see the man. However, when he found out who he was, the moneylender tried to hurt Frontera's son by pointing out his ill-mannered behavior. Royd boldly asked the men to show him their invitation letter first. 
The men did not understand what he was talking about. Roy supported his words with an article from the kingdom's basic law. It was about protecting the interests of the aristocracy. And in this situation, their visit without an invitation letter was defined as an invasion. The outraged men began to shout that he was talking nonsense and that no one had ever heard of such a law before. In order not to be unfounded, Royd suggested that we all check the law together. The man called for a servant. Gabriel went into the baron's room. He was ready and had his hand on his sword. Royd angrily ordered him to cut off the invader's hand. The men were completely frightened, assuming that he had gone mad. Ross suggested that they check the existence of such a law. But whose side the court would take? Gabriel holstered his sword. The sick men were amazed and puzzled, but they had not expected such a turn of events. The frightened men left threatening problems for the swarm. They intended to make him regret his actions. The door slammed loudly. Royd was proud of his triumph. The father turned to his son and servant. He asked what was the meaning of what they had just done. After all, this was a situation where they had to be persuaded on their knees. Royd silently handed the sack to his father on the table. The man admitted that at first he wanted to get the entire deposit and give it to his father. However, this amount would be enough to pay off the interest this month. The father thought his son had collected the money from the townspeople. But Gabriel told him that the baron shouldn't worry about it. After all, he would make sure that Roy fulfilled the terms of the contract. Looking at the servant, the father realized that Gabriel trusted the swarm completely. It was time for the men to leave. They walked along the corridor of the estate. Gabriel wanted to know how the swarm knew such laws, because in his opinion, he was short-sighted. He replied that he had heard it somewhere, and it was absolutely true. After all, Gabriel said it in the novel. After the baron and his wife decided to pass away, then these two moneylenders wanted to get and sell their bodies. And it was then that Gabriel reminded them of an article from the basic law of the kingdom. Saying these words, he took their lives with his sword. And in court, he was fully acquitted. For Royd, Knowing the content of the novel was a big plus. In any case, he was expecting a new message from the messenger. At that moment, he received a message that Baron Frontera's interest in him had increased by six points. Having improved his relationship with the main character, he received 60 points. Now his total number of points was 61. Everything went exactly as he had planned. The Phantom was already waiting for him. The full moon was shining brightly in the night sky. At dusk, Royd stood on the training ground preparing for something. Looking around, he made sure there was no one around. The messenger offered him a random drawing of a fantastic creature. One attempt was equal to 50 RP. The man began the process of random drawing. Suddenly, a green flash appeared next to him out of nowhere. Its particles formed into gears that rotated as a single mechanism. Expanding the space between each other, they created new elements. Royd watched this action with fascination as if it were magic. The green particles formed into some kind of spell. This small mechanism only made an unpleasant noise. And then a bright light began to emanate from the middle of the light circle. The light turned into the face of a small hamster-like creature. Royd was puzzled by what he saw. The little creature jumped to the ground at Royd's feet. The hamster looked happily at the man, its eyes sparkling. The creature was tiny compared to Frontera's height. The swarm called the creature some kind of nonsense. The hamster was extremely offended by this, and his eyes filled with tears. When Royd was about to leave, the rodent began to make indignant noises at the man. He asked what the hamster could do, and if he could demonstrate it. The hamster pointed to its cheeks with its paws and started chewing. Suddenly, he spat out a crumpled piece of paper. It turned out to be an instruction sheet for a litter box. It said that the litter box was a cute hamster that needed to be taken care of with love. Also, along with the instructions, there were colored sunflower seeds that could change its structure. The red seed made it possible for the palate to grow giant for 12 hours. 
and the blue seal allowed the pallet to become small. It had to be given to the hamster before the effect of the red seat wore off. A set of two seats cost one rupee. The man wanted to know if the hamster could grow to the size of a human. But since the hamster could not speak, he had to test it himself. He thought that if hamsters are good at digging, then if it became the size of a man, it would be a very useful helper. Roy gave the hamster a red seed. The hamster ate it in a flash. Before the man's eyes, the hamster began to grow in size. It was so big that it was resting on the swarm's face. Suddenly, the man flew several meters away from the powerful push. He could not believe what he was seeing. The hamster was at least ten meters tall. He looked down on the swarm. A message came in about a padong skill, namely level one digging. The swarm only managed to shout the rodent's name as it began to dig rapidly. A message about another hamster skill, level one earth fortification. The hamster laid down on the ground and began to spin from place to place. Another skill, first level cheek puffing. The hamster stood there with its cheeks puffed out, looking at the swarm. And in a flash, he spat out a giant boulder right in front of the man. The boulder was bigger than the swarm. The man was amazed and satisfied at the same time. He had finally solved the problem with the heavy machinery. But if he appeared in public with this magical hamster, people would become suspicious. In the end, he decided that he would simply carry a book of callings and call himself a genius recruiter. And then, he would deal with the problem of workers for large-scale construction. White fluffy clouds floated across the sky. Another ordinary quiet day in the city. Royd stood on the beach with a team of workers and asked them to repeat after him. That safety was the most important thing. All the men were sleepy and unfocused. But what could you expect from the 30-man army of the barony of Frontera? He couldn't help but laugh because they answered as if they were soldiers who were paid and didn't work. He wondered why they hadn't been dispersed yet, because the baron had a lot of debts. That's why they wouldn't get any additional bonuses, because they already had labor. Roy addressed the soldiers to emphasize the importance of their unity and cohesion. After all, the purpose of the army is to accomplish tasks. When he was in the army, they did more digging and weeding than training. Roy then pointed to a pile of earth as an example of his fruitful work that night. Although, in fact, the entire pile was dug up in just half an hour. Their main task was to revive the estate. It was a project of a boiler house for the people of the estate. To build it, they had to move all the earth there. The workers were not motivated by the owner's words and were afraid of the amount of work. Royd knew he should expect this reaction from them. Suddenly a man approached him. It was a senior knight of the barony of Frontera named Newman. He wanted to clarify what the royalty had ordered his men to do and also the royalty expected this man to speak. There are three knights in this estate. One of them is Newman. Byron and the protagonist of the novel, Xavier Azrahan, obey him. At the beginning of the novel, only Byron and Xavier remained loyal until the fall of the estate. This man was the first to betray and abandon the baron. Since it was Newman who sold the information about the baron to the intruder, we owe him a small debt. Royd thought it was not good that such a man was a senior knight. The man asked the newcomer what he thought they were doing. The knight could not believe that the Royd was forcing the army to do dirty work. After all, as a senior knight, he could not tolerate this. Roy called it nonsense because he earns money to cover his debts. And he had gotten the baron's permission. Newman could not believe how he had deceived his lord and decided to recall the young master's past. The knight believed that he was using the army for personal gain. Roy closed his eyes at this statement from the knight. But after a moment, he smiled and agreed that he was right. He would get it now. After all, it was enough to look at his weak endurance. If he tried to play an online game, he would have failed in a minute. Roy picked up a shovel from the ground. The man swung the shovel toward the Newman. The workers were shocked by his action. Newman could barely shield himself from the clods of earth that flew at his face. The smile on the swarm's face was unwavering. 
The clods of earth fell on the knight's shoes. Newman was furious. He called the man a scoundrel who tried to spoil the knight's reputation. He considered him a foolish son of an almost bankrupt baron. Roy thought that the knight wanted to throw away his regalia and pick a fight with him. The man picked up a shovel and began to twirl it in his hands. Instantly, he got into a fighting stance and aimed the end of the shovel at the Newman, saying that he was not against a duel. In return, the knight said that he would regret it. A month later, he and the knight gathered for a duel. Gabriel asked his host if he was really sure of his victory. Roy, sitting on his bed, replied that of course not. After all, his opponent is a knight called the Heart of Mana and a junior sword expert and he is just a lazy man who is not able to resist him. In his opinion, this question was not thoughtful on Gabriel's part. The servant could barely keep his hand away from the sword to avoid fighting back. He could not believe that Roy suddenly threw the ground in the face of Knight Newman, and even asked for a duel. He probably wants to be a scoundrel again. But it was he who came up with the idea of making money this way, and asked the Baron for a favor. And then he got into an argument and eliminated him. By this time, he had appointed the Knight Byron as a temporary manager and was in charge of a team of workers. But despite this, Gabriel still did not believe that Royd was unsure about the duel. The servant could barely restrain himself from hurting his master. Royd interrupted Gabriel's inner thoughts by asking him for a favor. He wanted him to teach him how to use a sword but the servant refused outright. First of all, his main task was to protect the young master Royd. Secondly, he compared the man to a sack, meaning that if the sack learned to sword, it would be more dangerous for everyone else to be around him. Royd was upset that Gabriel did not want to teach him. So in exchange for fencing lessons, Royd offered to help the servant with his insomnia. Gabriel was shocked to learn how he knew about it. Royd knew about it from the novel, and also about what caused the insomnia. In the novel The Knight of Steel, all knights are divided into four ranks. The least expert, the middle, the highest, and the master of the sword. Currently, Gabriel's level is the highest sword expert, and he will soon become a sword master. The reason for his insomnia is his inhuman nerves, which are too sensitive. This is the so-called sword master syndrome. But of course, in the countryside they don't know about such things, including Gabriel. So Royd offered his deal to the servant, because he could see on his face that he was not sleeping well. The servant sighed heavily, and agreed to teach young Frontera. The master asked him not to give in to him. It is clear that Gabriel agreed to this deal, because he was sure that his master would lose. After all, he had already tried many things to cure insomnia starting with cognitive behavioral treatment and ending with aromatherapy. In a moment, Gabriel fell asleep with a pillow in his hands, sitting in his chair. After all, Royd had proven that he knew how to cure his insomnia. It was the first time he had accidentally fallen asleep while studying magic techniques. The 18th magic technique is to read out instructions for iron and concrete structures. That's what really puts you to sleep. Now Royd will master all the fencing skills that Gabriel has. The weather was sunny and warm. Gabriel ordered his master to run fifty laps right now. Royd was stunned. But he obediently turned around and started running. He ran without even complaining. The servant watched the young Frontera's marathon closely. It was not easy, but the boy showed good promise. When he reached the finish line, the tired man asked the servant to teach him something better. After that, he started the second lap of the race. He ran up to the servant again to find out that he doubted that Royd could do it. The third lap was much easier for the man than the second. Most likely, if Royd had started to whine, the servant would have said that he could not do it and turned away from him. Gabriel gritted his teeth and agreed with this assumption. Royd intended to run to the end and find out what Gabriel would do then. A message appeared about the passive skill freakishness as it had risen to level 4. Everyone who saw him thought he was crazy and wanted to hit him. But the swarm denied having this skill. Dust flew from under his feet. In fact, 
he was very tired, and it would be a lie to say he wasn't. But this was nothing compared to his life in Korea. He had no family to give him warmth. Every morning he opened his eyes to a crowded Goshawan. Every day he carried bricks to the fourth floor of the villa. Every night he loaded trucks with boxes. And all this just to keep from starving to death, constantly dreaming that someday it would be better. Every time he replayed these words in his head, Hang in there, Kim Suho, it will get better, you're doing well, just a little bit longer. Kim seemed to be reaching for the cherished star. He froze, waiting for it to end a little more. After all, the star was still so far away, and then it completely disappeared from his sight. Kim Suho was in deep despair and despondency. So compared to that pain and despair, this was nothing. Roy continued to run in a circle. Seeing all this, Gabriel said that he would teach him fencing for his sincerity with him. A note appeared in the messenger because Gabriel's opinion of him had improved by plus one point. But his overall opinion of him was now minus 28. He also received 18 points for a slight improvement in his relationship with a key character. The total score was 29 points. It was getting dark in the city, and the moon was shining its light through the windows of the Fronter's mansion. Newman was talking to Arcos, expressing his indignation at the actions of his son Royd. His father believed that he had come to his senses these days, although he probably misunderstood him. His moral duty required him not to interfere in the duel. And besides, Royd was to become the heir, so the father asked the knight not to be hard on his son. Arcus asked that he be brought to consciousness so that he would not be mutilated. Newman accepted the baron's request, but he doubted whether he could do it during the duel. He intended to end this scoundrel once and for all. And if the baron began to blow it out of proportion, he would have him and his wife killed by making the crime look like suicide. And then, as planned, he will leave this city to seek a better life. Now, thanks to the young scoundrel, his plan will come true faster than he expected. A month has passed since Newman's last conversation with his father. A dueling arena has been set up on the grounds where Roy trained, with opponents already standing. Sitting at the judge's table, Roy's parents, as well as Gabriel and Byron, were to watch the action. Holding out his sword, Newman asked Roy if he was ready. The young frontier stood with a shovel in his hands. Throwing it upside down, the man slung it over his shoulders and confidently announced his readiness. The man smiled and ordered the knight to get ready to receive the full measure. The audience was shocked that the swarm would fight Knight Newman with this. The knight's eyes were filled with indescribable anger and malice. Gabriel explained that the shovel was made of metal he had ordered from a blacksmith. The father was ashamed of his son because he took it as a joke. Gabriel didn't think it was a joke because he remembered what the owner had been doing for the last month. He did general exercises early in the morning and did not complain. Then he went to the construction site to explain the instructions for the boiler room to the village engineers. And then he practiced with his sword as long as his legs kept him moving. This was not the will of a man who was just joking. The servant was sure that Royd was completely serious in his intentions. And then Arcos began to announce to everyone that the duel between Fronteras Swarm and the Knight Newman was starting right now. The Knight took a defensive stance with his sword pointed at his opponent. The Swarm held a shovel in his hands and smiled slyly at his opponent. Gabriel noticed his host's foolish stance. Immediately Newman swung his sword at the man, believing that he was mocking him. Royd was calmly and confidently waiting for the right moment. A moment before the blow, he managed to jump aside. Arcos and his servant were genuinely surprised by this reaction. However, Newman did not give up and made a second attempt to assassinate him. But the swarm skillfully deflected this blow as well. It was an incredible and effective technique. This is a special technique that was used in real battles. It was as if his sword skills had instantly improved after all these years. Newman stopped in surprise. Although Roy did not see anything strange in this, because in Korea every man can do it. It was a modern hand-to-hand -hand combat technique 
a bayonet attack. And then the roller strikes the opponent a strong blow, which literally knocks him down. After all, this shovel is capable of anything. He can even use it as a shield to protect himself from sharp blows. Another blow to the Newman's side, but it missed the target. Then Roy decided to do something else. He put his feet on the shovel, and now he could jump on it. The knight was puzzled by this behavior of his opponent. Gabriel thought that he was really joking. But the swarm was determined. Perhaps he was not joking after all. Newman rushed into the fight. The first weapon that Roy prepared to deal with Newman was a shovel. The second was the basics of fencing that Gabriel had taught him. The knight could not understand how the front became so strong. After all, he was a drunk and a lazy man. And the third thing that Roy used was the synchronized ability to control the tool. He had the first level of digging. The man had to become one with a shovel in body and soul. The level of synchronization between them would increase. Gabriel's opinion of him increased by plus one point during the training. The defense and the Baradises who saw their son sincere for the first time in his life, it increased by plus two and plus three points. And during all this time, he accumulated 97 points. The messenger suggested that he learn an additional digging skill worth 40 RP. Royd mastered a pretty cool skill. So he didn't think about giving up. Steam came out of the Newman's nose. He had no choice so he realized that it was time to use something that could not be used against an ordinary person. A blue magical globe began to appear around the man. Gabriel suspected something was wrong. The Newman's body was filled with magical energy that was concentrated in his chest. When he saw this roll, he realized that the knight was being pumped with mana. This is the heart made of mana. Newman completed the pumping and took the sword in his hands. Now everything was serious. Royd silently waited for what would happen next. The knight was furious. Sparks flew from his eyes. He made a powerful swing at Royd. Gabriel knew that it took at least five years to develop a mana heart. Therefore, he believed that the young master would not be able to block such an attack. The knight's sword almost touched Frontera's body. The parents screamed in fright to the knight. Freud was worried, but did not give up. Newman was eager to finish off the young Frontera right now. The mother and father of the swarm froze in anticipation of horror. But their son, along with his shovel, was able to withstand such an incredibly powerful attack. Newman did not even have time to understand how the opponent was able to resist him. He felt as if all the strength he had inside was leaving him. This was the fourth skill that Royd had prepared for him. It was the mana that made Gabriel Xavier the strongest character in the novel. It was the Azrahan core technique. Through a connected sword and shovel, the Royd was able to take all the mana into his body. The knight could not believe that his mana was drained. Frontier concentrated as never before and made a powerful swing with the shovel. It entered the knight's face like butter. A snow-white tooth flew into the sky. Before Newman could recover from the blow, Another one flew out of his mouth. It was his tooth. Roy dealt another epic blow to the knight with the handle of the shovel. And then, raising it high above his head, he threw a humiliating look at his opponent, who could no longer resist. Newman was completely frightened by the man's skills. Finally, the powerless knight fell face first to the ground. All the spectators were shocked by this outcome. Arcos and Gabriel looked at their swarm with pride. Everyone thought it was crazy, and no one could believe that the young master of the swarm had defeated the Newman. The Baron made an announcement that Frontera's swarm had won the duel. Lying on the ground, Newman thought about how this scoundrel could defeat such a master swordsman as he was. Royd approached the knight to emphasize once again that he had defeated him. Let's just say he was shaken up. Suddenly, the man raised his shovel to give the knight one last good punishment. The toothless knight froze lying on the ground, waiting for Frontera's actions. The father turned to his son to understand what he was doing, since the duel was already over. But the young master did not care, because the time of reckoning had come. The father turned to his son with horror on his face to stop him. 
The guards ran up to the swarm and pulled him away from the knife, asking him to stop. Byron thought he had gone mad. Gabriel also assumed so. Roy calmed down and asked the guards to let him go. Newman covered his head with his hands and lay motionless on the ground. Finally, the guards and the owner stood calmly next to the knight. But a moment later, the swarm broke loose and began to beat his opponent on the back. The guards tried to stop him, but their efforts were in vain. Gabriel thought that if he looked closely, he could see that he was beating him so as not to hurt him too badly. At the same time, his face was completely calm, as if he knew in advance what would happen next, and as if he already knew everything that would happen. Fifteen days before the duel, Royd asked his servant to teach him the Arzak and Mine technique. Gabriel was surprised by this request, but Royd saw nothing wrong with it. After all, in addition to assimilating magma, it can attract mana from the things around him and turn it into his mana. The servant was seriously puzzled as to how the master knew this. This was a technique he had always kept secret, and it had not even been finalized yet. Royd refuted this by saying that Gabriel himself had talked about it on the day the master helped him to sleep. The servant didn't understand how he could know about a technique that didn't exist. Gabriel refused to teach him the technique. However, Royd said that he would help him complete it after he had learned it. Seeing the overconfidence of the sword master, his servant agreed to see if it was possible. Royd stuck his sword in the ground. The man suggested that perhaps his mana heart was sucking in mana from the outside by itself, and as a result, it bounced off. The young frontiersman realized that from the point of view of his heart, the external mana was something foreign. But if the source has changed, the mana he absorbs from the outside will not mix with the heart of mana so it needs to be allowed to connect separately. It has to be rolled up and used. He compared it to an auxiliary engine that was near the main engine. After all, they make up one whole, but at the same time work separately. Isn't it cool? Gabriel was sure it was possible, even though he had no idea what an engine was. Royd was excited because he had just imagined it, and it seemed to work. The look on his master's face told Gabriel that he clearly knew something. That's how he managed to complete the Azric and Mine technique that had been bothering the servant for a long time. Since his first attempt, the number of contours he could create had increased to three. If he continues to practice, he will be able to reach four or even five contours. There was a report that Gabriel Savier's opinion of him had increased by plus five. These words worried Royd because he wanted to master only the part about sucking up the mana he touched. Gabriel had expected him to defeat the Knight of the Newman, since the young master of the swarm had this ability. But his victory was triumphant. Standing up, his father shouted at the swarm to stop and not to spoil the Knight's reputation. The man stopped and was embarrassed. He was surprised by the words about the Knight's reputation. To question his father's words, he asked him to look under the tablecloth on the table where he was sitting. Arcos lifted the tablecloth and saw a pile of envelopes with letters. The stunned father began to study their contents. Royd explained that these letters were from Tords, the scoundrel who had been damaging the Baron's estate all along, and they were sent by this knight Newman. There he told about the events in the estate, what the Baron liked and disliked, and how to forge property documents. These letters contained everything they had managed to share. Newman was shocked by this because he had kept his letters safely hidden inside the walls. Later in the novel, Xavier would find them anyway. And last night, Royd sent a peddler to fetch them, who promptly fulfilled his errand. Arcus was stunned by what he saw and heard. As expected in the novel, he was described as a good man. There would be a great uproar if they did away with him now. The Baron felt sorry for him, but the words good leader and good leader mean very different things. Royd offered his help in getting rid of the man. He thought a good punishment would be to have an angry rat put on the knight's head. And then, he would be chased out of the manor, mutilated by rats. Or he could be reduced to the level of an ordinary soldier and given the opportunity to correct his actions. P. 
People were outraged by this proposal, saying that this could not be done. Arcus decided that this was really too harsh a punishment for such an act, so he would be given a chance to reform, but it would be the last warning. Byron also agreed with this wise decision, and a good warning for other people, too. Everyone agreed with the Baron's decision. Royd asked Newman if he had any objections to this. He replied that he did not, and thanked him for his mercy. The young Frontera was touched by the words of mercy. After all, if everyone treats criminals well, will they correct their mistakes for the sake of the forgiveness they have been given? It is unlikely. Rather, they will become more confident and try to take advantage of the kindness and mercy given to them. Newman believed that Baron Frontera would regret his decision because he would definitely take revenge on him and his son. Royd noticed that the knight smiled and said that this smile would be his last. Newman did not understand what the bastard was getting at. The young frontline soldier took out his little pocket hamster, Padong, and happily handed him a red seed. After he swallowed it, Roy threw the furry high into the sky with a cold expression on his face. After all, there is no better way to apologize than that. In flight, the hamster quickly broke the seed shell and ate the seed inside. After the snack, the rodent began to grow in size before our eyes, getting bigger and bigger every second. The man's parents opened their jaws at what they saw. Gabriel, along with Byron, also watched with bated breath. All the spectators and residents of the town were puzzled, surprised, and a little scared. As the giant furry beast approached the ground, the swarm ran for cover, while Newman just sat there. In surprise, he opened his mouth and one eye, because the other was damaged in the duel. The hamster flew at breakneck speed to the knight, who just realized that he should run away as fast as possible. But it was too late. The hamster fell loudly right on the ground where Newman was sitting. The impact created a big dust cloud. The ground around the hamster was covered with cracks and crevices everywhere. Royd felt sorry for the knight, but he ordered him to drive it away. This would solve the problem with the callous person who lived inside the manor forever. It was a sunny, warm day in the city. The giant hamster was busy with important work. His paws diligently and quickly dug up the ground. He dug a canal through the whole street in the city. Gabriel asked the swarm what the Padong was doing now, and he replied that his rodent was preparing to widen the road. Meanwhile, the humble laborers suddenly turned into master craftsmen. Once upon a time, there was a city called Rome. Its inhabitants were very fond of roads. They built a special road system called the Apian Way. This is what they will have to do now. Rudma intended to start from the baron's house and end at the eastern hill. Gabriel was surprised by the need to build a road in their town. The owner assured him that he would soon see for himself, as their town would become very popular with visitors. The servant asked where he had learned all this. He wanted to know how he came up with the idea to build a heating system that no one had ever heard of before. He also wanted to know how he had suddenly learned to call on beings from the outside. Gabriel said that it all sounded like magic of the highest level. He also cautiously asked if he was really their true master, the swarm. Frunter received a message of danger because Xavier began to doubt him. The man suddenly began to sweat, and Gabriel perked up his ears, waiting for a logical explanation for his dramatic change. Even when Kim Suho had read about this guard in the novel, he knew that he was quite capable. He could easily guess if there was a stranger in the body of the Baron's son. Then, he would definitely end him. After all, this guy is no fun to mess with. But he didn't have to worry about that because he had a special skill for such cases. Royd trained in secret from everyone. His special skill was perseverance. Gabriel believed that his young master used to drink for days on end in secret. But Royd refuted this by saying, that the servant was not with him twenty-four hours a day. Perhaps he had been a real fool and a party animal before. But Gabriel knew nothing about what he had been doing all this time. But how could the master explain his new magic skills? Because even mages with great experience sometimes fail to do this. In his defense, 
the Roy decided to ask the servant himself how he could handle Mana so easily, even though he was barely in his twenties. Perhaps someone had taught him this too. Gabriel did not consider himself a brilliant magician, but Roy tried to convince him otherwise. This dialogue made the servant think seriously. The young front man, using his special skills of quick conversation and persistence, was able to quickly end the conversation and go about his business alone. Roy began to worry about the rapid conversation with the servant. The man approached the Byron Knight and asked him to monitor the progress of the work while he was away. The knight agreed and assured him that he would take care of everything. Gabriel said he would go with him because it was his duty to protect his master. Roy did not object, and at that moment the men set off. They were heading to a place on the trail of an unpaid debt, to the small town of the Redhead's estate. The men saw a wooden sign with the inscription Hotel. Suddenly, a man slammed his fist on the table and started swearing. It was the house of the intruder, Rhodes. He was swearing in his house because he couldn't believe he had lost all his money. He had to make those bastards pay. Another man in a black robe approached him and asked if that was the point of all gambling. After all, that's what he was making money on. Realizing that the man could not pay for his services, he said he was leaving him right now. But the man immediately said that he would pay him and even more than he had if he stayed with him. The problem was that Rhodes could only make money by deceiving other people. But now there are too many people who want to get even with him. So now the man had to lay low. Hearing these words, Roy thought it was about him and immediately opened the door with his foot. Rhodes and his partner were stunned by the visit. It was not surprising for the swarm because they had never seen each other in person before so he introduced himself so that everyone could understand. Rhodes and his partner's faces showed incredible shock and fear. In a moment, the attacker ordered the other man to run away together. The big man in the black robe picked up the attacker in his arms. And at the same moment, the two of them flew out of the window of the Rhodes' house. The man landed in the center of the city holding his boss in his arms. He furrowed his brow to keep himself alert. Opposite him stood Gabriel, sword in hand. The man immediately made a spectacular swing of his sword to frighten the big man. He ordered him to give the roads to them, and in this case they would not harm him. Everything happened as the young owner of the road said it would. They tried to escape through the window, so the front man ordered the servant to wait here. The big man in the black robe was quite outraged by this and asked if he knew how to use a sword. His eyes turned white, and a black and red blob of magic spun in his hands. After the Baron's death, Xavier only wanted revenge. He fought a duel with a personal bodyguard of Rhodes, the criminal on whose trail he had managed to get. It was also his first battle with a dark wizard. It was not easy for Xavier, but he had to resist the magic of gravity. This is how it was in the novel. Meanwhile, the man in the cloak was launching magic bullets at Gabriel one by one. But thanks to his supreme skill, the man skillfully deflected his opponent's attacks. His dark magic broke up into tiny particles that flew in different directions. Gabriel stood confidently on the battlefield, looking the wizard in the eye. As planned, he had to die. His fist flew into the face of his opponent. But at that moment, the servant was able to stand on his feet. In the novel, Xavier fought the bastard as a mere weapon specialist. When the magician looked at him, he was very surprised. He saw his heart of mana and turned pale. After all, a real Xavier has a heart of mana with a triple ring around it. With new strength, Gabriel took a swing with his sword. He noticed something. Did he have the magic that controlled gravity? Mom had no choice but to point her fist in Gabriel's direction. But in a moment, he was in the air, even though they hadn't agreed on that. Rhodes only had time to reach out to his assistant to stop him, but he was faster. Gabriel turned to Rhodes and asked him if he knew what happens when someone cheats honest people. The criminal was very scared and could not say anything in response. The servant drove the criminal into a dead end, and unable to run, 
the man fell down and hit the barrels. Gabriel wanted to leave him without legs, so that he could only crawl to court on all fours. Rhodes tried to cover his face with his hand. Gabriel took a swing at the criminal, and at the same moment Rhodes ordered him to stop. The man blocked the criminal with his body, facing the servant. The young frontier man justified his action by saying that Gabriel was not going to act wisely. After all, if he had gone to court without his legs, he would have been punished. At that moment, Gabriel realized that he had almost committed the same crime as this bastard. Would his master now also show compassion for others? The city was silent at night, with only the moon peeking out from behind the clouds. A frightened Rhodes was sitting in his room tied to a chair by ropes near the table, not knowing what was going to happen next. Across from him, Roy sat with a calm expression on his face, his hands folded in front of him. The man decided to encourage the criminal so that he would not be so afraid. After all, when lives are at stake, people tend to be greedy. They will do anything if they get the chance. The criminal did not understand what this man was trying to do. Royd shared his thoughts that leaving him without a head would be too cruel. This gave Rhodes hope that he was ready to be forgiven. The young frontline soldier wanted to make sure that he returned all the money. Rhodes was happy and agreed to do so, on the condition that he first receive forgiveness. The owner graciously agreed that receiving forgiveness was the meaning of their existence. Rhodes could not fully understand what the man who caught him was up to. But suddenly the Royd wanted to add one more condition. After all, the criminal was ready to do anything for forgiveness and release. He only had to sign the contract brought by the swarm. The man explained that it was a standard labor contract under which the criminal could even receive a salary. But the main nuance was that 80% of his salary was deducted by the owner to pay off the debt. Rhodes was not amused by this nuance. After all, only in 520 years would he be able to pay off the swarm. This was not the best prospect for a criminal, because it was a considerable sum. As Gabriel expected, his host did not come here to sympathize and forgive. But the young front man is not stupid enough to take the life of someone who owes him money. He would not have made such a rash move. He intended to suck him dry until the end of his miserable life. The depressed Rhodes wanted to know why, for the sake of all the good things in the world, they were offering him such a slave contract. These words surprised the young Frontera. They had no choice but to force him to sign the contract. It was time to resolve this issue in court. The criminal signed his slave contract through tears and despair. The sun was gently shining outside. A chariot with three men was driving along the forest road. Gabriel told his master that he had managed to get some money out of the roads. It was enough to pay the interest for several months. However, the owner replied that the money would be used solely for construction. In his opinion, 30 workers were no longer enough. Frontera wondered why none of the townspeople responded to his job posting. Perhaps his reputation simply preceded him. A few days later, the men returned to their hometown of Frontera's estate. A sign said they needed labor. They were willing to pay 20 gold pieces each. After a while, a line of eager men lined up at Royd's table. The man was surprised to meet all these people because he thought they hated him. Gabriel was sure that they did, but his owner promised to install the heating system on time and at a low price. He also punished the traitor of the estate by making him appear before a higher court. Royd said, he would become a reliable person who could be trusted. He couldn't believe it was that simple. His thoughts were interrupted by a man who was next in line and was interested in the job. The owner showed him what exactly and how to sign. But before that, the man wanted to express his gratitude to the baron's son. Royd was a little shocked by these words. The man shared that his baby could easily get sick as soon as it gets a little cold. But thanks to the young owner and his system, this year he won't have to worry about it. The man sincerely thanked the baron's son and made a low bow. Royd was extremely touched by the man's sincerity. 
he was a little embarrassed because his real goal was to satisfy his own hunger for money. The man added that he had relatives in the Raycon estate, which was nearby. They too would like Roy to install his underfloor heating system in their home as well. For the man, it was the first step to prosperity and expansion in the future. It turns out that all this was not in vain. He immediately thought about raising the price of his services, explaining that it was due to the additional travel costs. His face showed his readiness to take the money right away. This, in turn, worried Gabriel. But the man really needed the means to get all the materials to the site. Gabriel couldn't believe that this whole construction had only one mercenary purpose. Why else would Royd build a road in the middle of the city? Meanwhile, the men reached the top of one of the hills outside the city. While admiring the view, Roy decided to talk to his servant. He told Gabriel that sooner or later there would be nothing left on this mountain. Xavier did not understand what the master meant. He explained that the creation of a heating system would require a lot of money. Therefore, very soon only stumps would remain of the trees growing here. Gabriel was puzzled by what he heard. He did not understand why the owner wanted to continue doing this if he knew that all the trees would disappear. That's why Roy decided to stop the construction of the Appian Way. Instead of using wood, they would start mining coal from a cave near the town. Roy has already started planning how he will sell it at a high price. Because when the news of his heating system reaches the masses, people will simply not be able to resist such an attractive offer. But for the residents of their city, he wanted to make a discount, but a relatively small one. Gabriel thought the owner's plan was unfair and cruel. Does he really think Roy is like that? But if the man refuses to do this, they will not be able to pay the debt for the estate. Gabriel understood this, but still thought Frontera's views were wrong. The servant agreed that they had no choice in the matter, but he still decided to warn his master against it, because the baron did not know about his son's plans, and if he did, he would not just leave it alone. Earlier, other townspeople had also tried to start mining coal again and again. Roy knew that it all ended in a collapse due to the unreliability of the ground. But the man was positive and believed that he would succeed, thanks to modern technologies for earthworks. After all, he knew how the shield method of passage works. He worked with a movable prefabricated metal structure that ensured safe mining operations and the creation of permanent fortifications inside it. Roy was ready to go because he and Gabriel had great things to accomplish, even though he had no idea about this new and unknown technology. He wanted to see what his radically new master could do this time. The men decided to return home. The entrance to the old cave, which had been used to extract minerals, was almost completely blocked with stones. The cave stretched for tens of meters into the hollow. Suddenly a strange creature came out of the darkness in the depths of the rock. It had long black sensitive antennae-like antennas. Here and there in the darkness, the red eyes of other unknown creatures sparkled. They were giant ants, a whole army of them. Each of them had a strong, pointed jaw and large, shining red eyes. They were all heading to the smell of new prey from outside. Roy clapped his hands together in concentration. After that, he began to create a magic symbol with his hands. He gained energy and transformed his magic into a large beam of light, which the man launched into the sky saying that he had the best apartment in Cannes, one of the richest neighborhoods in Seoul. The magical stream instantly soared above the clouds, and then it disappeared over the horizon, leaving behind a small star. In a few seconds, the man was standing outside the best and largest house in the richest neighborhood of Seoul. He wanted it to be true, but unfortunately, Roy didn't have that kind of cool skill. In fact, Frunter was sitting at his desk, just drawing blueprints for a plan to create an underground exit using his own magic. He spent a lot of time on it, though. He received a message that he had only one available skill, which was intermediate-level design. He wished that he could hire 100 hardy workers without having to pay them, although he did like the ability to draw blueprints with magic. Thanks to the incident with the Newman, 
he was able to earn 639 RP, making a great impression on the Baron, Baroness, Gabriel, and others. He invested these points in upgrading his skills, and was able to acquire new ones. Roy came back to the same cave to determine where to dig. He had one more new mid-level skill available to him, namely underground scanning. The skill allowed him to see only at a distance of 5 meters. That helped him find the right direction to dig. He had only one problem left, which was to drill the passage as quickly as possible. After all, an ordinary person cannot do this, and people quickly get tired of such hard physical work. Potanak could not help with this because he fell ill during the construction of the road. And even if he had recovered, it would have been dangerous to use him because he was too big. But Royd had no other choice. He decided to use the messenger to choose a random mystical creature. After all, the man had enough points to do so. The young Frontera sat dutifully on the road waiting for his new creature from the magic portal. From the magical glow, he could see someone's small head with a bow. In a moment, its smiling face completely emerged from the portal. The tiny pink creature with a bell on its tail fell to the road in front of the man. She came to her senses and looked at her owner with joy, making bell-like sounds. Roddy could not believe that this was the same ruthless machine. Despite its cute appearance, he assumed that it had poison in its teeth. But at first the Podong also seemed so innocent. Surely there was something good to be gained from this little guy. Roy asked if it could grow in size with the help of a red sunflower seed. She confirmed this, and that she also had her own superpower. The man kindly asked her to demonstrate her skills. She smiled in response. A few weeks later, the giant bluebell ate up the ground while moving inside a shield barrel in the cave. In addition to resizing, the bellflower had the first-level earth excavation skill. It also had the first-level soil cultivation skill. Standing behind the giant bell, Royd ordered Xavier to get ready. Gabriel was already sweating profusely, but he was ready with his sword in hand. After all, the second step of the bell shot hot metal. Xavier, on the other hand, used his skill to quickly cut the metal shots with his sword forming identical tubes from them. Then the brave blacksmiths used tools and fire to turn the tubes into a strong support. The fifth step was to realize the harsh reality. Gabriel didn't understand why a knight like him had to deal with the secretions of a giant snake. Royd confidently led all the processes, despite the fact that he was also completely sweating. He and his team of workers, Gabriel and the snake moved further, and further into the rock. But because of the lack of oxygen, he was starting to feel dizzy. If they hadn't laid a pipe to bring in oxygen, everyone would have passed out long ago. Gabriel said that the owner, like the other workers, needed to rest. Roy refused, because he had to monitor the work process, as a supervisor usually does. Although in Korea, managers are all about talking. Sometimes he came across bosses, who had never been to their workplace. And at that moment, the young frontline worker promised that he would never be like that and would monitor all the processes himself. Then Roy used his internal scanner to notice something in the rock. It was the very coal they were looking for. He loudly announced to his workers that they had almost reached the goal and that there was only a little more work to be done. The man thanked the snake for the bell because with its help they had completed the job ten times faster. The owner made an announcement to everyone present that as soon as they reached the coal seam, they would disassemble the shield to expand the space. It was a rather dangerous place, so everyone had to be extremely careful. Suddenly, a knock from the ground behind them attracted the attention of the robot. This puzzled Mr. Frontera quite a bit. Everyone was worried because the ground in this city was strong, and should not collapse. The man started his underground scanning to find out what was in the ground. Behind the coal pile, a hole appeared that had not been there before. In a moment, the hole grew larger before his eyes. Suddenly, a giant mutant ant came out of it, scaring the hell out of everyone. Before Roy knew it, the ant had cornered him. Gabriel, unlike his master, 
was always on the alert, and without any hesitation, he used his sword to cut off the giant pincers of the mutant's jaw. When the young frontman came to his senses, he jumped to his feet and, taking a shovel, desperately ran to the servant's aid. The man used all his anger and strength to finish off the monstrous creature. The mutant was finished, despite the fact that it was much larger than the men. Roy didn't understand how the ugly creature had appeared here, which was not mentioned in the novel. But it was too early for them to relax. After all, it was just one mutant ant, and there was a whole army of them in the crack. The ants were rapidly approaching the crevice, lighting the way with their red eyes. Royd ordered everyone to run quickly to the outside and leave the cave immediately. Xavier bravely confronted the creatures, killing them one by one. Royd could not understand how many of them were left, hundreds or even thousands. If they reached the surface, all the inhabitants of the city would be finished. Gabriel could not hold out much longer because of the lack of oxygen in the cave. Their mine could not be destroyed without explosives. But even if the structure had fallen into disrepair, there was still a chance that ants would get to the surface. Roth did not know what to do. The servant slapped his master to get him to pull himself together, because they certainly didn't have time to panic. Roy didn't panic, he thought, but he didn't have much time. Gabriel could not hold them back for long. The young frontline soldier concentrated and put all the factors together to find a solution. The light bulb in his head was off, but in a moment it began to shine brightly, radiating electrodes in different directions. This is it. The man picked up the torch and turned to Xavier. He told the servant that they would attack and move forward. It sounded crazy to Gabriel, but he thought it made sense. Xavier continued to fight off dozens of ants with his sword. The men desperately rushed forward to attack the enemies. It was already evening, and one of the workers came running to the frontiersman's estate to tell the Baron the bad news. Arcos was extremely surprised and frightened by the appearance of these creatures. The man also said that all the workers had successfully evacuated, but Xavier and the swarm remained in the tunnel. Byron was about to close the entrance to the mine. The swarm's father put on his armor and, together with the worker, hurried to his son's aid. Gabriel continued to destroy the pests in the cave. He did not understand why they should continue to attack the ants as there were more and more of them. Roydna told him to stop talking because he was busy at the time. The only good thing was that the ants did not come out of their holes, even though the situation was terrible. Xavier was almost on the verge of not caring that it was hot and there was little air, although there were still a lot of ants. He used his underground scanner to get to the bottom of it as quickly as possible. There had to be methane somewhere in this dungeon. After all, coal is a place where methanogens are distributed. Because of this, layers of methane gas were located throughout the mineral veins. If he could find it, he would immediately blow up the ants. The man looked closely at every corner of the cave. And in a moment, he did find layers of methane gas. Roy quickly stuck his shovel into the ground. He asked Gabriel to hold them back while he dug. Royd used all his fast digging skills to reach the layer of methane as quickly as possible. The mutant crept up on him unnoticed. But Xavier reacted quickly, removing the pest from their path. Royd continued to dig tirelessly. Gabriel continued to fight off the fierce creatures. Suddenly, a very loud sound echoed through the cave. In surprise, the men quickly covered their ears and eyes. Coming out of the depths of the tunnel, a huge pink ant, ten times bigger than the other ants, stood in front of the men. The men realized that it was their queen. Only one of its jaws was larger than Xavier's height. Royd hoped that the servant could overpower her if he tried. But Gabriel objectively understood his strength, so he said it was beyond him. But at the moment, they had no other choice. At that moment, the queen attacked Xavier. The man used his heart of mana to try to keep the defense. The queen's size was considerable, so Gabriel had to look for her weaknesses. But for her, his blows were significant. Xavier was trying his best to hurt her. However, 
This only irritated the queen to keep fighting. As long as he was holding on, the swarm did not waste a single minute continuing to dig. The servant did not spare himself in the fight with the ant. Suddenly, he heard a strange hissing from under the swarm. The man grabbed a torch and ordered Xavier to run to the exit with him. The furious queen followed them. The men saw the narrow entrance they had used earlier. When they reached it, they quickly jumped in. Royd turned for a moment to see where the queen was. Finding the creature with a glance, the man threw his torch in her direction to eat her. The burning torch fell on her head and bounced to the ground. Her ants were frightened by the fire, fleeing deeper into the tunnel. The enraged queen wanted to end the men. And that's when methane gas leaked through a crack in the tunnel, ignited by the flame from the torch. A moment later, a powerful explosion occurred in the cave. The queen was caught in the middle of it. A few meters away, lying on the ground, Xavier covered his master's body to shield it from the blast wave. The ants watched in horror as their queen passed away, burning in a fiery vortex that in a moment covered them as well. One of the stones landed on Xavier's head, but he continued to protect the young Frontera. At the exit of the mine were the workers, along with Byron and Arcos, who also heard the deep echo of the explosion. The father could not contain his emotions and wanted to follow his son. But at the last moment, he was stopped by Byron, saying that he might get hurt. Then, the men were lying on the ground among a pile of stones and smoke. Royd woke up, because his ears hurt badly after such a powerful sound. The man got to his feet, and when he saw the queen's head still, he realized that his plan had worked. Royd looked at Xavier and realized that he had protected him. He then picked up the bell and apologized for the scratches he had received from the explosion. The man looked up and saw that the exit from the cave was blocked by stones. This meant that things were bad. Suddenly, the man began to feel dizzy. He received a warning message that there was not enough oxygen in his body. He knew it himself. That is why he needed to get outside as soon as possible. Using his scanner, Royd estimated the thickness of the rubble to be about five meters. The oxygen level was getting even lower. But the young Frontera had no choice but to dig for Xavier and the bell. Gabriel came to and saw his master. Everything swam before his eyes. He could only hear his master saying that they had to get out together. Royd said that he would not leave them. At the same moment Gabriel lost consciousness and fell to the ground. The messenger expressed his admiration for the young frontier because of his desire not to leave Xavier. Then Gabriel's opinion of him improved by six points. This brought Royd's total score to 108 points, bringing his total to 157 points. The man was breathing heavily through his mouth, inhaling the last gulps of oxygen the level of which was at an extreme limit. In any case, Royd had nothing left to lose. There was less and less oxygen. And then the man pulled himself together and turned to the messenger to activate the search for knowledge that could develop his skills. The messenger started processing its own data. It started scanning the man and looking for the knowledge he needed. It found some of it, namely, mana absorption, mana processing, and mana increase. By combining all these skills, Roy could master the Azric and Core technique. This was exactly what he needed. After all, the young frontrunner hadn't stopped training since his duel with Newman. He was confident that he could develop his skills as far as he wanted. The man did not hesitate to agree to receive such a technique, which cost him 15 RP. In a moment, Royd received the Azrahan's core technique in a fifth-level single ring. Then a small blue spark appeared in the dark space. It formed a ring that Royd felt inside of him. Unfortunately, he had no mana in his heart, but he could feel the presence of the mana rings. Inside, he had a 120% expansion of mana. Even if he had been an ordinary person who trained hard, the result might not have appeared immediately but he had a lot of RP, and he could increase his skill level with the click of a button. Royd decided to move forward and bet everything. 
his Azrahan's core technique in the single ring increased to level 6. There was a 125% expansion of mana. However, every time he clicked on the upgrade, the cost increased by 5 points. Despite this, Roy continued to level up his technique until he reached the 10th level. For a moment, he thought that he would need these points in the future, but he had little choice. He decided to level up his technique as long as he could. His ring of mana that had been revolving around his heart turned into two rings of the first level. His mana had expanded by 200%. To increase to the next level, 100 RP were required. But the man had only 7. Royd wanted to know from the messenger how he was doing now, because the number of rings had increased. The messenger informed him that he had two skills available to him, such as a 10-minute stretch of life with the ability to not feel tired and an energy burst that allowed him to triple the manga for 20 seconds. Also, these two skills had restrictions on use and the amount of one time per day. The man accepted this and prepared for a quick dig. Then he activated the skill of the stalker, which allowed him to forget about his fatigue. The man quickly began digging in the direction of the exit. His oxygen level was at an all-time low. In his mind, the man was begging for daylight to show through the crack. He only needed a small space if he could find even the smallest gap. Using his own scanner, the man moved deeper into the earth. The oxygen level was critical. Sweating Royd stopped because he noticed something. It was the very small crack he was looking for. It was the way out. The earth flew from under his shovel even faster than before. Exhausted, Gabriel and the bell still lay unconscious on the ground. Gritting his teeth, Royd continued to bathe without stopping. The oxygen level was running out before his eyes. Royd dug as hard as he could to save his family and himself. He had enough oxygen for just a few breaths. Meanwhile, there were only three meters left to his cherished crevice. The exhausted man fell to his knees in despair. His shovel also fell to the ground without strength. After all, ZHYVCHYK's skill had ceased to work. The man sitting on the ground was on the verge of despair. And that's when he decided to use the energy release skill. Roy got to his feet and picked up a shovel. Every second was worth its weight in gold, so he immediately continued to dig aggressively. His skill only lasted for 20 seconds, and he had only 30 centimeters of earth to dig to the rescue hole. Meanwhile, there was no oxygen left at all. Having dug such a large stretch of earth, he did not have enough air and strength for the miserable 30 centimeters. Roy lay powerlessly on the ground, so close and yet so far from the exit. Roy thought about how quickly it was over. After all, as the son of an influential man, living in a remote area, he only dreamed of a normal, quiet life. It seemed as if the story of his life was over. But suddenly, he heard a strange sound that he had heard before. With the last of his strength, Roy stood up on his elbows to see where it came from. At the same moment, a giant hamster, Padong, who had long been familiar to him, emerged from the ground. This made the man very happy and made him smile at the furry animal. Royd immediately smelled the fresh air outside. This encouraged the man to get back on his feet. He told himself that the quiet life of a barren son was waiting for him. It was already dark and twilight had fallen on the city. A torch with a bright flame was burning in the cave. Arcus, accompanied by Byron and the townspeople, moved through the tunnel in search of the missing men. Although the knight warned the baron to move on, he was determined to go all the way. For a moment, the man stopped when he saw something in the depths of the tunnel. A few meters away, the silhouette of a man carrying something on his back was moving toward them. It was a roid rescuing his humble servant. The use of special skills in an emergency situation helped him surpass any limits of human capabilities. The special case, combined with Azrahan's new core technique, had a great impact on the man. However, after that, a new skill of the third level power mode was available to him. With the help of this skill, 
the core technique was calculated to be able to operate even during severe exhaustion. Frontera's father recognized his son as a soul and ran towards him, shouting his son's name. Confused and exhausted, the young frontier, carrying Gabriel and the bell, did not immediately recognize his father. When the man ran up to his son, the latter lost all strength and fell into his arms with the servant. It was deep night, and it was extremely difficult for everyone. At dawn, the city was already abuzz with gossip and theories about the latest developments. Two men in the middle of the street were comparing their attitudes toward the young swarm master before and now. One of them said that his nephew was in the very epicenter of the events and saw it with his own eyes. He noticed that when the giant ants attacked people, the owner of the house thought first of all about saving the workers, not himself. It seemed as if the whole town was discussing the exploits of Royd and Xavier. All the residents expressed different opinions and attitudes toward this event, but each of them agreed that this swarm was different from the one they had known before. Meanwhile, the culprit of the gossip was lying in bed in his room under Gabriel's watchful eye. The young frontline soldier needed time to recuperate, but later he opened his eyes. After a long time, Xavier finally saw his master conscious. Royd received a message that the inhabitants of Frontera's estate and the townspeople were deeply impressed by his heroic actions. But whether he would be awake or asleep, the man did not understand what was being said. However, the messenger informed him that he would be rewarded with extra RP points for his outstanding achievements. After this message, his RP scoreboard was updated, and the number of RP points on it was now equal to 507. The man began to realize what had happened to him. He realized that he had become a hero, and in addition to that, he was happy to receive 500 rupiah. The feeling of pride and joy filled him with positive energy. The next morning, the mine was already in full swing. The workers were busy reinforcing the walls of the tunnel and performing their daily duties. Suddenly, a long-awaited visitor caught their attention. Royd Frontera and Gabriel were just returning from the mine when they met the workers. They all paid their respects to the owner and praised him for the fruitful work he had done today. The men looked at their savior with big sincere eyes. He was different from other nobles and was a true example of nobility. All the praise and affectionate words made Royd feel ashamed of himself. After all, two weeks had passed since the victory over the ants. Therefore, the work in the stone mine was in full swing. Everything seemed to be going well again, however. In such a turbulent time, Royd believed that their safety should come first. He wanted to avoid even the slightest risk of danger. On this day, their main task was to search for ant tracks Gabriel wanted to ask the owner something, but he insisted that he do it quickly so as not to waste oxygen. The man asked the swarm why he was constantly putting himself in danger. After all, he could have simply ordered others to do it for him. He believed that it could not be that the owner was only interested in the comfort and safety of ordinary workers. Moreover, as a future heir to the estate, he had to take care of himself and take care of his personal safety above all else. In response to these words, the young frontier called the servant a fool. After all, his real duty was to take great responsibility for all possible risks. Gabriel looked at his young master in embarrassment. Roy explained his position by saying that in this case, even if he threw money around, no one would dare say anything to him. Xavier did not understand whether this was good or bad for him. The messenger informed the owner that Gabriel's level of sympathy was ready to increase, but he suddenly changed his mind. The men reached a blank stone wall. Gabriel suggested looking elsewhere. However, the young frontline soldier was not in a hurry to make conclusions. It seemed to him that there was an empty space inside the wall. Perhaps it was there that the uterus laid eggs from which new offspring could appear. So the man wanted to verify this theory by digging. And suddenly something surprised him. Inside the wall was a really dense space. The man saw a humanoid green creature with fangs hanging above the ground by its hands. 
bound by cobwebs on all sides. Also among the victims of the insect mutants were animals wrapped in strong cobwebs. Most of them were horses and pigs. For Gabriel, the green creature seemed dangerous, so he intended to deal with it. It was not a well-considered decision on his part. He wanted to know what kind of creature it was. However, Gabriel explained that it was an ordinary orc. The owner assumed that it was anonymous but he had heard that ants usually preserve their prey by paralyzing a living organism. This fact encouraged Royd. The man could not hold back his smile, because it was an incredible find for him. On the same day, the men brought a green orc to the fronter's estate. His name was Garage. The orc told the men that Royd was his savior, whom he would never forget. Royd wanted to know why the orc always added a kick at the end of his statements perhaps in order to match his character more harmoniously. However, the orc did not understand what he was talking about. Garage turned out to be the son of an Orsish tribal leader. Thanks to the doctor's care, he quickly regained consciousness. He was the son of the leader of the tribe of Steel Sand, and once again emphasized that he would not forget Royda's kindness and would generously thank the man with whatever he wanted. Royd was greatly encouraged by these words. After all, he had really saved him. And then the young frontier man would ask the stout orc for anything. He needed 120 orcs to work in the mines. However, Garrosh refused the savior's request. The man was confused and sad. He wanted to know the reason for the refusal. For the orc, it seemed suspicious that the swarm had clucked his tongue, as if he were a bad person. However, the young frontier immediately refuted this as a habit, just like the orc's habit of saying the prefix kick every time. Harash emphasized that orcs are warriors who follow only the orders of their commander. And since Royd was not a warrior, he could not give orders to orcs. That was the reason. He had heard before that orcs were supposed to go out into the wild upon reaching adulthood and return with the head of a giant ant. Garo said, that he had made a mistake when he went to the ant's hive, where he was instantly paralyzed. Hearing this, Royd made a new decision, which made the man lick his lips just thinking about it. The young frontline soldier pretended to accept Karash's decision and kindly congratulated him on his coming of age by clapping his hands. But Harash explained that he had been on his mission and had not brought the giant ant's head back to the tribe, because it could not move once it was inside the insects. Royd did not immediately understand what the orc was talking about. After all, Garos had caught and killed the giant ant with him, and its head was hanging on the wall in Royd's room as a trophy. However, the orc could not remember ever having managed to take out such a large ant. Frunter explained that he did not remember anything because he was unconscious. Royd told his new friend that he had witnessed a fascinating sight. When he got to the ant's hive, he saw the queen shaking with fear. She was screaming that she could not believe she had lost to the young year. Harash wondered how the mutant ants could understand human speech. But Royd explained that it was true, because they had made great progress in this skill recently. The man emphasized that it was thanks to Harash that it was much easier for him to find their hive. Gabriel didn't understand why the owner was so confidently lying to his new friend about his incredible feats. In general, the man wanted to support the orc who was embarrassed by his failure and give him hope for the best. Royd put his hands on the orc's shoulders in a friendly manner to finish his speech in a trusting atmosphere. In the end, the young frontline soldier once again confirmed that they had overcome that giant ant together. After all, Harash is an unsurpassed warrior, just like Royd. The orc was sincerely ashamed and embarrassed after such pleasant words in his direction. On this positive note, the man decided to bring up the topic of helping 120 orcs to work again. And this time, Garash expressed his unquestioning consent to this. Exactly a week later, the men set out for the sandy valley that lay beyond the green forest on the outskirts of the city. And so soon, the three of them reached the village of the Steel Sand Orcs. Their wigwams looked very interesting, built of wood and bones, and decorated with their national symbol, the coat of arms. 
It seemed as if the men's long journey in search of labor was over. But the tribal leader and Barosh's father, Akush, regretfully informed Royd that they would not be able to fulfill his request. Royd was shocked that the orcs began to fight back. However, the man did not give up hope and decided to politely ask the chief the reason for his refusal. Akush explained that they were not strong enough to perform this task. They needed to eat meat to stay strong. And if they don't go hunting, their muscles will become extremely weak, and the loss of strength will lead to the decline of their tribe of steel sand. Therefore, they cannot reduce the number of warriors they need to go hunting. Royd interrupted Akucha's explanation to ask if they go hunting every day. The chief confirmed that they did, because their muscles would weaken if the orcs did not eat meat every day. Gabriel thought it was ridiculous that the orcs were obsessed with their own muscles. He explained to the owner that for these creatures, protein and muscles are the meaning of life. Therefore, it would be better for everyone to give up this business. Royd heard the orcs' needs and thought about a compromise. So he approached the leader with the idea that if the meat did not spoil for several days, they would not have to go hunting every day. And as a result, they could provide workers for his mine. Akucha agreed with this statement because they wanted to repay the saviors for the return of their son. So this option was quite possible. Royd enthusiastically suggested to the chief that they could keep the meat fresh for a while. But first they had to go back a bit to remember the time when they had first arrived in the orc village. Barosh was crying out for his father's name. Akucha, also in tears, could not believe that he was seeing his son. Barosh ran like hell to meet his father. In return, the excited father ran to his son. People and orcs watched this sentimental spectacle. And at that very moment, the father and son united in a strong embrace, clinging to each other as strongly as possible. This powerful collision in the village of steel sand shook the ground and raised dust. It was just a hug, but the effect was so moving. Roth thought that if he had been standing between them, he would have been ground to dust in a second. And then he realized that if he could attract 120 such brave craftsmen, their production would soar thousands of times. However, there was one more thing that deserved attention. Harash brought and showed his father the head of the queen of the mutant ants. Akucha, along with his subjects, was proud of his son and announced to everyone present that a celebration would be held in his honor. Later, Royd had the opportunity to watch the orcs train with the help of golden items and jewelry. This spectacle impressed the man greatly. After all, they used golden columns as ordinary dumbbells in the gym. The young frontline soldier could not understand what they were doing with these golden things. He had the impression that the orcs were taking them out of thin air, because these precious things cost ten times more than any other sports equipment. That's why the Great One signed a construction contract with the leader of the shark. This way, they would get both labor and treasure. The men intended to build a stone-cold storage facility for storing meat, and in return, they would receive various precious items. However, Gabriel noticed that they would need special tools to work with the stones. The servant had never heard of such a vault, so he decided to ask his master about it. Ruth reminded Xavier that royal wizards could keep food fresh with the cooling power of ice magic. A cold store was a place that was used for the same purpose but without the use of magic. Gabriel was extremely surprised by his master's knowledge but he was too lazy to explain to his servant what he knew and how he knew it. First of all, they needed granite to create the refrigerator because it is very strong. Roy pointed to a granite rock to make his words clear. Something told Gabriel that it would not be an easy task to get this stone. Roy confirmed his assumption. Although they didn't have any explosives with them, they had a great substitute. The young front man turned to face Gabriel and pointed at him. After all, he already had a man with explosives ready. Xavier guessed that his boss wanted to use him in this situation. This was one of the key moments of the novel The Steel Knight. It told the story of the famous city of Mamaram. It was located on top of a cliff, surrounded by a pink glow. The city was imprisoned inside a magical barrier. 
At that time, thousands of refugees inside the city were the prisoners that Xavier was supposed to save. By that time Gabriel had almost become a sword master, and his mana heart possessed the fourth mana ring. For some time, he watched powerlessly as the mana was sucked out of the hearts of the city's captives. He had to save them even at the cost of his own life. In this way, without realizing it, he created a new skill of propulsion. His secret was to protect the main heart of the mana with one ring, and to channel the power of the other three rings into a blow of incredible power. Then all the power of the three mana rings passed from the heart into his hand, and from there into his sword. This led to a powerful explosion. As a result of the formation of a large blast wave, Xavier literally flew upwards, and then he fell to the ground. After that, this explosion became the same technique that, together with Azrahan's mind technique, represented the Steel Knight. Royd asked if they could use the same technique now. Instead, Gabriel wanted to know how the Master had learned about this theory. Royd said that it was the first time he had thought of this technique, and his eyes did not contain a lie inside. Xavier was annoyed by the owner's eyes, because he saw lies in them. The embarrassed Roy tried not to show his excitement and asked him to just try it. Gabriel believed that the owner would still do it his way. However, the young frontier urged the servant to always wish each other only good. He also promised to make an effort if Xavier succeeded in his theory. That would be a definite plus for the Baron's son. Gabriel approached the rock to try to apply his propulsion technique. To do this, he needed to protect the mana heart with one ring and release the other three by force of impact. And at the same moment, the man made a decisive sword strike into the granite rock. A bright light began to radiate from the place of impact in a second. Roy thought that Gabriel had succeeded on the first try. From the dust cloud, the silhouette of Xavier was moving toward the host. Coming closer, the man noticed that his outerwear was torn. Gabriel was in a stern mood and wanted to know if the owner had planned this. Roy did not plan it, but he was sorry that it happened. But in any case, Xavier was happy that this time the master's plan worked. Next was the young Frontera's turn. The messenger told the owner that Xavier was grateful for this lesson. Gabriel's level of sympathy for him increased by three points. The overall level of sympathy for the host was minus 11 points. He also received 54 RPs for improving his relationship with a key character. The total number of RPs was 561 points. Gabriel shared his thoughts that the master knows his skill and should use it to protect the Baron. But now he uses it for construction. Roy took these words as gratitude from his servant. But that was not the case at all. Since then, construction has progressed much faster. The granite that Xavier split and shaped was delivered to the construction site by a hamster called Padong. The orcs tried to free people from hard physical work so that they would not break their backs, even though no one asked them to do so. But the orcs, who were addicted to training, were doing all the work themselves. After all, lowering and lifting large granite blocks was like a normal workout for them. Roy assumed that at this rate, they would finish the construction five times faster. For the next stage, they only needed ice and insulation. The man asked Xavier how long it had been since he had sent his workers to get the insulation material. He replied that it had been exactly three weeks. They should have been back by now. Gabriel assumed that either their soldiers were too lazy, or something else might have affected their speed. Roy thought that something might have happened to them on the way back. The man got up from the stone to find out what had happened to his soldiers. But Gabriel stopped him from doing so. Xavier offered to go in search of the soldiers himself if that was the only task. He believed that the owner should not go with him, because they could not know for sure what had happened to the people. However, Roy reminded him that they had already discussed this topic with the servant. The young frontman again explained that he was responsible for organizing the construction and therefore was fully responsible for his workers. Gabriel had no choice but to exhale and agree with his master on this point. 
the men immediately set out on the road. They passed through sandy rocky areas where there was not a single living thing or plant. Suddenly Royd noticed a lost glove of one of his workers in the sand. It was one of the gloves he had recently ordered for his men to use when working with insulation. While the man was looking at the glove, Gabriel noticed something else. Xavier showed his host a crevice from which a very strange atmosphere was coming. Royd did not understand what was so strange about this crevice. But Gabriel explained that the manna flowed here in a rather unusual way. Everything was somehow blurry and imprecise. The young frontiersman thought about the servant's words. He remembered that he had already encountered something like this while reading a novel about the Knight of Steel. After realizing his own memories, fear appeared on Royd's face. The man ordered Xavier to leave the place quickly with him. Gabriel did not understand his host's reaction. The swarm anxiously told Xavier that most likely their soldiers were no longer alive. Gabriel was both surprised and frightened by his host's words. Later, after a difficult journey through the rocky terrain, the men reached the foot of a strange gorge. Royd noticed small piles of straw near the entrance to the cave. The man took a handful of straw from the ground with him, which surprised Gabriel a bit. The young frontline soldier tightly gripped the dry grass in his hand and prepared himself for any circumstances. Royd explained to Xavier that they had reached the Ruffylon Gorge. After all, at the very beginning of the novel, this place was mentioned as one of Xavier's goals, because it was here that the dark wizard Ruffylon lived. The man was furious that this magician could do something to his soldiers. After all, trespassing on private property was supposed to be punishable. The owner's thoughts were interrupted by Xavier, who ordered him to follow him through the cave. Royd did not have time to stop the servant as he stood on the floor with his foot and caused a strange magical reaction of the stone, which began to shine. Royd barely had time to take Gabriel back by the collar. A moment later, a small explosion sounded where the man was standing. Xavier was amazed that there were magic traps in the cave. Royd asked the servant if he was really a knight, because a real knight should calculate such moments in advance. In the novel, Xavier fell into the same trap when he was wounded and looking for shelter. But his Gabriel never repeated his mistakes twice. And then the knight rushed to the exit of the cave. Since the flow of mana in this city was unusual, Royd suggested that the man apply his technique here as well. Gabriel knew that in the natural environment mana was in a state of constant uninterrupted concentration in the atmosphere. Thus, he could understand where the magical traps were laid in the skull. It was by sensing a certain unusual concentration of mana in one place. Gabriel listened to his feelings and concentrated. In a moment, he was already leading his young master forward. Royd noticed that the servant's senses were quite well developed. As Gabriel walked cautiously forward, he thought that Royd was only doing what he was doing, lying to him and insisting. But now everything is different. Xavier did not understand what was going on. After all, the young front man had somehow predicted various events before they happened. But how did he do it? Gabriel did not feel any special energy from him, although on the other hand it could be a very powerful mana. As a result, the man came to the conclusion that first they had to deal with what awaited them ahead. They needed to save all the prisoners as soon as possible. A few meters away, the men noticed a silhouette in a black robe holding a book. At that moment, the cloaked man felt the presence of strangers in his cave and turned in their direction. The man was glad that his trap had worked and that someone had visited him. He was interested in thinking about who it could be. The man closed the book and was sure that he would soon find out for himself. He believed that his preparation was complete. His experiment had to be successful, so he immediately opened the bolt on the stout metal door. Behind it, on the stone floor, young Royd's workers sat tied up and frightened. The magician chose one of them and, at the prisoner's begging, dragged him by the scruff of the neck into another room. In a moment, the laborer was lying inside the red magic circle depicted on the floor of the ceremonial hall. The magician had everything he needed for the experiment, 
a magic circle, a ruthless scythe of a priest, and most importantly, a young human life. The man sharply swung the scythe at the worker. He screamed and cried pitifully, waiting for his end. And at the same moment, behind him, the magician heard a voice addressing him. The dark wizard turned around in surprise, and was shocked by what he saw. Royd and Xavier addressed him, and ordered the man not to touch their worker. The magician was not happy with the intruders, because he could not understand how they had avoided his traps. Worried for his safety, he quickly began to lower the metal gate with the help of magic to prevent the men from getting inside. The metal curtain dropped sharply in front of them. Behind the men, too, white, thick smoke began to pour out from under the cracks in the metal gate. Royd inhaled the remaining fresh air and held his breath to avoid falling into the dark wizard's new trap. Royd had managed to hold his breath, and so he felt confident, but Gabriel did not. The magician intended to put the guests to sleep with sleeping magic in order to deal with them later. When the space between the two metal walls was filled with sleep magic, Royd used his zitchik skill. He got ten minutes to not feel tired at all although he was sure that a few minutes would be enough. After all, he was not in an ant tunnel now. Xavier had never taken medication to treat insomnia, so no sleeping pills were going to work on him. Royd had already gone too far. He dug a rather long tunnel that ran under the metal wall in the direction of the magician's hideout. Gabriel noticed that his master looked like a mole with a shovel, and he would laugh at this on occasion. Roy gestured for Xavier to go downstairs to him. As the servant tried to apply his driving technique, the young front man crouched down with his ears covered. Gabriel concentrated the power of the mana rings in his sword, and with all his strength, he struck the ground. This caused a great explosion. When he saw it, the Ma did not know what to do, because he was terribly frightened by the skills of ordinary people. His face was full of horror. When the dust settled, it was possible to see a hole in the ceremonial floor of the magician. The hand of one of the men appeared from there. It was a swarm holding onto the stones and climbing to the surface. He crawled slowly toward the magician with an unwavering fury on his face. He had never seen such a large monster before. The wizard kept his magic ready to repel the intruders. With a sharp movement, he directed it all to the floor. In a moment, a giant, terrible two-headed giant appeared from the magic glow. Even though his experience had been a failure so far, it was his most powerful creation. It was virtually invulnerable, with only its steel armor worth a damn. Its giant arm was approaching the men. Roy told Gabriel that it would not be easy for them. He also tried to tell him that his weakness was his legs. But Xavier immediately desperately rushed into the fight. Xavier used his propulsion technique again, but this time in the fight against the magical giant. With his sword, he created a powerful tornado wave that covered the monster's head. In one incredible move, Gabriel split the magician's creature exactly in half from head to toe. The magician's face was full of horror and shock. He could not believe that this was really happening. Royd was no less surprised by this result than the magician. Roy could not believe that Gabriel had used the power of the explosion as an auxiliary force, which gave him the opportunity to split the monster in half. But for some reason, his novel did not mention this technique. Meanwhile, Gabriel stood calmly over the body of the defeated giant, sword at the ready. Fearless and proud of themselves, the men stood in front of the magician, staring unwaveringly ahead. The wizard trembled before them, and realized that no matter what he did, he could not defeat them. Royd sat down leaning forward and spoke disdainfully to the magician. He told the man in the cloak that due to the disappearance of his workers, the construction of the young Frontera had stopped, and since it was the work of a magician, he had to pay Royd back somehow. The magician decided to lie down on the ground in order to survive in any way possible, and to apologize for his evil deed. However, Royd was not interested in his words at that moment. He wanted to receive compensation for the damage he had caused. Realizing the man's intention, the magician said 
that he had many valuable things that he would give them. This greatly amused the young Fronteras in her greed. Going to the storeroom where the prisoners were kept, Gabriel told the owner that the soldiers were very exhausted, but their lives were not in danger. Royd was pleased with this news. Royd tried to ask the magician why he needed all these people, because in a few days they could have been dead with such an attitude. The magician was dumbfounded, but still dared to tell the man his plans as they would not become a reality. The magician told him that he was conducting unusual experiments to find out how to bring people back to life. Royd furrowed his brow and asked the man why he needed to do this. Sitting on his knees, the magician was extremely touched and saddened by the man's words. After all, he was doing all this to find a way to get his wife and son back. Royd thought about it, because he did not expect that the magician could have had a family before. The man said that he used to be a magician in the estate of a baron. He lived an ordinary life with his beloved wife and son. Although no, his life was not ordinary, it was happy. But one day the baron, whom he had served so faithfully, suddenly wanted to take his wife away from him. So on the same day, he tried to escape with her and his son. But the baron still pursued them. At this point, the swordmaster interrupted the magician's sensitive story, explaining that he did not believe the man's words. After all, if he had saved his wife and son while taking the lives of hundreds of innocent people, it would have been very cruel and his family would definitely not have thanked him for such a salvation. As well as for the ruthless creatures he created, the lives and happiness of the families of those people whose lives he took. Royd believed that his story did not deserve pity. Gabriel took all the soldiers out of the storeroom, and noticed that no matter what the magician told them, his true gut could not be changed. Xavier tried to suppress the magician by telling him, that it was he who had broken the happy lives of many families, and that he would remain who he really was. Endless hot tears rolled down from the magician's eyes. Royd was glad that at least he could still cry. The man told the magician that he would soon return with reinforcements to his cave to take all his magic and precious things. And if he tried to harm anyone else in the meantime, he should not expect forgiveness this time. The magician was extremely shocked by the man's verdict. In the end, he bowed to the men and thanked them for their kindness and humanity. Then Roy remembered that in the novel, Xavier also forgave the magician, and he later left the cave. But after that, the magician took the lives of hundreds more innocent people. He even conducted an experiment on himself. He turned into an uncontrollable and annoying thief who challenged Xavier again and again. And even though Roy knew about it, he turned his back on him to make sure of his assumption. At first, the magician stood motionless and just cried in front of the man, but as they were about to leave, the unexpected happened. He suddenly looked at the men from under his cloak, planning something insidious. The magician's eyes concentrated on the negative that came from his gut. Seeing Roy's alcohol, the mage felt that he still had a chance to get back at them and destroy them all with the use of dark magic. The magician was rapidly approaching the man, and could already taste his own victory. However, at the same moment Roy turned around, looking into the magician's eyes, he said that he never forgave him. The magician wondered how Roy had learned about his intentions, and true identity. The man knew in advance what he would eventually lead them to. For Gabriel, this meant only one thing. He had to give the magician a chance to think about his actions. And in the same instant, with a sharp and as always precise sword movement, Xavier beheaded the magician. Then she flew off swiftly to the side, and his body remained motionless. More than once in his life, young Kim Suho heard remarks about himself. That he was just a miserable fool who was rotten to the core. There was a man who constantly scolded him for no reason. He called the boy a ragamuffin and ordered him to bend over 90 degrees when greeting him. It was very hard on the boy because it was becoming more and more difficult to withstand the constant remarks. And so it went on and on. While Kim was working at a construction site, the guy reassured himself that there was nothing wrong with his remarks. Later, 
He tried to restrain himself from quarreling and then from physically assaulting the offender. The man often said that young people needed to be taught everything because without them, they could only eat on their own. The boy hoped that if he was polite to this man, he would change for the better. Thinking about it this way, he tried to come to terms with the situation. But where did it lead? When he continued to show politeness and tolerance to the man, he continued to resent and quarrel with him instead. He only saw Kim as a punching bag. On that day, the man called him abusive names once again. Kim Suho could barely contain his anger. Soon it would all be over if he held back. After all, if he caused a scandal, he would only make things worse for himself. But in this moment of internal struggle inside the boy, the man added that only a worthless mother could have given birth to such a worthless son, and then laughed. At the same time, uncontrollable rage filled the boy's body. He approached the man and put his hand on his shoulder. And immediately his face changed dramatically. It craved revenge and punishment for the offender. In a moment, his fist entered the face of the man who had been harassing him for so long. The offender was screaming in pain, covering his face with his hands. All the workers turned around to see what was happening behind them. No one could understand what had happened between these men. Then Kim's fist went into the man's face again, and then again and again. Finally, Kim Suho kicked him in the stomach to finally punish the offender. While he was beating him, there was only one thought in his head, that he was doomed. When the man was lying on the ground with his hands covering his head, the other workers grabbed the Kim and prevented him from approaching him. What was the outcome? The man continued to work at the construction site and carried building materials to their destination. One day, in the middle of a working day, he caught sight of a familiar figure. It was the same abuser who had once harassed him. He too continued to work at the construction site. However, when he met him, he hid his eyes and tried to avoid any contact with the guy. The scratches on his face did not allow him to forget the recent assault. Therefore, the man behaved very carefully and calmly towards the boy. As a result, peace came. Sometimes you need to stop any violence against yourself or others. Will everything be fine then? There are a lot of serial criminals in Korea. They usually justify themselves by saying that they were intoxicated and could not control their actions. The guy did not understand why the most violent criminals go unpunished as in the case of an ambitious doctor and scientist. In this regard, his sentence was revised in favor of him and his prison term was reduced, although perhaps it was all about human rights. It turns out interestingly. After all, then the thief should get what he deserves. Returning to the city with the workers, Roy thought about this while the cold body of the insidious dark wizard lay behind him. Meanwhile, the weather was warm and sunny in the rocky valley. Roy, together with his servant and exhausted workers, was returning to his place of work. Suddenly, one of the men began to sweat profusely and breathe heavily as he walked along the path. The young frontline soldier noticed this and became concerned. He asked the man to give him his backpack while he was still able to stand on his own. The laborer was surprised by the offer and refused. However, Royd explained that if the man became ill, he would have to carry twice the weight himself. So he ordered the man to give the load to him. A moment later, the man ordered the other workers to give him their backpacks, as well to make it easier for them to walk. Everyone doubted this idea, but Royd ordered them to fulfill his request. While the front man was tying all the backpacks together in a single ball, his embarrassed workers tried to persuade their noble master not to do so. To pacify the workers, the royal said that he would not pay extra money for those who opposed his decision. The man put a huge backpack of backpacks on his back. Behind him, the workers looked at him, puzzled but sincerely impressed by his kindness. Gabriel did not understand whether the owner really cared about the soldiers' well-being or whether it was the backpacks they were carrying. But at that moment, he realized that the truth was not important to the soldiers. For them, he was a trustworthy leader who they could follow anywhere. 
This is what the soldiers thought of the young swarm leader. Messenger reported for the man that the liberated soldiers were deeply impressed by his actions. And after a while, stories about him will be passed down from generation to generation. Isn't that great? The man thought about the messenger's words. Royd was not impressed because he did not need anything but money. The men were already approaching the village of the powerful sand orcs. Later they managed to complete the construction of a stone-cold storage for food. Haras, along with Royd and Gabriel, inspected it from the inside. The young orc was a little disappointed with what he saw. It was a little cooler inside than outside. And their meat would spoil. And their muscles would lose all their strength. However, Royd decided to reassure the Harash and refute his fears. After all, the work was not yet finished and there would be ice to store the meat. Harash knew what ice was, so he explained its absence in the storage room by saying that it was hot. The young frontier with a smile assured the orc that if there is no ice, you will not be able to make it yourself. The orc was desperate and wanted to know how they could do it. The man assured the giant that they could make it any way they wanted. Harash began to doubt the truth of the swarm's words. But the man just smiled silently at the orc. Young Garrosh began to doubt whether he had brought a swindler to his village, who was trying to deceive him right now. Perhaps the story about the Ant Queen was a lie. The messenger noticed that Garrosh was not as naive as the swarm thought. But the man never thought so. The messenger disagreed with this because he thought that the owner really thought the orc was naive and short-sighted. However, the swarm refuted the messenger's thoughts by saying that the level of sympathy, or rather the client, was much more important to him. And at the same moment, Garrosh remembered that the swarm had saved him, and he shouldn't have thought so badly of his savior. Calmly and cheerfully, the orc headed for the exit, assuring the men that they could ask for help from him any time they needed it. Rody thanked him for his concern, and asked the Haros to wait until all the work was done. As the owner stood there smiling serenely at the orc, Gabriel wanted to know where they would get the eyes from. Royd froze in place for a moment. Turning to the servant, his face was covered with drops of sweat. He too was wondering where they would get the eyes. Gabriel could not believe that these were the eyes of a man who did not know what to do. The servant wanted to know why his master had signed the contract without a specific plan in mind. Was he going to deceive them? And at that moment, Roy asked Xavier to listen to him. He asked the man if he knew the first signs of failure in any business. Xavier looked at the young Frontera in confusion and did not understand what he was talking about. Roy explained that he might not be able to do one thing or another, but there would always be a bunch of reasons why he couldn't do it. So he asked the servant not to behave like that. After all, without trying, you will not know whether it will work or not. The real success will be achieved by those who are open to everything new and try to fix any situation. This is what he called innovation. The man clenched his hand tightly into a fist to show his leadership spirit, because these were the thoughts of a true entrepreneur. Royd was determined. That's why he stood with his fist raised in the middle of the warehouse in front of Xavier. Gabriel was skeptical of the owner's position. He believed that such an enterprise was more likely to fail than to succeed. Soon it was deep night in the work village, and a bright full moon was shining in the sky. A swarm was sitting on a rock in the middle of the rocks, thinking about something. The idea came to him that he needed to make a giant cube of ice first. A pallet and a bell would help him with this, as they would bring water from the lake in no time. The man also knew that there is ice magic in this world. He wanted to know what its principle of operation was. He entertained the idea that this technique was based on freely changing the flow of mana. The young frontline soldier was sure that this was possible due to daily training in mana absorption. After all, there were several types of natural mana. And thus, all changes depended on the nature of these manas. The man seriously thought about how to make it happen. But then, he had a very interesting thought. Of course, he could not use the mana in any way he wished. Royd imagined a pallet and a bell carrying the water in cheeks to a giant ice mold. 
the man could create something akin to ice magic. He wanted to try Azrakan's technique of absorbing mana. After all, if he took all the heat energy out of the water, only the cold energy would remain in it. But then the man accidentally did the opposite, and the energy of cold began to gather around his hands. It was not as easy as he expected. Gabriel watched in silence as the man put his hand into the water. Gabriel remembered his master's words about being open to everything new and trying to fix any situation. Xavier thought that the man's position was rash and irresponsible, but he realized that Royd was really trying to find a way out with dignity. The servant settled on the idea that he did not understand him. Strangely, the swarm continued to sit on his knees with his hands in a giant ice cube tray with water. The messenger told the owner that through the use of the Azrakan mine technique, he had developed a new skill. Namely, raising the level of this technique to the second level with double rings. A few days later, the garage and his father came to the vault again to check the results of the swarm's work. The works were shocked by the temperature inside the vault. They were literally shivering from the cold, and steam was coming out of their mouths. In the middle of the storage room, on wooden pallets, was a giant ice cube. The orcs could not believe their eyes that they had managed to get it. Roth said that everything would be ready as soon as they installed the insulation on the ice cube. And the heap was happy because there was plenty of space in the storage room to store the meat, which no longer had to be thrown away. The garage was also happy that they no longer had to go hunting every day. The orcs decided to celebrate this event and gather all the people. At this moment, Gabriel watched in shock at the satisfied face of the owner while talking to the orcs. Royd defiantly turned his head to look at the servant. He reiterated that he was thinking like a true entrepreneur. Gabriel agreed and did not intend to argue with his master. A little later, the whole tribe gathered in the center of the Steel Sand tribe. Akucha's leader sincerely thanked the swarm for the shelter. But the swarm replied that he shouldn't thank him because he was only fulfilling the terms of their contract. As a result of which the young front man received 120 strong laborers for his enterprise. However, Akucha said that orcs are different from humans in that they do not do this for the sake of a contract. They do it because they are sincerely grateful to him. And from that moment on, the leader of the Steel Sand tribe promised the Swarm one thing. That from that day on, Frontera's family and his tribe would declare an alliance stronger than family ties. Then all the orcs stood in the same position to demonstrate their unity with the Swarm and his family. The orc army shouted the words of the leader again. The Swarm was a little worried. The Kutcha had declared the Swarm his friend, and so his enemies immediately became his enemies and thus their entire tribe. He assured the man that they would come as soon as he needed help. Then the messenger began to load to send a new message to the swarm. He made it clear to the man that the tribe was now available to him. After all, the orc tribe accepted him as a true friend. And now the swarm could strengthen his kinship with them by using the orc's RP. As a result of this event, the young frontrunner received plus 100 bonus RP for discovering the tribe. This brought his total points to 611. For a moment, the man was in mild shock. But a moment later, he was happy to have discovered the Steel Sand tribe and to have become related to them. And so they set off again on a long journey to return home. Of course, the citizens of Frontera Manor were very shocked to see 120 living muscle units arrive in their city. Roy thought that he should write an official appeal to the people to calm the situation down. After all, orcs were often heard of only in a bad light. Meanwhile, the young Frontier's father and mother watched in horror as a bunch of green giants roamed the streets of their city. Even though the Baron was aware of his son's journey, he froze in his tracks as soon as he saw the orcs in person. Moreover, the man did not expect to receive bonus points for helping the giants. The messenger reported that his wonderful story about defeating the wizard and saving the soldiers instantly spread around the city, and the residents of the estate praised the young frontier for his noble courage. After that, the man again received bonus points plus 300 RP
for his achievements in society. The total number of RPs was 911 points. The man thanked him for the RPs, but asked him not to praise him any more. The baron said for his son that he would look for a wealthy buyer to sell what they had received from the orcs. Then they had only the magic stuff of rough Elon. The young wizard was sitting on the floor in the room among the magician's things and holding a magic ball in his hand. Gabriel asked the owner if he had found anything worth selling, but the man was trying to figure out what they could use before selling it. Suddenly, Root came across something strange in the magician's magic book. The man told his servant that he urgently needed to go to the mine. The young front immediately grabbed his cloak and the magic book and hurried out of the room, ordering Xavier to clean up the floor behind him. Soon, the man was reaching the entrance to the cave where his workers were mining coal. Once inside, the man sternly called out to Rhodes, who, along with the other workers, was serving his sentence under the contract. Rhodes heard his master and approached him to find out what was going on. The young frontline worker wanted to give the man some good news. He asked if the man remembered the details of their agreement that he had to work for the swarm for 520 years. The man confirmed that he did. But at the same time, the roids said that it made no sense, because all these conditions were ridiculous. But now, he wouldn't have to worry about anything. Rhodes held his breath waiting for his master's explanation. Royd opened a magic book and showed him how to bring a dead person back to life. Rhodes did not understand what the master was getting at. But Royd explained to him that in this way, he would still be able to serve his full sentence. Isn't it wonderful? The man smiled sarcastically and put his hand on the debtor's shoulder. But at that moment, he asked why he was the only one who was laughing and ordered Rhodes to smile a little too. At first, Rhodes was embarrassed by his master's words. However, in a moment, he understood everything and smiled through tears of disappointment. The cheerful and vigorous swarm continued down the tunnel wishing the debtor not to get discouraged. After all, it was fun for him. The messenger noticed that the Lord of Darkness himself appreciated his efforts and was already thinking about offering him a job. However, the man did not see anything wrong with that and cheerfully walked further into the tunnel. The messenger did not understand the gesture, but he could not object. The sunlight shone through the windows of the frontiersman's mansion. Roy was walking down the hall toward his father's study to discuss something with him. When he entered the study, he did not find the baron and was surprised. Suddenly, the man was approached by a clean lady who explained that the baron was currently receiving guests in the guest room. Roy wanted to know who the guests were. They turned out to be the longtime familiar Lone Shark Salo and the Metropolitan. At first, the man stood motionless looking at the cleaning lady. But in a moment, his face became extremely angry and angry. In the guest room, there was a large chandelier with crystal beads and candles. At the table opposite my father sat the notorious moneylenders. They said that they usually demanded that the debt be covered in one payment. This time, however, they would only allow the baron to pay 10% of the debt if he transferred ownership of the mine to them. Arcos Frontera thought about the offer with his hands folded in front of his face. The loan sharks asked him why he was taking so long to think about it, since it was the best deal he could get. Suddenly, a young Frontera knocked on the door, introducing himself and asking for permission to enter. The father did not hesitate to allow his son to enter the room. Once inside the room, the man began to talk nicely to the moneylenders. The men said, that if he came to threaten them again, it would be useless. They already had a solution. Royd said that from their point of view, a visit with such a good offer was a very reasonable decision. However, he expressed a desire to make a counteroffer to them instead. But one of the moneylenders refused to listen to a fool like Royd. But the young front man still said that in the future they would still pay the debt in installments, although they could really reduce the interest. The moneylender got angry and started shouting at the man that he did not want to listen to him. Roy asked why they were allowed to offer something and not him. 
This position made the man angry. Suddenly everyone heard a strange voice from the hallway. A giant green orc's foot came into the room. The furious Garrosh asked the audience, who had angered his brother Frontera. The moneylenders quickly grabbed each other, their faces full of uncontrollable horror at what they saw. Garrosh told them that his tribe of steel sand would destroy anyone who harmed the young frontier. However, Roy calmly explained to his friend that nothing terrible had happened to him. But the orc noticed that Roy looked extremely angry then. The man said that the moneylender had only raised his voice a little at him. He decided to calm the frightened men down by telling them to ignore the orc. And then the rogue decided to ask them again how they liked his offer. After all, if they refused him, he would be offended to the core. He also added that as soon as they dared to offend the young frontier, he would destroy them right then and there. After these words, the terrified moneylenders quickly fled from the guest room to the street. Roy wanted to make sure that the dead did not exist at all. But as long as that was not possible, he gave his father the opportunity to be satisfied with what he had. The bewildered father agreed and thanked his son. Roy noticed that orders for the system were growing and coal production was in full swing. Thus, they would be able to quickly close the debt. The man handed the contract to his father and asked him not to lose it. The father carefully took the document and made a promise to his son. After that, the young frontier said that they had bigger problems that needed to be solved as soon as possible. After all, orcs consume ten times more food than people. Therefore, their food costs were no joke, but they could not let them go either. The words of the son caused anxiety and misunderstanding of the situation in the eyes of the father. As Roy had thought, the orcs were excellent miners. Their powerful bodies and muscles helped them to make powerful swings of their picks at the stone, and to cut the small stones in an instant. Their eyes were full of fury and passion for hard physical labor. Suddenly, Roth noticed that one of the orcs was heading into the depths of the tunnel without a reinforcement system, digging a path in front of him at the speed of light. The worker clarified that this orc had been working non-stop for twenty-four hours straight. Upon hearing this, the swarm ordered several workers to take him away and make sure he did not appear here until tomorrow morning. The furious orc tried to resist the men who were dragging him out, explaining that he did not want to rest, but only to work, because without it his muscles would weaken. Their productivity was ten times higher than what the swarm had expected, and their endurance and strength defied any explanation. When the young front turned to the garage with a proposal to pay for their work, he said that money was not needed for orcs. On the one hand, this pleased the man. But on the other hand, now, at Garrosh's request, he had only to feed them all enough. This was not an ordinary problem. Roy assumed that as a result they would have to raise taxes very much. After all, they would use the money to buy meat for the orcs. The man explained to his father that because of their natural productivity, they would not go into the red because of such expenses. The father understood his son, but said that he could not be sure that the people of their city would be able to afford it. It was very difficult for him to make a decision. Arco said that they cannot demand such a high tax from people. He explained that if they keep raising the tax, it will be a real robbery of the people. But they are not losing anything now because they will work harder. They could only suffer losses if the amount of tax paid decreased. The father was interested in his son's words and wanted to know how they could raise the tax for the city's residents. The young front said that it was quite simple because it would allow them to earn more money. The man gave an example of an abandoned land in the north of the city. He suggested turning the wetlands of the Marie's estate into a farm, which they would give to people in return. In this way, they would grow various crops on the farm, earn a lot of money, and pay taxes for the baron accordingly. The sky was covered with orange clouds, the sun had disappeared behind the horizon, and it was getting dark. Roy walked confidently in his safety shoes across the marshes in the Mara's estate. Gabriel walked behind him. He told the owner that it had been several hundred years 
since the land had been abandoned. He did not understand how people could grow anything in such a place. However, his big boss had an idea about it. Royd said so, but he didn't deny that it would be difficult. He had to take into account many things because the territory was not small. The family had to think about a system of accurate rainwater drainage. Therefore, the man had no choice but to model a possible option. On the training ground, the man created a reduced model of a marsh in the Mara's wetland out of water and earth. Based on it, Roy tried to come up with an experimental solution to the problem. However, his attempts failed time and time again. The man did not give up and continued to work on the model of the marsh, looking for ways to solve this situation. A new sunny morning dawned in the city. Exhausted, the swarm continued to sit in the same place and use his hands to form pathways out of the swamp to drain rainwater. Arcos and Gabriel came to visit their son. He had been at the training ground for 21 days. Xavier asked if he should stop his master, because he had hardly eaten or slept all those days. But his father forbade the servant to do so. Arcos hated him, even though he was his son. He no longer hoped that Royd would ever become a normal person, because it seemed impossible to him. But now the Baron saw that he was trying to bring amazing changes to their city for the sake of other people. Perhaps his father could not help him at that moment, but he was not going to stop him either. Xavier agreed that it was a wise decision on his part. After all, it was then that the young master of the royalty was responsible for his words and never gave up. The man worked diligently to solve his problem, gritting his teeth and forgetting about everything in the world. It was then that the messenger informed the swarm that Baron Frontera's level of sympathy for him had increased. As a result, he received 20 RP and his total level was 931 points. Meanwhile, the trees were covered with evening fog and it was getting dark outside. The young frontrunner sat in front of the finished model with relief, having found the best solution to remove rainwater from the swamp. He raised his fist in victory, which by then was already illuminated by the moonlight. The man shouted that he needed to suck it in, and then the water would go where it was needed. All this meant that when he figured out the water, he would be able to raise taxes. And then the money of the people of his city would fall on him like a shower. And then the man would have a truly carefree life. Roy could already imagine himself swimming in honey like a bee. But at that moment, he was alone in the middle of the training ground at night. He exhaled and fell to the ground to rest with relief. Roy was extremely exhausted, but he considered it tolerable compared to the way he worked nights and days at odd jobs. Suddenly, a message from the messenger started loading in front of his face. He said that his unusual experience had a good influence on his new skill, namely design. Royd read the information about this skill in the messenger with concentration. There he learned that this skill can be obtained from the personal modeling mode, which in turn is possible by managing the collected data. At the same moment, his visual scanner was used in the man's eyes. Behind him, a digital grid was formed around the rock containing certain data. The man tried to deform this grid in his opinion by increasing the height of the rock. However, the digital model on the grid showed that in this way the rock would collapse. After realizing his new capabilities, the roid began to scold the messenger for not telling him about it earlier. After all, the young frontline worker had spent a whole month searching for the necessary solution. But the messenger thought that it was normal for him because the owner said so himself. However, the man had something else in mind because he was having a hard time all this time. He also told the man that his skill could become visible through the wisdom he had gained. But in this case, the reason for its appearance was his desire. The man asked what his desire was when he first appeared in this place. He believed that the messenger did not know for sure. He did not understand how his wish was connected to this world. After all, he just wanted to graduate from college get a license, get a job in a good company, and not think about money. Wasn't that what he wanted? However, the messenger explained that this was only his goal, and his desire was much stronger. 
It is what overcomes any space and time. The man interrupted the messenger to finish the conversation about the transience of life. He was busy at the moment. Roy got to his feet and called his faithful assistants, Padong and Bell. He invited them to meet their new friends. The magical creatures did not yet understand what their master was doing. The next morning, the sun was rising over the horizon in the Mara's Marsh. At the beginning of the swamp, Roy stood with his friends and thought about the steps to fulfill his plan. First, he ordered his little helpers to pump out all the water. The hamster and the snake were shocked by the amount of work, so the young frontier realized that they could not cope with this task alone. Then he put the little creatures on the ground and decided that he would paint. The man intended to use all his RP to create the maximum number of magical creatures. He turned to the messenger to clarify the cost of this service. Royd had to pay 100 RP for one choice of a magical creature. And since the price would increase by one and a half times each time, he would get four new creatures in total. The man immediately pressed the start button because he didn't need any special skills. After all, he needed the same giants as a paddle and a bell to pump out water. The random creation of creatures was very noisy and everyone was waiting for the result on the sidelines. Suddenly, someone's yellow head peeked out of the magic portal. The creature immediately jumped out of the portal in the direction of the master. Then the yellow ball hit the young Frontera's nose and bounced to the side. It rolled a little further away from the man, who could not understand what kind of creature was in front of him. The balloon turned into a yellow creature with a big mouth that said its name Hippo. Royd was surprised at the name. Could it be a little hippo? The pallet and the bell were happy to have a new friend. Hippo ran with open arms to hug the little creatures. All three of them spun in a circle around each other, calling out their names. Then the swarm apologized to Hippo for distracting him and asked to see the instructions. The little yellow hippo immediately spat the instructions out of his mouth. Royd was already used to this. Then the man began to carefully study the instructions for the new assistant. He learned that a hippo will not grow even if it is fed with sunflower seeds. Maybe Royd had made a mistake this time. Meanwhile, the little hippo just smiled sincerely at his owner. The young frontline soldier stood with his arms crossed and thought about something. The hippo stood in front of him and continued to smile at the man. And then Royd decided to turn to the messenger again to try to create the creature again. However, the messenger said that this function was available only once a day. The man said that he was disappointed and wasted his time. Hypo was upset by the owner's rude words, and the bell and the pad on began to protect their friend. The man explained to his friends that there was more and more work to be done, and the hippo was too small to be of any use. However, the creatures did not back down from their position and started a rally against the owner. Then the man agreed with them because they scared him. Royd asked Hippo if he could absorb moisture from his clothes in return. The messenger replied that Hippo had a level 1 water absorption skill. Royd was interested and asked how much water he could absorb at once. Hippo started pointing to his tummy to say that it could hold four times as much water as his stomach. Roy thought that so far he had all the skills he needed, so he was lucky. Meanwhile, the hippo was getting ready to show his master his skills. The hippo ran over to a nearby pond and began to gently swallow it. Roy and his friends watched as the hippo slowly drank with a squishy mouth. But soon, unexpectedly for the young Frontera, something incredible began to happen. His new friend began to grow significantly in size. Royd also noticed this change along with the others. The yellow creature continued to squishly suck in water. At first, the barren son could hear the squelching by looking down. But soon, he had to look up to hear the hippo. The new friend was ten times the size of his master. At that moment, the yellow creature had almost completely absorbed the water from the marsh in the Mara's land. Later, the satisfied hippo got to his feet and wiped the last drops of water from his mouth. He made the swarm look like a tiny creature. 
Only a few small puddles remained in that part of the swamp. The man opened his mouth in shock at what he saw. He could not believe how so much water had been absorbed in such a short period of time. This meant that they could dry all the water from the swamp in a few days. The pallet and the bell looked up at the owner with pride. The man apologized to them and asked the messenger if the choice of creatures was really random. The messenger explained that when the mouth appeared in this world, his skills were manifested one by one. Since his role as a person with a bad fate could have added a lot of unnecessary worries. Therefore, most likely, the man developed the ability to draw for luck, although perhaps this was not the case. For the swarm, the messenger's assumption seemed a bit rude. Hypo asked the owner for more water. The swarm allowed him to do so because their construction was to begin tomorrow. As the evening progressed, the water in the swamp became less and less. Their construction began with the vertical drainage method. This method involved drilling a well in which water was to accumulate and then be diverted to a spillway. The workers were naturally shocked when they arrived at the construction site and saw the owner's new friend. First, the hypo had to pump out all the water from the swamp and then drain it into the river and become small again. Next, the workers had to turn the ground and take away the remains of the plants. After that, Xavier used his technique to set off an explosion inside the earth. The men dug holes in the ground where they inserted bamboo poles. Next, they made sand pegs and asked the pallet truck to crush the ground on both sides. As soon as the water collected inside the bamboo poles, the jeepo would make a powerful water punch. Later they built a more secure shelter using young Frontera's modeling skills. Ten days passed in this way. The first part of their construction was completed. They still had a long way to go. But what was waiting for them after all the work was done? Rawl had promised the workers to throw a big party. So now they had to do their best. All the soldiers were extremely happy and encouraged by the master's decision. It was a warm day and a large locust was sitting on a tree trunk near the construction site. Sweating, Xavier watched her silently and thought. Before his eyes, the abandoned area was really turning into farmland. Holding the shovel in his hands, Gabriel did not understand why he had started working on the construction site. He had already forgotten what his task was. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted by Royd, who was running to the servant. He handed Xavier some seeds and ordered him to plant them from there. But he asked why he had to do this, since he was a knight. However, when the royal explained that he would protect the estate from pests, the knight agreed. Xavier sat silently over the beds, watering the planted seeds. At this time, he was thinking that the owner had interrupted him again, and that next time he would have to get away with it in some way. Suddenly, the man heard the baron's voice behind him. He approached the servant with his wife and said that all the townspeople had probably heard about the rice farms. Everyone thought it was a real miracle. The laborers were happy to see the rice farms expanding. When the swarm passed by, the men looked at it with respect. Messenger reported that the townspeople were showing their admiration for the miracle he had created. The swarm received plus 450 points for his significant success in the community. The total number of his RP was 1,281 points. Hearing this, the swarm smiled with satisfaction and walked on with a shovel on his shoulder. It was already evening, and small insects were fluttering in the air above the farm. The first stalks of plants began to sprout in the beds. Xavier watched this process with interest keeping the watering can at the ready. And when he noticed the growth of the plants, he was happy about it. In a moment, the owner came up to him and said that everything would be ready as soon as they put the water wheel in place. After all, during the rains, the water would need to go somewhere so that it would not flood their land. However, to realize this, they needed a specialist. Suddenly, the men's conversation was interrupted by an incomprehensible roar behind them. An army of horsemen in suits was moving toward them. Royd wondered who they were. One of the guests was the Viscount Racona, 
whose estate was located to the north of this swamp. In a moment, the horse's rearing was very close. A moment later, one of the men stopped near the swarm and asked which of them was responsible for this construction. Xavier was angry at the man's rudeness, but the swarm immediately replied that he was responsible. The man asked them sternly if they knew that the land belonged to the Vicente of Racona, and so he ordered the bewildered men to leave the area immediately. This place was abandoned several hundred years ago. The northern lands were under the rule of the Viscount Racon, and the southern part of the marshes belonged to the frontiersmen. It was obvious that he had decided to assert his rights for a reason. After all, the Viscount probably wanted to take possession of these fertile lands. I knew that he could really insist on transferring the land to his use, because the northern part of the land belonged to the Viscount. The man smiled, because that was the case until recently. Royd asked the guests if they really thought they had entered his territory without permission. The riders sternly confirmed this, because the king himself had given them the land. In response, the Roy decided to close his mouth to the Viscount's servant so that the conversation could be conducted between people of the same status. This position impressed and puzzled the rider. All the workers stopped working to understand what was happening. The Viscount was also a bit surprised by the man's position. After a moment, the Roy apologized and introduced himself as the eldest son of the Frontera family and made a respectful bow. The Vicomte mentioned that the man had behaved in a disgraceful manner, so he refused to speak to him and ordered him to call his father. Gabriel said that this was rude of the Viscount, but for the swarm, it was not offensive. The writer asked if they had heard their demand to call Baron Frontera. The swarm calmly replied that they had heard them perfectly. Blowing the dirt off his finger, the man clarified that he had only heard the buzzing of a compost fly. The vicar began to turn his head in different directions to see the fly with his own eyes. The window servant explained to his master that he had just been insulted. The viscount was shocked because he did not notice it right away. After that, the swarm said that according to Article 321 of the Royal Law, they had the right to cultivate the marshland. The words of the swarm really hurt the viscount. The young frontiero went on to say that in accordance with this article, they could establish ownership of the land. The Viscount tried to silence the man, but he continued. After all, no one has lived or grown any crops on these lands for the past hundred years. Therefore, as a result of all of the above, the ownership was transferred to those who began to cultivate the land. Firstly, the man explained that they had already invested their money and labor in the land. Secondly, it was possible to build houses for people on this land. Third, they planned to develop long-term agriculture in the future. And the last fourth thing that the man wanted to add was that when he approached the beds, Roy grabbed one of the bulbs by the stem and pulled it up to get it out of the ground. Holding the bulb in his hand, the man reinforced his ownership by saying that he had already harvested the first crop from the farm. All these arguments made the Viscount very angry. At that moment, Gabriel remembered the words of his host, when he had handed him a bag of seeds and asked him to plant them in that place to protect himself from various pests. At the same moment, the swarm congratulated the men on witnessing the first harvest in the Mara's marshes. The man decided not to charge them for this spectacle because they were not such greedy people. Mad sparks of incredible anger and shock flew behind the Viscount. The man did not understand how this fool knew everything. Had he prepared in advance? As a gift, Royd decided to give the crocodile's vicar the first onion. And then the man looked at the guests with a satisfied expression. And then he sternly asked the guests to leave their territory. Gritting his teeth, the viscount had to agree with the man. In a moment, the horsemen were heading in the direction of their estate and left the territory of the Royd farm leaving only dust from the horse's hooves. Xavier asked the owner how he knew that these people would come to them. However, the young frontiersman replied that he had seen such clever people before, trying to make a quick buck off of other people's labor. At the same moment, the workers standing behind him rejoiced loudly. 
because their young master was able to protect their land from these people. The men proudly raised their hands to the sky and rejoiced in praise of their master. The young front turned silently to the workers, listening to their positive shouts. And at the same moment, the man asked them where he was going to get the money to pay them for their work and ordered them to get back to work quickly. Soon, heavy rains poured down on the farmland. All the water was collected in an artificially created canal for rainwater drainage. The young frontline workers sat silently in the rain in the middle of the beds and thought about something. Summer ended and autumn came, and with it the rains. The water will work tirelessly to collect water during the downpour. Roy used the simulation a hundred times, but it was too early for him to relax. He wanted to be completely confident in the fertility of the soil in the Mares. Taking care of his master's well-being, Xavier kept an umbrella over his head. After the rain, the sun's rays began to peek out from the clouds, illuminating the dew droplets on the leaves of the trees. There was almost no water left in the drainage canal after the downpour. Xavier unfolded his umbrella and watched the farm with the owner. The messenger told the man that he had acquired new knowledge in the field of monumental construction. As a result, he left an important mark on the civil engineering of the continent of Lorraine. And as a reward, he was to gain great experience. Royd received increased measurement levels in underground scanning skills, land value estimation, modeling mode, and other skills that were valuable to him. After that, the man got to his feet from the wet grass. At the same time, he learned that the level of sympathy for him had increased from Baron, Baroness, Xavier, Byron, and the townspeople. The total number of his RP was 1,355 points. When the sun fully emerged from behind the clouds, the man said that everything was ready, and it was time to move on to the next step. Meanwhile, back in Raccoon's domain, the servant informs the Viscount about the reclamation of the land. As a result, they will be exempt from taxation for three years and will not have to leave the land. The man could not believe that in the next two years the royal family and their workers would be cultivating the land. Instead, the marshes of the Mares would become a gold mine for the young frontline soldier. At the same moment, the man's stomach twisted because this was his part of the land. He decided that he would not give it up at any cost. So he turned to his servant and asked him to call a meeting. A few days later, the sun shone brightly on the Frunder's estate. Royd woke up with a severe headache. He thought it was because he had been overworked lately, but in a moment he was on his feet because he had a lot of work to do. The master called out to Xavier to wake up, and soon he was surprised to see his servant. He looked very tired and said that he also had a headache. At first Roy did not understand what was wrong but then his face changed to a negative expression. That same day Royd and Xavier went out into the city and found that Baron Emily's cleaning lady, Farmer ALOF and his family, and the boy Mikhail had headaches. They also noticed that all the animals had been avoiding the water since yesterday. Comparing all the complaints from people and the suffering of animals, the man realized that the problem was water. One of the most powerful weapons he could use in this world was the information from the book about the steel knight. However, after the incident with the giant ants, he realized that events that were not in his book could be happening now. Since Royd expected resistance from Viscount, he decided to make some inquiries about him. The young frontman learned that the main source of income for the Lacona region was their secret technology for dying things. And the same technology was used to color fruit. At that moment, the man realized the situation and realized who the culprit was. Meanwhile, in Frontera's estate, the Viscount's servant met with the Baron and told Frontera that if they gave half of the swamps to them, they would stop spoiling their water. The Baron was angry to hear the threat and said he would sue them, but the Lacona representative said it would take at least two years to get a verdict, and they doubted their town would last that long, given the legal fees and drinking water charges. After a long discussion, the Viscount's servant stood up to leave, but the Baron told him 
that they would not give up a single piece of land for him. At this moment, Royd enters his father's room to discuss with his father the necessary measures to improve the water situation in their town. The Viscount's servant, whom Royd accidentally hit with the door, was angry because he had insultingly called his master a parasite. The young frontier boy was surprised that the servant of this parasite understood human language. After these words, the Viscount's knight challenges him to a duel. But Royd immediately knocked his opponent down, not allowing him to get to his feet. The servant asked him to stop and not to hurt him any more. The outcome of the duel was the same as with Newman. Royd completely defeated him and kept beating him, even though he had given up. The Baron was happy to see his son's success, but Xavier saw his master so happy for the first time. I in the evening, Viscount's servant returned to his manor to tell his master of his defeat. When he came to his mansion all beaten up, the Viscount was at first angry with him. But then he thought about an idea and came to the conclusion that the beating of his servant could serve as a good excuse to sue them for assaulting a nobleman. By doing so, he intended to drag out the proceedings and clarification of the circumstances for three or even four years. But Royd already knew what the Viscount was thinking and decided to make the first move. The man told his workers that he would not let their efforts go to waste. Royd promised to protect their land from the greedy hands of their enemies. And at that moment all the people supported the position of the owner. First of all, they planned to make a reservoir as a temporary solution to the problem with drinking water. Hippo, the hippo, who was now at the third level of his skills, could help them with this. But their main and more sustainable goal was to build a canal from the West Mountain Water Lake Kapua, which was located in their territory. The construction would be very difficult, but it would indirectly bring them dozens or even hundreds of times more profit than they expected. Several months passed. The Viscount was extremely angry and disappointed and did not know how it all happened. The man was desperate and nervously thinking about what to do next. That's when his servant told him that the Baron's eldest son wanted to talk to him. But the Viscount ordered him to get out of his estate. The servant explained that Fronter had come to stop the Viscount's worries. A moment later, Royd entered the study with Gabriel and began to mock him, saying that he had turned very pale. But then, the man told Viscount that he could solve their problem. The latter, however, did not understand what problem Frontera's son was talking about. And then Royd arrogantly asked Viscount if he was aware of the latest events. After all, Royd could have saved his dying workshop for painting things and fruits. For a moment, the Viscount blushed and realized that, as he had expected, it was Royd who had destroyed his workshop. The man said that they had done a lot of work to solve their water problem, because at first they did not realize that it was his work. After all, because the Viscount had spoiled their water, they had to get it from the mountain lake Kapua. In general, they had to dig the land from the Kapua River to their estate. They also had to process it and fill it up. The Viscount was very angry and asked how all this was connected to his workshop. But Royd decided to tell him everything in order. So when they were building a water supply system, they came across a huge valley. Standing in the middle of their path, they had no choice but to build a Roman aqueduct. Then, to find limestone as a resource, they carried out blasting operations. But because of this, limestone began to settle at the bottom of the valley in an unintended way. A very large amount of limestone ended up at the bottom of the valley. Then the Viscount interrupted his opponent again to find out how this affected his workshop. In response, the man explained that it was the water from the valley that flowed in the direction of the Viscount's workshop and that the limestone ingredient had turned his fabric the color of feces. Then the Viscount was completely outraged and threatened Royd with legal action. But Royd reacted calmly to this because he had to wait at least two years for a court decision, and by then no one would even remember his workshop or his product. The Viscount was amazed at this wise act from this small-minded man. However, while Royd was listening to the Viscount's threats that he had connections at the royal court, and would make him pay twice as much for the damage he had caused him. 
The man simply waved his hand at him in silence and left the estate. It was a pleasant autumn day outside. Xavier asked him what was the point of this meeting, because all he had done was to make him even angrier. Xavier also said that this man knew many aristocrats in the city, and if a lawsuit started they would lose even more money. Roy understood his anxiety and told him to wait a while to see who would lose more. Exactly a month later, Count Racona arrived at the Fronter's estate. He literally knelt before Roy and asked him to save the almost bankrupt workshop. Roy looked down on the Viscount. After all, his friends at the royal court could not help him. The only choice he had was to tearfully beg the young Roy to revive his workshop. However, the man did not want to hear any apologies. He wanted him to sign a contract with him for a fixed fee. Thus, he promised to restore his workshop in a week. But when the Count saw the terms of the contract, he was very puzzled by the price. The Viscount said that it made no sense to put such a high price on water, which was already so expensive. Royd replied that it was the Viscount who taught him how to set the price of water. The Count was extremely shocked by what he heard. After signing the contract, young Frenter gave the papers to the Baron, who was also shocked to see how much money they would receive each month. After all, with such a sum of money, from which he could easily pay his monthly debt, he would still have enough money left over for himself. Roy happily remarked that the Count was very kind and quite gracious to sign this contract. Xavier knew that it was the Viscount who had started this war between them, and Royd was doing all this for the estate, but at this point he began to look like a real bad guy who wanted the Count to suffer. In addition, the contract with the Viscount did not specify a deadline, which meant that the owner was going to eat him for generations, if possible. The Baron interrupted his son's fantasies by asking if he was all right, and after a positive answer, he told his son another good news, that Count Cremo offered a good price for the treasures he received from the Orc tribe. Royd wondered why he was buying them at such an attractive price. But his father explained that the buyer was planning to make a huge bronze statue out of their treasures instead wanted to make a huge bronze statue. In the middle of the ocean was the trading city of Count Cremo. Then the man stood in the middle of the room and looked out the window at the ocean. A strange water vortex appeared in the seemingly quiet ocean. It seemed to the man as if something was coming out of the ocean. And in a moment, his feelings came true as a huge red creature with many teeth emerged from the water. Cremo looked sternly into its eyes through his window. It was a monstrous titan named Giga. Meanwhile, at the Frontier's estate, Xavier told the Baron that in two weeks they were leaving for a business trip with a team of ten men. Arcos agreed with his son's decision and continued to cut branches on the bushes. Seeing his mood, Xavier was worried about his master and assured him that he would be with Roy all the time. The Baron told the knight, that he would have given everything for Raycon out of fear if it hadn't been for Royd, because he had been a very incompetent and insecure man and leader before. But Xavier reminded him of how he had picked him up in the winter when he found the future servant on the street. But the Baron said he had no motivation to do something like that with such unremarkable qualities. After all, a true leader had to have strong faith and a steely character, just like Royd is now. Xavier thought to himself that Royd's only motivation was money, but decided not to tell his master. It was then that the Baron ordered Xavier not only to protect Royd in the future, but also to be always close to the Baron's descendant. Xavier was embarrassed at first, but immediately agreed to fulfill the Baron's request. Royd could revive the estate, but Xavier could never like a man like Royd. When Xavier was still a child, the Baron asked him what he wanted to become, and he replied that he wanted to become a knight who would protect him from everyone. The Baron was pleased to hear this. He told Xavier that a boy who survived the harsh winter alone would definitely become the strongest knight. Then the Baron gave him a wooden sword that he had carved from a log himself. But this wooden sword was soon broken into pieces by the past Royd, who mocked and insulted the boy. Soon Gabriel returned to the manor. 
He looked up at the wall where his little broken sword hung and continued to think that he would never like a man like Royd. Entering his master's room, Roy thanked Gabriel for once again choosing to use his engineering lullaby. Xavier was bored listening to the same thing over and over again, so he asked him to hurry up and start, thinking that he should hate Roy, but for some reason he continued to see him as a different person. Xavier continued to beat himself up and eventually fell asleep. It was late at night, and the moon was shining through the windows of the Fronter's mansion. While they were both sleeping soundly, a man with a sword and a black cloak climbed through the window into the room, intent on ending Royd right then and there. The unknown man pulled out his sword and whispered that it was Royd's fault. At the same moment, the man jumped out of the window at the young frontline soldier. His sword flew rapidly toward the man's chest. But suddenly Xavier woke up and immediately jumped up to stop the criminal. With one swift movement, Gabriel cut the offender's sword in half. He was shocked by the servant's reaction. Royd woke up at the same time. He got out of bed and saw that Gabriel was sitting on the floor holding a strange man in dark clothes by the head. The next morning, the men continued to work on the water pipe. He asked the workers what was the most important thing in the operation of any enterprise. The workers told him that the most important thing was safety. Xavier went to the owner and told him that he had informed the crayfish knight about the knight's incident. It was the right decision. After all, this man was a servant of the Viscount whom he most likely fired primarily because of the high cost of water. Ride said that he would have done the same if he had been paid good money and had not fulfilled his duties. That's why this man attacked him, because all short-sighted people are similar. Xavier asked if the owner knew this would happen. He wondered how Royd could always foresee certain events but never prepare for them. The young frontier looked silently at the servant and pretended that he did not understand what he was talking about. After all, why did he need to prepare for anything if Xavier was always there? Gabriel was very touched by his master's words. Royd added that he was still alive only because Xavier was there at the right time. It showed his reliability and endurance as a knight. After all, not every young boy could survive the winter alone without any help. And it was this person who was able to become a knight who was with him at that time. Who else could he have trusted? Xavier was genuinely impressed and surprised by his host's position. The two men looked at each other in silence. After a few minutes, the swarm became silent and he asked the servant to finally say a word. Gabriel's hesitated and did not know what to say in response. Xavier said only the word wow. But then he hated himself inside. Then Roy lost it for a moment and patted the servant's shoulder in a friendly way to encourage him. Xavier hated himself for thinking Roy was a good man. Then the messenger told the man that at that moment Xavier got rid of a long-standing resentment in his heart. His level of interest in his host increased by 15 points. Royd also received 320 PTS for improving his interpersonal relationships. His total score was 1,675 points. He planned to complete the construction of their water supply pipe the next day. So it was time to go to the creamery to get a decent amount of money. The next day, the weather was gloomy in the autumn forest. Meanwhile, Royd and his crew marched forward on the trail. The young front man was dozing sweetly sitting behind Xavier, who was up on his horse. Suddenly, his master's head tilted to the side, causing him to wake up immediately. He thought that Gabriel had hit him then. However, Xavier said that he did nothing of the sort. Royd assumed that the servant had hit him because Xavier was annoyed that a nobleman like him did not ride and slept on the move. But the servant denied any accusations from his master. Suddenly, the young frontier ordered him to stop. At the same moment, the man quickly got down from his horse and asked Xavier to teach him how to ride. However, Gabriel refused, explaining that he was a knight and not a riding teacher. The messenger translated the servant's explanation as admiration for the fact that the master was trying to learn something new and necessary. But Royd said it was an order. Instead, 
The messenger translated it as a sincere request for training address to Xavier. Then the messenger tried to translate all the men's words into actual words, which eventually drove Roy crazy. For a moment, Gabriel thought that the host had lost his mind. The messenger also said that rumors spread faster than words. Specifically, rumors that he had built the first water supply system on the continent. As a result, his reputation as a builder has increased, and later his name would be written in the history of construction of the kingdom and the entire continent. For this, the man received 600 bonus RPs. His total score was 2,275 points. Reading all these messages, Royd realized that he was in luck. It meant he could expand his business. After all, fame meant money and money meant a carefree old age. The man smiled because he was sure that he had a golden future ahead of him. Because of the abrupt change in his mood, he again thought that he had gone mad. Their journey to the cream was not easy. The manifestations of winter were felt more strongly as they approached their destination. They arrived in Cremo only in the middle of winter, when the city was already heavily covered with snow. Soon the men were met by a local feudal lord of Cremo, who thanked them for their visit. Royd also introduced himself and, together with Xavier, bowed to the count. Cremo said that he had imagined Frontera a little differently but noticed that the man exuded nobility. Suddenly, the Count approached Xavier and said that he probably had royalty in his family. Royd was embarrassed because the Count confused Xavier with him. Cremo even started asking Gabriel if he was engaged because he had a daughter. And when he tried to tell him that there was a mistake, the Count got angry because the servant Royd interrupted him. The messenger started laughing out loud at this situation. Meanwhile, it was snowing outside the window. The Count laughed when he realized that he had made a big mistake and mistaken Xavier for a nobleman. The man apologized to the swarm for this. The messenger tried to make a joke on his master, but the latter did not allow him to continue. Count Cremo was the lord of the expensive city of Cremo. He played a significant role in the novel The Knight of Steel. After all, Xavier, who was wanted after a massacre of moneylenders, came to Cremo under the active influence of the Count. However, after talking to the knight, he realized that Xavier was a decent man. After that, he played an important role as his associate. The Count said that he wanted to buy their treasures to install statues in the sea. After all, trade in their place has completely deteriorated recently. Because a few years ago, Mega Titans started appearing in the seaport. They never attacked them directly, but their mere presence was terrifying. At that moment, Royd realized that he had heard about this before. It was impossible to attack from the sea, so there was no point in a navy. Gradually, the city of Cremo fell into decline, and the Count despaired. He believed that Xavier would help him. After all, there were many hints of this in the novel, but then the end suddenly came. It was not even clear whether there would be a second season. When Royd first came into this world, he thought he knew the novel's content perfectly. But now events are happening that were not there. The Count tried to find out how to get rid of these creatures. And he came to the conclusion that the main fear of the Titans was mermaids. After all, they were the strongest warriors of the ocean. So when the Count found out, that these creatures shake only at the sight of mermaids. He decided to install bronze statues of mermaids in the center of the sea. However, the man soon abandoned this idea. After all, if he made an earthen mound right in the water to support the statue, the sea would become shallow and ships would not be able to sail freely. Roy was not happy when he heard this. Against the odds, he called the young frontiersman down by saying that he would still honor the agreement and buy their treasure. But Royd said he could not allow him to suffer a one-sided loss. The man intended to sell his treasures for the Count at a high price and to install the statues without affecting trade routes. The friction racks and drainage wells were to help him with this. They were sure to succeed, given these two elements. When Roy and Xavier were sailing in a boat on the sea, he put a mask over his eyes, 
and put his head down into the water with bated breath. Using his scanner, the man began to study the seabed. Fortunately, the seabed was quite flat with lots of sedimentary rocks, so the ground was soft enough. The man wanted to know if these rocks could be found even deeper in the layers of the earth. But his air ran out, and Royd immediately went up the mountain to replenish his oxygen supply. Then he noticed Gabriel's satisfied look on his face, and asked why he was smiling. And Xavier explained that he had never felt so happy watching someone else suffer. The young frontier was shocked to hear such words from his servant. When Xavier started rowing, he asked his master if he was really satisfied with the terms of the contract. But Royd asked him not to change the subject. No matter how much Xavier thought, he could not understand how to make an earthen embankment in the middle of the ocean. So the man suggested that some kind of magic was involved. Royd agreed because he planned to use cement as magic. The only problem was how cement was mixed in this world. After all, if it was Roman cement, everything should have turned out perfectly. When Xavier offered his hand to the owner to help him get up from the boat, he asked him to be less careful so that he could easily fall into the water. Suddenly someone spoke to the men. Behind them stood a pretty girl in a fluffy dress with blonde hair, who held out an envelope with a letter for Royd. The man was momentarily confused by such beauty. The girl greeted him and introduced herself as Count Cremo's daughter, Christine. She said that she had seen Royd yesterday in the courtyard of their estate and was instantly ashamed. Christina closed her eyes tightly and clutched the letter in her hands. Roy was a little embarrassed and waited to see what would happen next. The girl finally decided and handed the letter to her husband, but not to Roy, but to Xavier. Just like her father, she too had mixed up the men. In a way, the young frontline soldier expected it. Roy was a bit puzzled, although he thought it was probably the right thing to do. Xavier took the envelope from the nice woman's hands and quickly tucked it into his pocket inside his coat. Young Christine hurried away with her servants, not believing that he had accepted her letter. Gabriel silently watched the young beauty go and intended to leave, but the displeased master stopped him. Roy asked him if he thought everything that had happened then was normal. Xavier did not understand why the owner was so irritated, because he did not see anything wrong with accepting a love message. In a moment, Gabriel was surprised to realize that the master had probably never received a love letter before. The servant's assumptions made Roy even more angry. And then Xavier, although a little confused, decided to sincerely sympathize with the owner and support him. The messenger told the swarm that Xavier sincerely supported him. The man was very angry about this. While working on the drawings, Roy repeated over and over that he did not envy Gabriel. After all, he would soon become a rich man and earn a lot of money. When Count Cremo approached him, he did not recognize him at first and responded rudely. But a moment later he apologized, explaining that he was concentrating on his work. The Count came to report that almost all the materials he had requested had been delivered, all but the volcanic ash. Roth thought about it because it was a key material for Roman cement. The advantages of such cement were obvious. After all, any structure made of such cement could stand for more than 2,000 years. Its reliability was unconditional. The Count said that it was possible to get the ash if you went to where the volcanoes were. The only problem was that the journey to such a place could take six months, which was too long even for him. However, Royd encouraged the man by saying that he had a solution. His plan was to forget about Roman cement and replace it with Portland cement. This type of cement was already a modern material. Royd only knew roughly how to mix it, but his lack of knowledge was in the details. Even if he didn't know what to do, he could always at least try. The man decided to try everything he could. Days passed, and the winter weather was frosty in the city. There was a pile of crushed cement on the man's desk. The sample number 129 failed, although the swarm seemed to have succeeded. He should have chosen the right mixing ratio. And if it wasn't that, 
Then the problem was in the drying. The man decided to add four more indicators. Subsequently, he calculated other indicators to achieve the perfect result. Meanwhile, his little helpers watched their master suffering with pity and sympathy. Then they pounced on him to go for a walk with them. But the man refused because he was busy. The man became irritated and shook his head to drive the little creatures away. Then he shouted at his friends that he was busy. And at that moment, he remembered the cute little puppy that was his friend. Roy began to remember his little friend who died when he was still living in his world. The man noticed his little paw peeking out from under the burial cloth. At that time, Kim Suho was not himself, sitting near the body of his four-legged friend. The man bitterly mourned the loss because this puppy was all he had left. Kim apologized to the little puppy. He wanted to pet it again and play with it together. And at that very moment, Roy grabbed his little helpers and hugged them all together. The young friend told them that they were much more valuable to him than this research. It was already night outside, and the moon was illuminating the sea waves. Roy was walking along the coast with his little friends. Suddenly a man said he was a terrible person. The bell pallet and the hippo did not understand what their master was getting at. After all, everything was going according to plan because he was just giving orders as if they were some kind of robots. He added that there was no bigger TV dork in the world than him, so he was very sorry about it. A moment later, the young frontline soldier stopped abruptly to kneel down in front of his friends. The man sincerely thanked his assistants, because it was all thanks to them. The little creature smiled sincerely at the man in return. The messenger said that the magical creatures felt his sincerity towards them. He also explained that his little helpers see him as their family. The level of sympathy of magical beings increased to family ties. Royd was surprised at this development. After all, these little creatures considered him a family member. The messenger informed him that the bell enhancement function was now available to him. Thus, with its help, the swarm could master a new skill for 500 RP. This was exactly the special skill he had not even thought about. Then the Padong and the Hypo brought the bell forward, so that the swarm could discover a new skill. So whatever the new skill of the bell was, the man agreed because he knew he would find a use for it. Meanwhile, the messenger activated the upgrade function and asked him to choose a magical creature. Even if the skill was useless, the swarm agreed to it because the bell wanted it. In a moment, it was standing in the center of a blue magic portal. It lifted the creature up and illuminated it with a bright light. There was a bright pop that threw the swarm and other creatures a meter away from the bell. At the same time, the messenger reported that the first level upgrade was successful. As a reward for the upgrade, new skills were unlocked. Namely, soil absorption, land cultivation, and metal production of the third level. Also, the bell received a new special skill of volcanic eruption of the first level. Roy was very excited about this upgrade. The next morning, the weather was freezing in the trading city of Cremo. Suddenly, a powerful explosion was heard over a mountain near the town. The townspeople were very worried to hear such a loud sound. Count Cremo was also seriously frightened and looked out the window. He saw thick black smoke rising behind the mountain. It was the work of a bellflower that, after being upgraded, had staged a volcanic eruption. Behind it, Royd and Xavier were watching the process. The man could not believe that they managed to get volcanic ash with the help of a bell. His plan really worked. Royd was happy and asked Xavier how he felt about it. But the servant did not hear his master. Because the man had forgotten to tell him to cover his ears, Xavier could not hear him. Roy took the opportunity to say that Gabriel was ugly. He even replied that he was not as ugly as his young master. Thanks to the bell, the problem with the cement was quickly resolved. In the world of construction, speed is life, so they had to start right away. First they had to provide the bell with a giant diaper to filter the ash. On the other side of the diaper, 
they had to attach a five-layer sieve. All the townspeople gathered in the square to watch this interesting spectacle. When everything was ready, the man covered his ears and told the bell to start. The bell's volcanic eruption skill was activated. When the diaper inflated, the man ordered the bell to make a second attempt. The game in Crimea was also watching this action. The man covered his ears and did not understand how it was happening because it was beyond his understanding. He wanted to know everything so that he could tell the king in detail. After all, if his talent was really as great as everyone said, it would be very sad to show it somewhere on the outskirts of life. Once all the materials for the cement were collected, it was time for step two. This step consisted of building a discharge well where the cement was to be poured. Later they installed the well in the sea with the help of a giant crane, and the water was pumped out of the well thanks to the skill of the hippos. The third step was to drive the fractional posts into the ocean floor inside the well. When Xavier was done, he asked when the next batch of racks would be delivered. Royd replied that he would have to wait because it took some time to deliver them. The man looked at the servant silently and smiled. Xavier asked what the emotion was on his face. Royd replied that he was waiting for Gabriel to start telling him that he was a knight and shouldn't do this. For a few seconds, the men just looked at each other in silence. And then Xavier turned around and left, leaving the hammer on the ground. Roy began to tell him that if Xavier did not work with the hammer, he would not earn any money and, as a result, would not pay the debt. And when he was exhausted from despair, the Baron would be desperate, and the Baroness would follow. Therefore, the young frontier began to beg the brave knight to protect his family. Xavier was annoyed but he still grabbed the hammer and continued to drive the posts into the ocean floor. After he finished practicing, they made strong rod frames with steel protrusions at the ends. Finally, they poured the long-awaited cement from the ship into the mold. After the cement had set, they dismantled the well and freed the cement structure. Now the artificial sea soil was laid in the base of the future statue. Roy reported to the Count that the column was 50 centimeters higher than the water level in the ocean. If they put the statue there, it would rise above the water. Cremo agreed with this. In fact, he still did not believe that such a column could support the weight of a statue. However, if everything worked out, he promised to be generous with the man. Royd was happy with the Count's decision. Night came, and the sea was slightly stormy. In the middle of the sea, the statue was already mounted on a cement column. Around it were ships covered with garlands and bright lights. The body of the statue was decorated with various gold and jewels. Meanwhile, a lavish feast was in full swing on the ship. There were many people on deck. Royd was worried about the tie around his neck that was too tight. He asked Xavier how he could wear it at all. This surprised the servant because Royd spoke of it as if it was the first time he had dressed like that. Xavier remembered that his master had already participated in similar outings. The young frontier was embarrassed, explaining that it was a long time ago. At the same moment, the conversation was interrupted by Count Cremo, who addressed all those present and asked for a moment of their attention. When the guests turned their attention to him, he said that Roy had made an invaluable contribution to the installation of the statue. Suddenly, a crowd of people rushed over to Xavier, wanting to get to know him better, shake his hand, and express their admiration for his work. Royd was smart enough to realize where this was going. But he kept telling himself that he was not jealous at all, and that money was more important to him than praise and recognition. However, he was annoyed by the expression on Xavier's face at that moment, because the man did not want him to look at him or feel sorry for him. Count Cremo approached the swarm and said, laughing, that it was all because of his face. At the same moment, the man put his hand on Roy's shoulder and told people that he was responsible for the installation of the statue. The people turned around and were shocked to hear this because they thought the man was just a simple servant. The feast in the middle of the sea continued. The glow from the festive garlands and lights attracted a lot of attention in the darkness of the night. 
The bright light also attracted the attention of the titanic Jihu. The sea monster emerged from the water to get a better look at what was happening. Among several ships, he noticed a large merman. His eyes were filled with bewilderment and fear because the merman was their sworn enemy. The golden jewelry on the statue's body reflected the light from the ship's garlands, which scared the sea creature away even more. He stared at the statue from afar for a long time and decided to dive back into the water. A moment later, the giant decided to swim towards the merman because he was all alone and it was much easier to destroy him. Meanwhile, the swarm was kindly chatting with the guests, and Gabriel, while eating without realizing it, was fascinating young ladies and women with his appearance. While everyone was busy celebrating, Xavier was drinking quietly when he suddenly felt an ominous sensation coming from the distant sea. Roy approached the servant and asked him why he was so silent. Xavier told him that something was rapidly approaching the ship at high speed. When Roy asked him how big it was, Xavier told him that it was at least twice the size of the ship, even bigger than a full-sized hippo. Roy immediately realized what it was and why it was headed their way. Roy immediately informed the Count of the approach of the Giga Titan. The Count informed his knight, who also had the status of a sword master, but was not as sensitive. Xavier told the Count that he felt nothing, and the Count replied that the Titan had never come this far. After all, in all these years there was no reason for him to attack now. It was then that they noticed the mermaid and realized why he had come here. The Count ordered the men to raise the anchor and move away from the mermaid statue. They all quickly started to raise the handle, but Xavier told them that they were too late. Roy ordered him to cut the anchor. Roy threw a paddle to free the ship from the statue. Xavier decides to jump into the sea himself to cut the anchor. At this point, the man uses his explosive sword and cuts the anchor. Meanwhile, the paddon also breaks the rope. After cutting the anchor, Xavier sees that the Titan is already very close. It was too fast. They disperse the ships from the statue, but the giant Titan emerged from the water and began to destroy the ships. The giant hit the statue so hard that it flew in all directions, all the way to the city. Xavier emerged from the water and used his explosive technique to save Royd. The impact threw the statue into the air. There were too many people drowning, and the men could not save them all one by one. Royd took Hippo out and ordered him to do one favor. The Hippo began to drink all the water along with the people. Xavier told Roy that the monster was heading for the city, so they had to hurry. But then, the servant saw that Roy wanted to go in the other direction from the city. Xavier asked his master where he was going, and he replied in anger that this was not their estate, and there was no way they could defeat such a monster. A moment later, he ordered Xavier to jump into the boat, and not to do anything crazy. Xavier saw the Count trying his best to save as many people as possible. Hippo, the Hippo, helped him a lot. Xavier stood there extremely disappointed, and Roy kept telling him to jump into the boat because it was none of their business, because they were only here for trade and money. Young Frontier told Xavier to let the city troops handle the situation. Then Xavier remembered the times when he had shown bravery and risked his life for the sake of people. He was someone Xavier could rely on. But no matter what he did, he was the same Roy Frontera, the same selfish person. Xavier's positive impression of him decreased by five points. Xavier could not let people die and told the owner that he was going back to town. Roy yelled at him and ordered him not to leave or he would die, but Xavier did not listen. He used his explosive technique and his sword as a surfboard to quickly get to the city. The Titan was already gradually destroying the city ruthlessly. The whole of Cremo was in chaos. Then the man saw the statue of the mermaid and was going to end it all. When the troops began to fire their cannons at the Titan, their shells did not leave even a scar on his body, and this only made the Titan even angrier. Then he fired a water wave at the watchtower, which was completely destroyed, and the Titan was about to crush one of the citizens. 
Xavier got there just in time and attacked him using his strongest blasting technique. To his surprise, he couldn't even scratch its surface carapace with his strongest attack. At the same moment, the Titan noticed him and began to actively attacking him. The monster threw the man away, and while he was in the air, he struck again with a water attack that Xavier could not dodge. As a result of this attack, Xavier received a direct blow, he was wounded and considered himself defeated. Gabriel already knew that he had no chance against such a monster, but he felt relieved that he had played the role of bait. After all, it kept the monster focused on him so that the villagers could escape and leave the place in the meantime. On the other side, Royd was still reeling from the battle, trying to convince himself that it was the right decision. Of course, he felt bad because the city was destroyed and people were dying. However, it was not his place to fight this monster, because he was only a builder, not a knight. And no matter how much he tried to convince himself, his consciousness did not allow him to leave Xavier and the people in trouble. And most importantly, Frontera thought that if the city was destroyed, he would not get the money to build it. Greed is an incredible thing. At the same moment, he brought the bellflower to use her eruption technique to get to the city faster. Because young Frontera couldn't let some lobster-like monster take his money. Royd saw Xavier just as he was about to intervene and launch another attack. Instead, he hit a giant lobster near the building with an angry Royd. Seeing an opportunity, Xavier jumped, but his attacks kept bouncing off him. The man decided to calm down and stop. Soon, Royd returned while riding Padong and watched Xavier fight. The man realized that all their actions had no effect. So he examined the monster and realized that its shell was made of a mixture of dentin and chitin, and it was a meter thick. Seeing the structure of this shell and the energy flowing through it, Royd realized that the monster was using its horn to dissipate energy. Further analysis showed him the monster's weak point. Then the young frontier asked Xavier to cut off this horn. Even though the servant believed that the monster would not die from this, Xavier still trusted Royd. At the same moment, Xavier was approaching the monster's horn after being advised on how to cut it off. Meanwhile, Padon was fighting off the monster's attacks. When Xavier cut off the giant's horn, right after it fell to the ground, Royd ordered Xavier to enter with his sword right between the monster's middle legs. Xavier immediately ducks under the monster to attack its weak point. But just as he was about to cut it in half, Royd saw his sword fall to the ground. In an instant, the monster almost crushed him with its weight, but luckily, a second before, Padong had managed to pull Xavier out from under the monster. Xavier thanked Padong before raising his sword. Meanwhile, the swarm moved on to Plan D. He called Padong and asked him to move to another location, while asking Xavier to lure the monster along the east coast. As the Count looked on in horror at the destruction the monster was bringing to the city, Royd appeared beside him and told him that he had a plan involving the statue the monster was so obsessed with. Xavier lured the Giga Titan to the place Royd asked for and found a piece of the statue tied to a map. The monster was extremely angry because its attention was distracted by the statue, which gave Xavier the opportunity he needed. Xavier got to the spot and decided to use a mana blast, but it seems he became too weak from overuse. At that moment, the man fell down and began to lament his weakness, only to hear that Royd had found an opening large enough to launch his own attack. As Xavier's fall was interrupted by the hamster's kick, Royd rushed through the gap into the giant lobster shell. The man was extremely exhausted and at the end of his rope, so he then decided to ask Padong to launch him into the air, because before the battle began, Royd had used his RP reserve to level up his basic Azrahan mine technique to level 9. He was a few RP short of reaching the triple rings of the mana heart. While Royd was hanging on the monster's shell and wondering what to do, Xavier's sympathy level for him increased enough to allow him to get the extra points he needed to reach the triple rings of the mana heart. Royd invested his points in improving Azrahan's basic technique to the point where he could use a mana blast. 
Royd started to prepare to attack, but the moment he was about to attack, he received a hard blow to the head with a stone, which caused his focus to be broken. And instead of facing the two solid circles, all three of them unleashed the previously mentioned destructive attack. Therefore, at the cost of risking his own heart, his triple ring created a gigantic explosion that hit the monster at its weakest point. Soon Xavier woke up surrounded by his little helpers and saw the monster's corpse. Suddenly, he felt a podong pull his finger, pointing at Royd. Xavier rushed to find his master. After examining the man, he realized that Royd's heart had stopped. Soon after, a carrier pigeon flew to the Baron with a letter from Count Cremo. After reading its contents, the Baron rushed to Cremo with the Baroness and Bayern. The letter said that the swarm, having fulfilled his duties, had fallen into a coma while defending the city from a monster. The Baron was extremely upset to the point that he was rushing to Cremo without prior preparation in freezing weather. On the way, he remembered how Royd always addressed him as, My Lord, and wondered if Royd was really his son. His train of thought was interrupted when the man saw a wolf-like monster approaching them. Then their knight dismounted to meet the beast face to face. However, the beast asked him to run away, not to fight. But the man said that these creatures were super fast, and that as soon as he turned around, they would take his head off. Then the knight said that he would distract the monster and give the leaf and his wife a chance to get to the cream. After giving the two nobles a chance to escape, the baron left, ordering Byron to meet them in Cremo. Byron was left alone with the beast. When its long claws flew towards the knight, he bravely fought off the monster with his sword. The furious wolf flew at the knight, but he was ready to fight back. But the wolf broke his sword in an instant. Suddenly, the beast grabbed his shoulder with its teeth and knocked Byron to the ground with a broken sword. The knight was in a difficult position, but he had a small knife with him. He stabbed the monster in the face with it, but it had almost no effect. But at that moment, the Baron and Baroness appeared in time to attack the monster, destroyed it by plunging two swords into its body at the same time. Thus, they saved their knight. Byron felt ashamed that he could not resist the beast alone, but the Baron told him that as a lord he was obliged to protect his subjects. However, everything suddenly changed for the worse when a whole pack of wolf beasts appeared in front of them. Byron picked up his sword and faced the monsters as they were about to attack him. The Baron and Baroness clung to each other, thinking it was the end for them. At that moment, Xavier appeared and began to quickly chop the attackers to pieces. His sword practically did not stop leaving only the heads of the wolves behind. Byron was surprised to see how much Xavier had improved his skills in the short time he had been in the cream. Afterwards, Royd's parents asked Xavier if their son was okay, but the man said he was not sure of his current condition at the moment. After the fight with Giga Titan, when Gabriel found his master dead, he was scared, because if Royd didn't survive, Xavier would lose his entire house. The man took Royd's hand, and suddenly he felt a pulse, although his heart had stopped. He was breathing, albeit weakly. The servant kept his hand on the body of his pale master and could not believe it was possible. And at that moment, the man noticed triple rings of mana in the swarm's chest. Moreover, they were spinning at an incredible speed. It was difficult for him to know the state of his heart because he could not check it through the magnetic field. This incredible movement of the clouds was not in his heart, and the mana itself kept him alive. Then if Xavier realized that the Mega Titan met his end from a triple explosion. The man asked the owner what he was doing knowing that he would not answer him. Soon the weather in the city of Crema was sunny and frosty again. The townspeople were repairing their houses after the monster attack. Others were clearing away the rubble from the houses. Together with three nobles, Gabriel reached the city. The man said that the swarm was in the Count's house and that the doctor was currently taking care of him without any significant changes. Arcos expressed his admiration for the servant because he was only a swarm, and he was able to resist the monster who had organized all this. 
against Gabriel, he said that it was entirely the merit of the Swarm Master. After all, only his strength helped to end the monster. The man's parents were worried. Arcos could not believe that his son, the Swarm, had such strength. However, on the way to the Count's estate, he heard that other people were also trying to visit his son. Sometimes, he heard talk about Royd's nobility. It was hard for the man to imagine even how many people he had saved from the water before he reached the Mahatan. One man, walking on crutches, said that if it wasn't for the swarm, he wouldn't be in front of them now. After all, the Royd saved him when he was running with a pallet, and left a bellman to clean up the debris. A group of women suggested that the fire was caused by some elements of the statue, and that if it wasn't for the swarm, the city would have turned into a sea of fire, because everyone saw the giants appearing out of nowhere and absorbing water to put out the fire. Now it was hard to imagine the number of people in this place who now owed the swarm. It seemed that all the townspeople were standing in front of the windows of Count Cremo's mansion in anticipation. They all hoped that soon their savior would open his eyes. Suddenly, a man's voice was heard in the crowd trying to prove to everyone that Royd was the cause of all this chaos. At first, people looked at him in silence and then spoke a few words to each other. But in a moment, they all gathered together to kick the fool. The triple rings continued to spin around the heart of the mana swarm. The messenger reported that his sacrifice and bravery had made a great positive impression on the townspeople. For this achievement, he could receive a bonus if he asked for details. The young frontline soldier raised his head and opened his eyes. The man stood up in a sitting position and felt a severe headache. He remembered how he had thoughtlessly used the triple explosion. Royd asked the messenger if he was still alive. The messenger replied that it was possible, because undead people cannot dream. But Royd could not believe it because he thought that his heart was part of the settings. Instead, the messenger asked the man to pay attention to more important things. At the same moment, Xavier came into the room. His eyes showed sincere shock. Holding his head, Royd said that he had come just in time. He wanted to know when they were going to be paid for their work. At first Gabriel was embarrassed by his master's reaction, but then he realized that he felt better. Suddenly, he heard his parents screaming. They immediately ran into the room and grabbed their son in their arms. With tears in their eyes, the parents were happy that he was okay. They were extremely worried about him. It was not important to them whether it was really their son. They were just grateful that he was alive. Soon the news of the recent events in the city of Crimea reached the kingdom of the Magenta. The letter to the king stated that the Mega Titan was destroyed and no longer posed a danger to people. The king was surprised that such an unusual young man was on his lands. He ordered his servant to send a message to the Franther's estate inviting him and his knight. Whether it was true or not, the king met with these men in person. But it was not a king. Queen Alicia, the term Magentano, was sitting on the throne. The messenger reported that rumors of his bravery and sacrifice had spread throughout the country. Meanwhile, Royd was silently riding in a carriage, realizing everything that had happened to him. He was given a bonus of one and a half thousand RP for his improved reputation in the community. Roy was extremely happy about this. The assistant also told him about a new skill, the heart of mana. The man was able to accumulate a large concentration of mana in his heart. Mr. Roy was not surprised that he had so much energy in him even though he had been in a coma for a month. Since he had mana in his heart, he realized that in the future it would be much easier for him to work with a shovel. The messenger asked if this was all that was bothering him the most, and the swarm seemed dismissive of such an attitude toward hard-working workers from him. The messenger apologized to the owner. He explained that his mana heart was not due to training, but to the shock wave from the explosion. Therefore, his mana heart had unique features. Royd was curious to hear what they were. He had gained an exclusive option for the shock compensation skill, which allowed him to minimize the impact of any explosion. He didn't understand his new skill, 
and asked if he could use the triple strike anytime. Then the young frontline realized that mining would also be much faster thanks to this. The messenger asked him to say something cooler. And Roy thought that now he was humiliating mining as well. But he again apologized to the owner for this. Although the reason why the heart of the mana had to be protected from the consequences of the explosion was that mana was like a storehouse of ammunition. One had only to strike a match and everything would instantly fly into the air. Since the consequences of the impact are catastrophic, if the heart is not protected, you can lose your life. But at that moment, Roy did not have a mana heart. That's why he is still alive, because the shockwaves settled in his heart. Trying to save his life, it turned into a mana heart. While the swarm's mana heart was developing powerfully, he didn't even notice it, thinking that waving a shovel was much more useful. The man realized that sometimes it would not hurt him to act like a fool. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted by the Count of Cream, who entered the carriage and apologized for the wait. The Count got into the carriage. Roy looked slyly to the side and licked his lips. In a moment, their carriage moved forward. The young front man stared silently out the window, leaning on his elbow. He looked at the destroyed houses and the road and asked the Count how much it would cost to rebuild them. Cremo replied positively that the repairs could cost more than their monthly budget for the town. At that moment, Roy thought that if the Mega Titan had not died, their expenses could now exceed the city's annual budget. The Count started to get angry and asked what the man meant. The man replied that compared to the annual budget, the payment he received was hardly even pocket money. He laughed and added that who would have thought that a statue erected to fight a mega titan would bring such trouble. After all, no one can be blamed for their choice because this choice was made by nature itself. However, thanks to the fact that there were people who were willing to sacrifice themselves, it is good that everything worked out. And also when Roy thought about it, he remembered that he had overheard the servants. They said that those who work in the interests of the townspeople, regardless of their status, should definitely be compensated. Roy added that he was only curious to know how strong the interest of his townspeople was. The sweaty and irritated Count said that he would pay him one and a half times more. Roy silently looked out the window, thinking about the Count's offer. The furious Cremo asked if this would be enough for him. However, the young broker apologized for the misunderstanding between them because he had not asked for more money. But now he knew that for him, the lives of the townspeople were worthy of an increase in remuneration of only one and a half times the total amount. The Count was stunned by Fronter's conclusion. Meanwhile, their chariot was traveling fast on the stone road. While Royd was silent, the Count decided to offer double payment. However, the man did not react to this. Cremo began to sweat profusely and offered triple the amount. Royd was extremely pleased to hear this, but tried not to show his satisfaction to the Count. Cremo finally calmed down and could exhale. Suddenly, Royd stretched out his hands to the Count. The man said that he was impressed by the Count's clever distribution of funds. He said he would consider it compensation that he could spin in the right way. The man shook hands with a swarm in embarrassment, realizing that it was all a demand for clean water. However, he did not hate him. For some reason, he was not even annoyed. Suddenly the townspeople saw the Count's carriage approaching them. The carriage stopped and all the people were happy to see Royd. The man looked out the window and smiled, because in Korea, he was just a piece of garbage. The excessive attention of people began to tire him. The Count said that there were magic balls on the podium that amplified the sound. All this was for the sake of the townspeople to listen to the swarm. Roy was sitting in the carriage wondering what he would say on stage, because he was definitely not making money with his passion. When the man took the stage, he saw hundreds of townspeople chanting his name with excitement. At first, he was hesitant to speak, but then he gathered his courage and put his hand on the magic ball. He was amazed by the number of people present. At the same moment, the man said that if he could get money from each of them, it would be very wonderful. 
he asked if everyone already knew about his heating system. However, the people's faces showed surprise at the new words they heard. He looked around and realized that no one in the town had heard of it. The man said that the older generation suffered from joint pain in the winter, and parents were worried that their children would get sick. He asked how much time they spent on making fire. Maybe an hour or two a day. So if they are over 50 years old, they have already spent 15 years of their lives doing this. He said that if they consider it a lot of time, they should memorize what a heating system is. After all, thanks to this, the quality of life of all the townspeople could increase tenfold. For more information, the man asked them to contact him and visit the frontier estate. With that, he ended his speech. The man silently turned around and left. The Count knew the reason why he simply could not hate him. After all, Royd had a thorough approach to all financial matters. He was persistent but reasonable. Besides, he did everything he had to do. So instead of hating him, he wanted to make him his subordinate. After all, it would have been too stupid for him to keep him in the wilderness where he came from. Frontera's estate was to become his sweet gold mine. And the main knight here was Mr. Byron. He was honest, sincere, hard-working, everything was fine, but compared to his perseverance, his knightly skills were mediocre. The count was a problem, because he thought his knightly skills were even less than average. Royd sat silently in the hall opposite Byron. The latter told him that all the preparations were complete. He handed the man a list of land allocations. The knight explained that they had decided to deal with the problem of labor shortages on the farms, while the orcs were to take over the work in the mines. And thanks to a neighboring estate, they were able to secure a large contract for the installation of a heating system. With a 30% discount, the net profit rate was 10%. Taking into account the volume of coal sales, the final net profit rate was over 50%. Knight wanted to continue with the waterproofing and rehabilitation, but Roy had stopped him. He asked if Byron had been doing all this himself while he was away. The knight looked at the owner in confusion. He said he was just fulfilling his request to keep an eye on things while he was away. Suddenly, a worker came into the room and said that the last level of the heating system had been laid and asked the knight to take a look. Seeing the knight's capabilities, Royd realizes that if he had been born in Korea, he would probably have become a managing director of a large corporation. It seems that the contracts for the supply of floor insulation lent themselves well to Byron's leadership. Royd's parents concluded that their son was close to paying off the debt. While Royd and Gabriel were overseeing the construction of the coal warehouse, a trumpet sounded to announce the arrival of someone Royd felt an ominous feeling from the pompous messenger who announced the arrival of the king's envoy. The messenger began to read out the contents of the letter, which stated that Royd and Xavier were summoned to the royal capital for an audience with Queen Alicia. Royd was not very happy, remembering how he had been dragged into the work because he was good at something. Now he felt that his pride had been hurt, and he would have to work even harder. The man was already saying goodbye to his lovely country and his noble life. Meanwhile, Royd and Xavier were being taken in the royal carriage, and the young frontier looked like a corpse, and Xavier tried to cheer him up in his own way, saying that a gentleman he knew would like to extort as much money as possible from the queen. These traits were inherent in Royd, as a money-hungry person leading to the empress. After the first greetings, the empress asks Javier about the man she. She thinks he might be a worthy sparring partner, but Javier apologizes saying he is just a nameless knight. The empress in return expressed her gratitude for their feats, as well as the two that had taken place in the cream. And later she said that she did not care much for other people's recommendations and would prefer to see for herself their skills. She intended to test the skills of the swarm. Alicia asked the man which construction project, he thought, was the most advantageous in the color purple. Since Royd knew everything from the book, he knew the correct answer was to repair the crumbling palace, but he decides to say he would build a new bridge on the purple river that runs through the capital, knowing that. 
The Empress asks him the reason for this decision. Roy replies that others might think that repairing the royal palace is the most urgent thing to do right now, given that the dragon has flown off the palace tower twice in the past. He also said that the way the palace is built now is the reason why the structure is crumbling, but that repairs are only necessary afterwards, so it cannot be considered urgent. After they read each other's thoughts, Royd said that the current bridge over the Purple River has already been rebuilt twelve times because it regularly collapses when the water rises, and that if she gave him a construction contract, he could build a bridge that would never collapse. His idea was to build a modern suspension bridge. Despite the man's insolence, the Empress realizes that the more she talks to him, the more she likes him. Meanwhile, the woman begins to ask the swarm about the details, and he begins to talk about suspension bridges. In the novel, the Empress was betrayed by the one she cherished, who lost his arm and turned into an evil tyrant butcher. Royd offered the Empress his head if the bridge failed, and she smiled and agreed, until Royd mentioned a written contract that irritated the Empress. When he questioned her words, the royal said that it was just a contract and he would be hanged if he did not fulfill it. After Sweet talks with the Empress, the Swordfisher is happy to have gotten the contract and not lost his head. Meanwhile, the Empress's bodyguard Sir Kyle is talking to the Empress. The man speaks of the swarm's insight. He asked her if she was unhappy and she said yes, because he seemed to know from the beginning that he would defeat her. But his pathetic posture was adorable afterward. Royd leaves the pole, leaving Xavier behind because he continues to attract the attention of women from everywhere in the capital. Royd goes to see Julian Frontera, his younger brother, who is studying at the Royal Academy and his parents have committed suicide. Eventually, Royd reaches the Academy and finds Julian, who is supposed to be Xavier's age, and sees that he is very skilled in defense. Royd decides to act as if he has turned a new leaf, becoming kinder than the Royd he was supposed to be. Julian is already suspicious of him, because he hasn't called him names, and has even done what his mother told him to do. Royd turned around to leave before Julian became even more suspicious, but remembered that his mother had asked him to have lunch with him. So he reluctantly asked Julian if he knew of a restaurant where they could have lunch. While Lloyd tries to be as much of a jerk as he should be, everything falls short of Julian's expectations. They have lunch and Julian continues to puzzle over how Lloyd has changed so much. Royd has changed so much that he gets hit in the head by another student who starts bullying him. Julian, because he forgot something, and then begins to despise the Frontera family, openly calling Julian names. The impoverished Royd realizes that the Academy values status more and students are annoyed when the son of a poor village baron is the best in the class. Royd wonders if he should intervene, but Julian looks at him to keep him out of it. Suddenly, the student starts talking about being the heir to the Lacona Dyed Fabrics Company. Hearing this, the evil side of the swarm wakes up, and he asks. The student who his father is and learns that it is the Viscount, before he can say more, Lloyd beats the student across the room. Meanwhile, other bullies try to intervene and get randomly slapped one after another. After beating up all the others, the Viscount's son, Diego Lacona, punches the swarm in the face, which brings an evil smile to the man's face. He begins to kick Diego thoroughly, grinning ear to ear like a maniac. Julian intervenes, grabbing the swarm from behind to stop him. The man tells Julian that he doesn't have to worry about being bullied after this because Diego will not be able to bully him. After all, if he is dead, the swarm will start beating Diego again. When the dean and his guards show up, the swarm introduces himself to the dean and then apologizes to him for causing such a commotion, saying that he was only. He says that Diego is responsible for the abuse, even though he knows that the staff probably already knew about the abuse Julian was suffering but could not do anything about it. Fearing to upset the aristocrats, the dean asks what this has to do with Her Majesty. Before the royalty takes out the coat of arms marking him as a royal guest, the dean kneels before the coat of arms, 
but intends to treat the offenders better as if they were the coat of arms, because the coat of arms was only a temporary hope to calm him down. Royd knows the dean's intentions quite well, so he went with Julian to the office to ask for a leave of absence. Julian yelled at him for ruining his life, thinking the bullying would get worse, and for making him miss school. But Royd reassured him that studying here would be useless. Soon after, at the royal palace, Julian met Xavier, who suggested that he trust the swarm's plan, which Julian could not believe. Xavier told him that it was the swarm that planned to destroy the Giga Titan, along with all the developments he had made in the royal palace. The swarm had been listening to their conversation through the door. Julian asked Xavier if someone could really change like him. Xavier replied that he thought it was impossible, and that the swarm was probably someone in disguise. Then suspicions arose in his mind, and he told Julian that he had read that his soul could theoretically inhabit someone else's body using a powerful mana binding, and so he had been investigating the swarm secretly to find out if there was any mana flow that was inhabiting someone else's soul in his body. He found no such anomaly, much to Royd's relief. But he didn't even realize that Xavier knew what he wanted and knew that Julian didn't know that his family was in debt. However, he still paid tribute to Roy for handling it. Then the man received RP, and now that Julian's favorability rating has increased, Roy entered the room and tells Julian that they are going to practice. Roy made a pizza out of stone and clay and let the bellhop eat it to create metal wires, which Pong later rolled into cables. The man then gave Julian a shovel, saying it was an important task. Julian asked, why he had given him such an important task, to which Royd replied that it was because he thought he was smart and responsible. Royd went to his workshop to borrow some technology that could help him create the suspension bridge and met with the royal dwarf master Corgudis. Royd knows that Corgudis is a stubborn old dwarf and won't budge until he is interested, so he gets the blueprints and forces Corgudis to look at them. Corgudis tells him he doesn't want to see him, but not before he sees his interest peak. As the swarm starts to leave, a dwarf stops them, saying that the structure could break if it is not properly installed. Royd objects, saying that he is, well aware of the consequences if anyone other than Corgudis helped with the construction. When the dwarf was done, he looked at the blueprints and agreed to help with the installation. So the process began. Royd went with Xavier to work on the suspension towers. When they were just starting, nobles with guards appeared and began to accuse Royd of fraud. Royd was taken to the Empress, where the nobles complained that there was already a bridge on the river that had stood for thirty years, and Lloyd was trying to build another one. The Empress calls everyone to the table, and both sides begin to present their arguments. The first to speak is the Builders' Guild, with Victor, the leader of the Builders Guild, who claims that the purple bridge has been standing for thirty years, and says that it will fall like a slide. A slide on the Guild. Royd cannot recall future events, so instead he asks the official sitting next to the leader how much he is paid to do this. The accusation is clear, and the Empress is encouraged to emphasize the writer's mistake as, as an unfounded accusation against a royal official. At the same moment, the woman orders that the Roy be tied up and an executioner placed over him. The Empress declares that he has insulted her with his lies, and now she must restore her honor. Cavia was already reaching for his blade when the Empress asked the swarm if he had any last words. He said to destroy the entire family of the culprit. The Empress asks Victor and the official if they agree, and they agree, and the Empress declares that she will prove her vassal's innocence. She summoned magicians to cast a confession spell on him. As a result, the vassal is found to be corrupt, and they are both immediately punished and paraded in public half-naked. Royd appears and tells us that he begged the Empress not to harm their families, and the Empress in turn also ordered all the workers in the kingdom to help with the construction of the bridge. The work went smoothly and the suspension tower was quickly completed with cables attached to both suspension towers. Julian and Xavier looked at the completed bridge, 
and Royd received 1,050 RP along with the Empress's granting of the title of Master Builder. The problem of the estate's debts would now be solved. But the question remained that the Empress would now want to use Royd's abilities further. She asked him to return with her to the royal palace, but the man intended to break free from the Queen's power and solve the problem with Julian's academy. At the palace, the Empress presented Royd with a title of nobility. Royd earnestly asked the Empress for something more, saying that he would like her to withdraw the offer of the land and title, and in return, he would like a thorough purge of the Royal Academy. Lloyd explained that it was currently full of corruption and inequality, where lower-ranking students were subjected to physical and mental suffering. He believed that the Academy was now just a platform for students to exercise their power rather than to learn. The man then asked Xavier to produce a document detailing the results of their four-month investigation into the Academy's graduates and teachers who had left the Academy because of corruption, including their testimonies. The nobles immediately began to panic and claim that Royd was a liar and that nothing he said was true. The furious empress summoned magicians to cast a spell of confession on the nobles. The nobles who spoke were punished before the empress began arresting everyone. Royd watched the process with Xavier, convinced that the queen must have forgotten he existed, so he could sneak back into the village. When Sir Kyle appeared behind him, he told him to leave only after attending the banquet. The next day, he also told Royd that the queen said his plan to create a diversion with the academy was excellent, and she respected his desire to live a lazy life. Kyle leaves him a little dumbfounded. Even Xavier couldn't sense his approach considering that Kyle is the best swordsman in the kingdom. Later, Royd talks to Julian about the events and how he guessed what would happen. Julian tells Royd that he doesn't have to force himself to curse him because he trusts his brother and is proud of him. The swarm stepped aside and received a significant increase in RP on his balance sheet. Later, at a royal banquet, the Empress asked Roy to come to her, and she mocked her husband a bit with Xavier. So before the Empress ordered the swarm to fulfill her order, he reluctantly stepped forward. The Queen told him that she would prepare everything for him if he ever changed his mind. She then leaves the swarm to enjoy his newfound financial freedom. The man begins to eat to his heart's content, and suddenly realizes that his insurance will lapse in three years, because of the evil queen. Royd suddenly hears the phrase that the feast will last until the moon sets. As Kyle walks behind him, the young front man remembers it from the time when the queen was poisoned and lost one of her arms. It was another secret code used by those who planned the assassination, which was not to take place for another three years. In the inner chambers, the queen sat down on the sofa and thought that perhaps she had overdone it. She seemed to be overworked, given the floods, the academy with Ashfagan, a hostile state led by Samarkand that was gathering an army in its western lands. She did not yet fully believe that this was a threat, because in that case they would have to cross the wilderness to attack. Alicia suddenly began to have a severe headache, her condition was deteriorating, and she realized that she had been poisoned. She tried to leave the room when she saw Kyle at the door thinking he had come to help, but instead, he was gone. Suddenly, Royd asked Xavier to come with him, because the man sensed that something was wrong and that Xavier might have to distract the sword master. Xavier asked the owner what he should do, because he had also felt the strange energy of mana. Royd confidently said that they had to defeat the sword master. The servant took it as a joke and decided that they would just have to stall for time. Xavier rushed down the hall and grabbed the metal pole from the candlestick with him. Gabriel said that they had three minutes, and Roy replied that this would be enough for them. The men rushed down the corridor toward the queen's room. Nearby, on the floor of the corridor, they saw the bodies of three men lying motionless. Kyle's eyes turned white, and he made a powerful swing of his sword at the queen but the woman instantly managed to deflect and restrain the servant's blow. Kyle noticed that even in this state, the woman was able to block his blow three times. When the woman wanted to ask why he was doing this, her strength left her 
and she fell to the floor. Kyle's eyes were filled with cruelty and rage. He took another swing at the queen. But at the same moment, Xavier ran into the room and swiftly struck the woman servant with a pole. However, Kyle quickly oriented himself and was able to repel Gabriel. He was surprised that Xavier blocked his blow with a candlestick. At the same time, Gabriel concentrated to strike the ring with the highest vibration. The man didn't realize what it was, thinking it was some new and unusual way for mana to work. Xavier screamed furiously before striking. The sparks from the mana in his candlestick flew in all directions. Kyle took a step back and was frightened by the man's strength. While Xavier was distracting Kyle, Roy ran up to the queen with his hands over his head and asked if she was okay. The woman was surprised how they managed to do it. However, Roy immediately covered her mouth and put his hand on her stomach. The man intended to use Azrahan's method to absorb the mana from the queen. Meanwhile, Xavier continued to fight the powerful swordsman Kyle. Then Kyle decided to use his Aura sword. As a result, his sword began to shine with a pink light. Xavier realized that only a true master can create an Aura sword. And as soon as he finished, everything would be over. At the same moment, Xavier threw his candlestick toward Kyle. The latter was surprised by the pitch, but ready to accept it. In flight, Xavier tried to grab his pole to hit his opponent. The man grabbed the pole and intended to use his explosive kick against the kite. Xavier's sword was on fire from the force of it. At that moment, Kyle recognized that Gabriel was a genius in mana management and his skills. However, since he lacked practical experience, the man deflected Xavier's attack and looked at his opponent menacingly. The powerful force of the blow sent Xavier flying to the side, and the floor under him broke. A red liquid splashed on Xavier. Sweat was pouring down Royd's forehead. He told Xavier to hold on. Royd was counting on him, because if he lost, it would be the end of them all. He smiled with satisfaction that he was able to strike Xavier with a blank, but still wounded him. The man thought it would be the best moment to attack again. Xavier ran toward the enemy. The men joined in a new fight. Kyle was angry at Xavier's confidence and courage. The man made another blow to Gabriel's head, but he quickly ducked. As Xavier slid across the floor from the swordmaster, he called for help from the padong. The hamster tried to hold on to a metal part on the servant's sword, but could not hold on, and fell to the floor. Kyle stopped and was extremely angry with Gabriel. And he, in turn, was preparing to strike again. Kyle screamed and ran at the man with a sword in his hand. Gabriel was frightened, but he gathered all his strength into the sword and used his explosive punch. At first Kyle did not understand what was happening, but in a moment, he flew into the corridor of the palace from the force of the explosion. The man realized that Gabriel was using his power as a cannon. The powerful force of the explosion caused a large flame to spread across the walls of the palace. Kyle covered his head and tried to escape from that place. But at the same moment Gabriel jumped out of the queen's room to catch up with the criminal. Then the man used his explosive power again to stop Kyle. His explosion bounced off the walls, forming several explosions at once. The man ran away in terror from the explosion saying that Xavier was a real monster. Veins and sweat stood out on the swarm's face from the exertion. The man continued to keep his hand on the body of the exhausted queen. The queen turned to the Groida with curiosity as to how he was absorbing her mana, and at the same time, poison mana. However, the man asked her not to speak because it prevented him from concentrating. To the queen, his tone seemed arrogant, but the royal asked that the queen be more loyal to him at this moment. A moment later, the swarm coughed, and red discharge suddenly flowed from his mouth. The woman was embarrassed by the young Frontera's actions. She could not believe that he was ready to save her even at the cost of his own life. At that moment, Kyle was in a dead end. The flames from Xavier's explosion were approaching him. Suddenly, 
the flames from the explosion burst into the ceremonial hall. The doors to the hall were blown out by such a powerful force. All the people were extremely frightened. After the flames, a large cloud of dust appeared, and Kyle froze in place, waiting for his opponent to appear. Suddenly, in the cloud of dust, he saw the silhouette of a wounded Xavier approaching him. Gabriel looked at the criminal Kyle and told him that he would not get out of there alive. Kyle frowned and realized that he would only be wasting his time if he tried to get rid of him. Kyle smiled slyly as a plan came to him. At the same moment, the man called the armed guards to him, saying that Xavier and his supporters were going to attack the queen. Thus, the man urged them to raise their swords with him to defend her majesty. Suddenly, dozens of armed knights stood against Xavier. Kyle ordered them to capture him by all means. However, Xavier was ready to confront them. The man gritted his teeth and was ready to give even that many knights a run for their money. Then in one move, he threw three guards, who were in his way into the air at once. Then the man continued to destroy the guards one by one. Seeing all this, Kyle realized that he had never heard of a person with such skills. Therefore, if he could reach the level of a sword master, he could easily conquer and destroy a whole small state. But Kyle could not allow this to happen. So he told everyone to get away from him, because he intended to fight him alone. After all, he was going to lose. Xavier looked at Kyle's aura sword in fear. The swordmaster held his sword tightly in his hand, and immediately he made a powerful blow with the aura sword toward Xavier. Gabriel flew into the corridor of the palace from such power. His power destroyed not only the flooring, but also the columns and part of the walls in the corridor. After that, Kyle silently turned around and headed for the exit. Xavier was lying on the floor, all mangled and exhausted. His clothes were torn and his forehead and body were covered with red spots. A moment later, Kyle confidently approached Xavier. Just then, the swarm finished absorbing the poison mana from the queen. The queen felt better, and at that moment she looked at the swarm. In addition to the protruding wines on his face and body, the man began to vomit violently right in the room. The queen said that if he continued to sit like that, he would die quickly. The woman told him to gather all the poison mana in one hand because it would help. The man agreed to this because he should have cut off his hand because that is what she did to herself in the novel. Roy believed that there would be no harm in losing his arm. The only thing is that it would be inconvenient for him to dig with a shovel. The man concentrated all the poisonous mana in one hand and picked up a table knife. Roy intended to make an explosive stroke. In an instant, a powerful magical force was released from his knife. It was so powerful that it destroyed the roof of the queen's room and flew into the sky. Hearing an inexplicable explosion, Kyle stopped and listened. The man realized that it sounded like a powerful release of mana. Kyle realized that the young further did not even know what he had done. Suddenly Xavier got to his feet and stood in front of Kyle with a broken sword in his hand. Kyle couldn't understand how Gabriel was able to get up after a direct collision with his aura sword. Through the pain and sweat, Xavier said that he had taken an oath, and that was why he had to keep it. It was a quiet, peaceful, starry night. Xavier told his master that he was scared from the beginning to the end. Roy did not understand the servant's words. The men sat in front of the fire and shared their thoughts with each other. Royd asked what kind of nonsense Xavier was talking about. Gabriel replied that he, as a knight, had forgotten his duties and rushed to meet the Mega Titan in defense of his young master. He was also disappointed that his master did not support him. He was sad because he wanted to trust the swarm. In the end, it was always like that. With his weak willpower and lack of strength, he did not consider himself worthy of the role of a knight. The swarm was surprised by the servant's words and assured him that it was not like that. The servant said that he would still face a six-month pay cut. Xavier looked at the owner in silence. The men continued to sit by the fire. Gabriel suggested that the pay cut should be for three months. 
but Royd was not going to give in to Xavier. At one point, Xavier promised that as a knight of the young master, he would never again neglect his duties. Royd did not believe his words to be true as long as he was wielding a stick at the rich man. Gabriel, on the other hand, said that he was still keeping his word. Xavier already knew that his master possessed the three rings of the mana heart. So he had to catch up with him as soon as possible to remain a worthy knight. To do this, he had to become a sword master by the end of the year. Royd joked about the servant's desire by comparing his goal to losing weight. The men fell silent again. Roy then picked up his wand from the ground and addressed Xavier. He explained to him that each person has a limit to how much he can expand his mother's heart. Therefore, theoretically, he would not be able to grow any further even if he trained for a hundred years. According to the man, the boundless ocean of mana is not so easy to polish. While Roy was drawing on the ground with a stick, Xavier immediately erased his drawing with his foot. Xavier realized that this time, he would be able to do without his master's help. He decided that he would no longer rely on the swarm master. Using only his own strength, he intended to become a worthy swordsman. After all, when he fought with a kite, he also relied on his own strength. And when Kyle struck at him again with his sword, Xavier was able to avoid him. Carl was very surprised by this because any other body would have been shattered into pieces when it met his sword of aura. Then Kyle asked him if he had strengthened his body by connecting all his mana. If it was possible, he would have been impressed by his little trick. But the man was tired of it all and decided to end it with Gabriel. At the same time we were waiting for Xavier to pass through the body. The man was screaming frantically from the pain and feared that the sword master was causing him. However, at the same time Xavier immediately grabbed Kyle's hand in which he was holding the sword. Kyle was shocked by Xavier's behavior and thought he was crazy to do that. Gabriel realized that the mana radiating from his sword aura was tearing it apart. However, he decided to let it pass through the sword to his hand, and then in return to his heart of mana. Thanks to this energy, Xavier was lifted up and fell to the floor, hitting the wall in the palace corridor. The mangled Xavier lay on the floor, unmoving. Kyle walked over to him and stared at the body of the young Frontera servant with a fearsome look. He could not feel his breath or the flow of his mana. So the man decided that he had spent too much time with Xavier and decided that it was time for him to go after the queen's head. But suddenly Xavier got to his feet with a broken sword in his hands. Kyle was amazed that he was able to get back up after such a fall. Exhausted, Xavier told Kyle that he now realized what a sword master's mana was. In a moment, the man was confidently holding a sword in front of him that shone with green light. Shocked, Kyle looked at it and could not understand what it was. It was Gabriel's aura sword. Kyle had never seen anything like it. Then Xavier concentrated to gather his power into the sword. The man took a swing at Kyle, and at the same moment the floor began to crack under his feet. A furious stream of green mana from Xavier's aura rushed toward Kyle. He, in turn, prepared to take the blow by launching his mana in his direction. But his power was less than Xavier's. So the man realized with fear that his mana had passed through him. In a moment, red drops flew into the air and Kyle's hand was torn from his body. The man was screaming in pain, and next to his body on the floor was a huge crack from Xavier's blow. At the same moment, several guards rushed to the explosion to help their master Kyle. However, Xavier told them that whoever approached him would meet the sword master. Just then, a woman's scream was heard in the queen's room. At that moment, the queen was sitting on the floor next to the sword master and asked him to open his eyes. She asked him to absorb her mana to recover. The woman was nervously shouting at Frontera because she could not afford to lose such a talented man as he was. Suddenly, the swarm opened its eyes and looked at the worried queen. The messenger informed him that he had survived the poisoning. As a result, he had a new skill option for the mana heart. 
namely immunity that became resistant to all types of poisons, as well as a fast and powerful fight that made it possible to absorb mana from the environment during severe fatigue. Royd started to smile because he was glad to have such cool new skills. The queen did not understand his expression and slapped him on the forehead. Royd was embarrassed by the woman's reaction. However, she could not explain her actions either. Instead, the queen asked if Royd was feeling better. Although his legs were shaking, he had to get up to help Xavier as soon as possible. After all, now that he had discovered a new skill, he had no choice but to try it out. Then the man began to absorb mana from the environment in front of the queen. The man used a quick, powerful struggle. And the queen, with extreme delight, did not understand what was happening. Then the swarm began to suck mana from all the space around it. The queen panics for a moment as her mana is absorbed at an exponential rate. Is being absorbed exponentially, but calms herself down and offers her mana to the swarm. The swarm wakes up again and finds the environment depleted in his hard mana level, which has increased to that of a low-ranked sword expert. Next, he unlocked the frenzy skill, which activated the berserker mode for 60 seconds, in which his strength, stamina, and reflexes increased by 200%. Suddenly, the swarm noticed that her highness was exhausted. In a panic, the Empress tells him that she will ask about the details later, as the first priority is to apprehend Kyle. Royd carried her at her request, and the two of them went to Xavier's aid, only to find him with a sword in his hand, and Kyle on the floor without an arm. The Queen ordered the guards to lower their weapons before ordering an investigation of everyone who was at the banquet. As the Empress leaves, Royd asks Xavier about his bonuses, and gets a little annoyed, when he casually brushes him off. Then a messenger appeared and informed the swarm that he had fulfilled a hidden condition and unlocked the system of add-ons, according to which any earned achievement leads to an honorary title, and each title is accompanied by its own bonus skill. In addition, at midnight of each full moon, the swarm received a certain number of points to add to the list of fancy titles that fit his face. He chose a title related to the events in Cremo. Later, after the investigation, Roy returned to his room, where Julian asked him if they had found the man behind Sir Kyle. It turned out that he had caught the people who were plotting against him, but the confession spell did not work because it was blocked by a protection spell. Roy realized that the plot was moving too fast, which made his knowledge of future events more unpredictable. Julian asked about Xavier and learned that he was summoned separately by the queen because he had become a sword master. Julian was instantly shocked to hear that he had become a swordsman. In the hall, the queen addressed Xavier and told him that the position of captain of the royal guard was currently vacant, and then the woman ordered him to stand next to her and take the captain's place. However, Xavier instead asked the empress for forgiveness saying that his Baron Arcos was with him, and he could not leave his master. The queen said that this was an order, and that disobedience to an order was tantamount to treason. Xavier then asked her to allow him to send, to send a farewell letter to the Baron. After that, the Empress realized that Xavier would rather die than serve her, so she allowed him to leave. Xavier went out to find Julian, who asked her what she had said. Xavier replied that he would always be a knight of the Frontera family. Later that night, Roy checked out the other titles he had received. One title allowed him to obey Frontera's subjects without question, another allowed him to use orcs, and a third title, connected to Queen Alicia, meant he had her full trust over anyone else. On the night of the full moon, Roy received RP for the titles he held. Then the man decided to check out the ending spoiler reward where he could spend RP to see the final scene for the storyline, he clicked to see it. Royd ran around and found himself in the future. The man moved to the place where the fire was burning the neighborhood and immediately tried to find a sign that would show where the place was. And he realizes that it is the Frontera estate. Houses and trees are in ruins, not far from it. 
he also sees that people are dead, something is eating them. He runs around to see what's happening in the manor and calls out to anyone who can hear him. And O1 answered. So he turned to the system, asking what kind of ending this is, wondering if it would end like this. Suddenly, he stopped and saw two people standing right in front of him, then he and Xavier, watching the death of the Baron and Baroness. Royd also saw himself from the future, where he wished he had come a little earlier. He was crying, apologizing for not being able to protect anyone. He was angry looking at the ruined ending, and so he started shouting at the system, asking what kind of ending it was. Suddenly, a huge swarm of giant locusts appeared behind him. Royd knew about it, but wondered why it appeared at the exact moment when Xavier appeared and was about to meet the swarm of locusts. With all his anger and the power of a sword master, he struck the swarm with his aura sword, cutting through the red sky. But he was not able to get rid of all the locusts. Swarms kept coming, and the bigger they got, the more time passed. Eventually, even with the power of his newly acquired sword aura, Xavier Azrakan dies, eaten alive by a swarm of locusts, along with his master, Swarm Frontor, and the entire northern part of the kingdom. The swarm woke up in horror at the sight. He asked the messenger what he had just seen and added whether all this would happen. The messenger did not confirm whether it would or not. Instead, it told him to think about what he would lose if he was wrong. So he immediately ran to the palace, because he knew that he himself had said something in the future in a spoiler. If only he had come a little bit earlier, he doesn't know how much. A little bit earlier is, so he needed to get to the estate as quickly as possible, because he knew the exact cause of this swarm of locusts. He talked to the queen and explained that the entire region of Cremo would be turned to mud. So the swarm asked Alicia to mobilize the troops and prepare for this unprecedented disaster. Alicia was surprised that the swarm's words came out of nowhere, so she asked him to explain everything in detail. Royd explained that this was the work of their people's enemy, Asfahan. They were trying to create dominoes of these monsters to drain the kingdom's strength. In addition, they are pushing the monsters out of the eastern desert, taking away their habitat, causing the monsters to move westward and chase another group westward. They are being pushed out like dominoes, and these monsters will wreak havoc in their eastern region. Royd internally believes that this incident should happen no sooner than three and a half years from now, and it should take place much further north than the Frontera estate. He didn't know why the timing and details of this event had changed, but he didn't have time to worry about it now. Although Alicia thought there had been some movement from Asfahan in the eastern desert, she asked the Reed how he could know about the movement of their nation's enemy. This shocked him and he tried to find a way to explain his deep knowledge. She knew that the Royd was hiding too much from Alicia, because she found him more suspicious than Asfahan. So he began, making up a story as he went along, telling her that he had some connections, a bloodline, in fact, with the Wasteland Orcs, a tribe of sand and steel. They send him a carrier pigeon to inform him of this. As for what he knows about the attempted assassination of Kyle, he explained that he saw Kyle and his subordinates talking strangely, so when the swarm saw the suspicious looks they were giving each other, he followed them and witnessed the event. As for how he absorbed mana and destroyed his surroundings, he explained that his bodyguard was a genius who had no equal. They had been together since childhood, and Xavier had taught him the secret magic of self-defense, and Roy claimed that he could master these skills. Alicia thought that although this story made sense, she knew that Royd was making these stories up as he went along. And the swarm knew that she knew, so he used the last trick he had, which was a headline where he could get Alicia's full trust. So she gave him 500 warriors under his direct command, the White Cavalry, and 50 wizards to support him. She also allowed him to command them, because he knew the enemy's movements. Royd was happy thinking how generous Alicia was, so he thanked her. She strikes back by saying that he should know more than anyone else and asking if he thinks that trusting his baseless assumptions comes at no cost. So he does his due diligence, 
saying that he knows everything very well, and tells her that if they can stop the monster's attack, he will announce to the world that the foresight and determination in this matter belong to the queen. To restore the honor of the crown, which was tarnished by the assassination attempt. She says that she has never met such a suspicious person as Royd, but she likes that they understand each other. After that, Royd and Xavier ride off on some kind of magic horse. Xavier asks the swarm about all the reasons why he has suddenly returned, but his face is blurred by the gusts of wind blowing in his face. Xavier only wants to joke with the swarm, telling it that it understands and asking it to continue. In five days, they will arrive at Frontera's estate, and the swarm thinks about how Xavier can now easily defeat the army of the small people. If they see dozens of soldiers being destroyed with a single swing of the Oryx sword, the enemy's morale will drop. But with locusts, it's different. They just run to the food they see in front of them. They are not afraid of death, and so Xavier alone is not enough. Since they are attacking from everywhere, at a 360 degree angle, the intense firepower of two men will not be enough. After that, he tells Podong to go to the place he told him earlier and wait, as he has a plan for the locust swarm. Now, together with Xavier, he has to save his money centered Frontera estate at all costs. Five days later, they can't even catch their breath as it turns out that the little time he talked about in the spoiler was extremely short. When the swarm has already entered the Frontera district, the villagers look on in confusion because they had no idea what was going to descend and eat them. Suddenly, the swarm appeared behind one of the men and told him to go inside and asked him for a pot lid, the biggest one he could find. The swarm of locusts was approaching the castle. Emily, one of the castle's maids, was shocked to see a giant locust fly through the window and hit the floor with a loud thud. The locust approached Emily before finally pouncing on her. But Marbella crushed the locust with a chair and saved Emily. However, more locusts flew through the window, so Marbella took Emily with her. When Marbella looked out the window, she saw a huge swarm of locusts flying over the village. She was so shocked that she couldn't move and then Arcos came out of the other corridor. He told them to follow him outside to meet Byron and the other knights. They ran to the front door. But when they got outside, the swarm was already outside the castle and saw them. Meanwhile, Byron ran away from the swarm and ordered all his men to gather in the castle. Then he looked to his right and saw Mikhail, who was fighting with the locusts that had swarmed him. The castle is closed, but the people who live there are having problems. Byron is still trying to figure out what to do, but then he remembers what Arcos told him, to always put people before lords. Byron pulled out his sword, gritted his teeth, and helped Michael by cutting the locusts in half. He ruthlessly killed every locust in his path and ordered Michael to stay with him. Meanwhile, Arcos struck one of the growing swarms with his pickaxe hammer and destroyed it, to keep his word to the swarm's family, he roared at his men to fight for the townspeople. Byron, Michael, and the orcs were determined to defeat the locusts. But soon they were outnumbered, and Byron could only watch Michael and let the locusts bite him. When the locusts got close, the helpless mother panicked for her child's safety. The people in the city fought with everything they could find, and Arcos kept fighting even though the locusts were biting him. The orcs defended Arcos, Marbella, and Emily in the castle. Suddenly, a loud sound came over the village, and the mother helplessly began to defend her child. She doubted whether she had heard correctly until the sound came again. As soon as the locusts realized, they stopped attacking the villagers. The sound came again, and the swarm of locusts took off. The swarm screamed and cursed the locusts, yelling at the top of his lungs. Xavier swung his sword and struck it in the middle of the large lid Lloyd was carrying until it made a loud sound. Holding the lid, the swarm continued to shout at the swarm. Meanwhile, Xavier was frantically swinging his sword at the lid of the pot. The swarm began to chase them, making more and more noise. Soon the swarm thickened in the air and flew after the swarm and Xavier. 
It didn't take long for the locusts to leave the castle and start chasing the rest of the group. Meanwhile, Arcos and Marbella immediately recognized the swarm's voice shouting in the village. The swarm began to form a large figure around Royd and Xavier. Royd was right when he said that the locusts were following them in a straight line. Royd was glad he was right and told Xavier to walk around the residence. The farmers were shocked to see a huge swarm of locusts following them. Lloyd then told Xavier to hit the lid harder, and when Xavier did, Lloyd nearly fell off his horse. Then the swarm began to complain, but Xavier was only amused. He told the owner to prepare for the next attack without any regrets. The young frontier knew that locusts are attracted to loud noises because he had read about it in a book. When he told Xavier that they were going to Lacona, the servant asked if he wanted to help them too. Then a window appeared in the messenger window that showed that Xavier's approval had increased, giving him more RP points. But then the swarm screamed, saying that he didn't want to lose his water bill. At the same time, the swarm was surrounding the castle in Lakin, and the Viscount tried to defend himself. Then he heard the loud ringing of a gong and before he could even realize what was happening, Royd and Xavier on horseback were breaking down the door. The Viscount was angry with Royd for breaking into his mansion, but Royd warned him not to be late with his water bill. Xavier was obviously frightened by his master's threat, and he rang the bell again, dot a loud sound resounded in the castle. Then Lloyd and Xavier immediately took off, and a large flock of locusts followed them. Xavier asked the owner if he had gone to the buildings on purpose to gather the swarm. Lloyd replied that he planned to annoy the Viscount. When Xavier heard these answers, he was too shocked to say anything. They rang the lid again, and the swarm followed them. Roy confidently shouted to everyone to clear the way. Xavier asked the swarm to stop shouting for no reason to conserve their energy. However, the swarm said he wanted everyone to know that he had saved them, because he wanted everyone to give him credit. Xavier was again too stunned to speak, thinking Lloyd had a few cogs loose in his head, but he knew they had to continue the mission and go to the Merritt's marshes. Lloyd was shocked when he saw the swarm approaching them. He immediately told Xavier to defend himself as he had done behind the lid, but he had a mind of his own and rushed forward, channeling his mana through his sword and preparing to attack the swarm. Xavier managed to kill a lot of locusts while Lloyd tried to stay still as the swarm of locusts slammed into his lid, and it didn't take long for Xavier to split the swarm as they ran away from him. The swarm then joined the one behind it. As a result, the swarm became larger, and Lloyd took this as an opportunity as they formed one pack. But when they reached the middle of the ground, his horse began to feel tired. Lloyd knew they would be in trouble if he kept pushing his horse, so he threw back the cover and told Javier to get ready. And before Javier knew what Lloyd meant, he immediately jumped off his horse and onto Javier's back. On Javier's back, saying that Javier was now his horse and ordered him to run. Javier was visibly annoyed, but he knew what to do and immediately jumped off his horse. Javier landed perfectly on the floor but Lloyd teased him by treating him like a real horse. Javier was getting more and more upset. Then Xavier decided to run as fast as he could. Even though he was still angry, Dot, he was able to get a few feet ahead of the swarm while he carried the swarm. But the swarm had already caught up with him and was closing in. Lloyd immediately called for Jingle and Hippo, who jumped off Xavier's back and followed him to a small ditch. Bell and Hippo were waiting on the other side of the field. Hippo had a mouthful of water, ready to spit it out at any moment. And as soon as the men dipped into the ditch, the bell immediately jumped out of the river and into the air. The bell farted fire at the approaching swarm, followed by a loud explosion that shook the neighborhood, killing all the locusts in its path. The number of locusts was completely and instantly cut in half in one swift action. The fire trail left a huge black smoke in the air that could be seen by other people from a distance. The swarm then ordered the bell to continue the attack on the swarm. 
and Hippo stood in the field with his big body and spat liters of water on the locusts. Some locusts broke in half because the water from Hippo was so strong. The last attack disoriented the swarm, and dead locusts fell like rain from the sky. By then, Royd and Xavier had already climbed out of the ditch and were watching what was happening. Then the men put all their strength into a shovel and a sword and prepared to exterminate the locusts that still managed to survive. They splashed their mana into the rest of the swarm with a bright red and green light. Their powers intertwined and killed most of the locusts, instantly destroying all the locusts. Their blast reached the back of the swarm and lifted into the air. More locusts fell to the ground. When they were done, Lloyd fell to the ground because he was very tired. But Xavier was still fine and worried that there were still many locusts left. Dozens of locusts were still causing trouble in the city, and most people were afraid of him. However, Roy told the servant not to worry because the cleaning team was already prepared. Meanwhile, Podong was walking through the forest. Podong stopped at the edge of the forest, and behind him were 300 warriors from the Orc tribe, including their leader. And in front of them, other horses stopped on their way, and they belonged to troops of white cavalry and wizards. It was a clean team that Royd had prepared. Royd told Xavier not to worry about the locusts anymore and started thinking about the domino monster. Lloyd looked at the sky and realized that this life has endless obstacles. Meanwhile, the leader of the white cavalry raised his horse and ordered his soldiers to kill the rest of the locusts. The soldiers immediately drew their weapons, and the wizards behind them polished them to a shine. They lined up to launch the attack. The cavalry instantly destroyed dozens of locusts, while one of the orcs used a branch to kill a locust. He stabbed two of them with a single blow and then threw them on the fire to cook while the other orcs cheered. Once the locusts were cooked, they immediately ate them while the other orcs sang about their high-protein meal. And in the middle of all this fun, Emily is interrupted by one of the orcs with red hair. She was holding a flower in her hand. Then she gave it to the orcs as a sign of gratitude for saving her life and quickly ran away. The orc blushed as he looked at the tiny flower in his hand. Meanwhile, Arcos and Marbella were approaching Lloyd and Javier in the field. Arcos was very worried about their safety, because even though he was the Lord, he could not do anything. They hugged their son and were grateful that Lloyd was okay. As Arcos and Marbella hugged Lloyd, Lloyd reflected on how he had risked his life for his old age pension. Then he talked to the notification panel about what he said in the spoiler about the ending. He realized he had more pressing matters to attend to. The messenger revealed that Royd had earned the title of Exterminator, which would allow him to scare away the bug-like monster. As day turned to night, Lloyd stood on an empty training field with a shovel. Then a white cavalry leader named Valilardi approached him from behind and asked why he wanted to meet. Lloyd thanked him for his help in killing the rest of the locusts because it would have taken too long without his help. Valiardi was not happy that Lloyd could give orders to the troops. However, this day showed him that Lloyd was a true strategist because he had carefully calculated everything that was happening. Valilardi told Lloyd that he did not like him, and he just listened in silence. When Valilardi asked what he wanted from them, Royd realized that he was different from the others. I in the novel, he recalled how he remained on the side of his queen, even when she became evil and fought fiercely against Xavier. There, Xavier was not yet a master of the sword, so he had a hard time fighting before eventually defeating him, and as Xavier looked at him as he was dying, he asked a favor of Xavier. After he died, he asked Xavier to stop the queen. Royd realized that he had a strong loyalty and was a potential asset. Lloyd smiled at Valiardi. He knew he needed clarity, so he challenged him to a dual dot if he wins, the cavalry will become the engineer core of their estate. If he lost, they could return to their queen. Valilardi was shocked by his request, but laughed, saying that Lloyd may have seen this coming all along. He told Lloyd that only the queen could give him orders. Lloyd replied that he could give him orders because the queen had given him command of the cavalry. 
Valilardi was furious at this, but Lloyd told him that if he gave him orders all the time, he would give him orders all the time. He would have no respect for Lloyd, so it was better to earn it in battle. Then Valiardi took his sword from his belt and asked if Lloyd had any weapons. Lloyd replied by picking up a shovel. Valilardi walked around Lloyd, knowing that it would be better if he did not draw his sword so that no one would get hurt. Meanwhile, Lloyd knew he couldn't win, even with a triple heart circle. Lloyd watched his every move and thought that the only weapon he could use against him was knowledge of his character. Valilardi stood in front of Lloyd and told him that the rules had to be changed because this was not a knightly fight. He told Lloyd that if he flinched, Lloyd would win. Lloyd agreed, putting all his strength into the shovel and preparing to attack. His face looked even more terrifying under the bright red light. Valilardi visibly shuddered when he saw the power Lloyd poured out before Lloyd splashed all his mana at him. He immediately ran away from the great fire that could have incinerated him in an instant. The blast of Lloyd's bomb flew across the city and blew up the top of the mountain, sending a huge shockwave. When Valilardi looked through his burnt cloak, he saw the mountain engulfed in flames and smoke billowing into the sky. When he saw that part of the mountain summit was missing, he turned and looked over his shoulder, afraid of what Lloyd might do next. But Lloyd was just lying on the ground, his body shaking. Lloyd laughed, because he knew that the best soldiers of the White Cavalry would become the engineer corps of the Frontera Barony. The next day they were all digging a ditch together. One of the soldiers angrily threw down his shovel and immediately ran to Valilardi, complaining that the knights should be on the battlefield, not doing hard labor. But Valilardi told him that this was not an ordinary request. He recalled that Lloyd had said that night that sometimes it was more honorable to use a shovel than a sword. He dug up the ground and threw the dirt behind him, telling his soldiers that he wanted to know what Lloyd meant. Meanwhile, Lloyd and Xavier stood on the edge of the cliff. Xavier asked him if his plan would work, and Lloyd assured him that the orcs had taught him the orcs, so his plan would work. He smiled and told Xavier to sit and watch while the other workers were tied to the rock as they carved the rocks. It turned out that dozens of men were working on a massive monster figure on top of a massive monster figure on the rock, and the next morning was quiet. But soon, something like an earthquake swept through the barony. It started small, but grew stronger and stronger. Soon furniture began to fall and families held on to each other as the tide rose. Hordes of four-legged creatures ran and made the ground shake so hard that the whole town feared their houses might collapse. But everyone believed that Lloyd would protect them. Meanwhile, Lloyd was climbing a huge white rock, and from the top, he could see a cloud. A big cloud of dust coming toward him from the middle of the forest. He held a blue and white flag as he watched the approaching hordes. In contrast, Valilardi and his cavalry watched the dust coming at them. Valilardi doesn't trust Lloyd at first, but when he sees the huge horde of mastodons, he realizes that Lloyd is right. The mastodons were trampling the forest and destroying trees. Valilardi recalled his conversation with Lloyd when he told him that the circle of dominoes were mastodons. When he asked Lloyd to prove his theory, Lloyd continued to avoid the question, and he was unable to, to get a straight answer. But now that he was leading the troops, he knew it didn't matter because Lloyd was right. He put on his helmet, deciding that now was not the time to think about it. He remembered the strategy to stop the horde. He and his warriors would run ahead of the herds to take the front of their line. And once the horde stopped, they would surround and attack them one by one. As Valilardi sat on his horse in full armor, he predicted that twenty of his soldiers would die. die. Then he overheard a man talking to one of the warriors about how he was going to propose to his girlfriend when they got home. But in the worst case scenario, he could only leave his spear for her. But that's the price you pay for being a soldier. Valilardi ordered all his men to get ready and go forward, but the man stopped him before he could leave. He was going to enter the battle without any armor, 
and even if it surprised Val Lardy, Byron was already used to Lloyd's strange requests. Byron told Valiardi that he was there to decipher the message of Lloyd's flag from the top of the white cliff. Suddenly, Lloyd fluttered his flag, and Byron noticed it immediately. The signal meant that Lloyd was calling for the white cavalry. He then waved the flags many times and ordered the soldiers to move quickly to the southeast corner of the village. Valilardi was excited, knowing that their strategy had changed. Their current position was ideal to stop the attack. And if they moved to a new position, they would have no chance of stopping the horde. Then Bavaria looked at Lloyd, who was waving his flags. Lloyd practically threatened to report them to his queen if they continued to argue. Valiardi wondered if this plan would work. But Lloyd said that he had thought it through, and Valilardi still didn't believe him because his plan didn't make sense. But the hordes are approaching, and Lloyd began to make a sign. Lloyd has raised both of his flags because it doesn't look like the hordes are going to stop. As the hordes pass right in front of Lloyd, he smiles, knowing that the first phase of his plan has gone smoothly. The roar of the horde can be heard through the forest, and they run straight for the rock that was carved out a few days ago. And when the front line of the horde saw the colossal monster, they stopped. Then the mastodons from behind hit the front line, confusing the herd. It turned out that the first stage of Lloyd's plan was to block the mastodon's path with an image of their natural enemy named Megalania. Lloyd was right. As the hordes ran into each other and stopped right in their tracks wasting no time, Lloyd waved the flags again. After reading the sign, Bayadarika ordered the cavalry to move forward quickly and make as much mud and noise as possible. He also ordered them to knock their spears against each other to make more noise, and even as they carried out this plan, Valilardi never realized what it was. It doesn't take long for mastodons to hear the noise made by cavalry. They think that another megalomaniac is approaching, so one of them howls, and soon the others join in. Lloyd knew his plans had worked when he saw the herd begin to move north. From the very beginning, he planned to drive the mastodon herd north, so he ordered the cavalry to move their positions. Valilardi noticed the hordes moving and then realized where they were headed. The hordes were headed for the ditch Lloyd had ordered the cavalry to dig for the statue, but he had always wondered why he had asked for such a huge hole. Now it all became clear as the mastodons headed straight for the ditch. The third phase of Lloyd's plan was crowned with success when the hordes fell into the ditch and he immediately waved his white flag. And shortly thereafter, Hamon appeared in its gigantic size. Lloyd proudly proclaimed that he had successfully recreated an old battle strategy in Korean history. Hippo poured the water contained in his body into the moat, and thus drowned the horde. Lloyd happily threw away his flags and posed in victory. Both Byron and the cavalry looked on as he once again proved himself a master strategist. Meanwhile, the hordes were being carried into the water like leaves down a river. However, some of them managed to get out of the water, and Valilardi watched from above. He could not believe that they had won without even putting up a fight. Suddenly, Lloyd sat down next to him and said that they would not go back now, because they knew that there were megalomaniacs there, and thanks to them, they had a new canal. Valiardi asked Lloyd if he planned to use it as a waterway. Lloyd replied that he hadn't thought about it at first. This reminded Valilardi of the time he went into combat and had to tell his family that they had lost a man, and he could only raise his dirty spear and say that her husband had died a brave death in battle. He then told her that her husband would be remembered forever, but that did not ease her pain. He saw her break down over the loss of her husband, and the number of soldiers at the cemetery continued to grow. The other soldiers were saddened by the deaths of their friends, but Valilardi ordered them to waste no time, and they began training. When it got dark, the graves became wet, and it started to rain. Valiardi sat on the ground, mourning his soldiers, and thought that the more they talked about valor or honorable deaths, the more they lost meaning. Deep down, he knew that death does not bring honor, 
it leaves unbearable pain for those left behind. Now the soldiers were rejoicing, and one of them told the man to invite them to his wedding. This was a new sight for Valilardi. Then he heard Lloyd and Xavier discussing the possibility of fighting more waves of attacks. Lloyd told Xavier that large plans, like the one they used for the Mastodons, would be expensive. So he wanted to share what he had in mind. Xavier thought that Lloyd already had a plan to save money. However, Valilardi stopped Lloyd before he could tell Xavier about his plan. Valilardi told Lloyd that the cavalry would help him with his plan. Lloyd asked him why he had changed his mind so suddenly. Then Valilardi said that he realized how bad his leadership had been and had just seen what a real victory looked like. He immediately threw off his cloak. He knelt down before Lloyd, swore allegiance to him, and took lessons from him. Soon the rest of the cavalry knelt down as well, and Lloyd sighed. He said that he was going to beg Valilardi to stay and help them, because he knew he could not execute the plan without them. Over the next few hours, Lloyd met with his family, Xavier, and Valiardi. He told his father that he did not approve of his plan to make a river out of Kapua's land. Lloyd told his father about the Storm King, a famous creature from Lake Kapua that slept at the bottom of the river. Nothing can wake him up, but Lloyd promised he would. After a moment of silence, Arcos yells at Lloyd that he doesn't agree with his plan. Marbella also disagrees. However, Valilardi raised his hand and agreed with Lloyd. And Xavier also agreed, even though Lloyd's parents asked him to think about it, because he is Lloyd's bodyguard. He also knew that no one could make Lloyd change his mind. He immediately got up and ordered everyone to work. Then Lloyd, Xavier, Valilardi, and the rest of the cavalry moved to their destination, carrying shovels. Xavier asked if he wanted to lead the Storm King after he woke him up. Lloyd explained to Xavier that he had read about the Storm King in the library. He learned that the monster had created the lake by building a dam. If its habitat was damaged, it would appear to repair it. He said that he would destroy the dam again and again until the monster came out and scared all the other monsters coming from behind the eastern mountains. Xavier couldn't believe that Lloyd was going to torture a monster that was sleeping peacefully. He asked him what would happen if he made a mistake in his research and the monster attacked them, instead attacking them. Without hesitation, Lloyd told him that it was his job as a knight to defeat the monster, imagining that it was Xavier who was guarding the land instead. Xavier was silently annoyed, knowing that Lloyd was treating him like a dog. Soon they found themselves on the shore of the lake. Lloyd took a deep breath before activating his surveying skills dot he turned on the simulation mode, which immediately blended in perfectly with the landscape. He started moving things around, memorizing where he could break so that the lake wouldn't flood, but also so that he wouldn't wake the beast. Xavier told Valiardi not to be surprised by Lloyd's strange behavior, as it looked like he was just waving aimlessly from the outside. Valilardi, on the other hand, like the fact that Lloyd looked crazy and at the same time very smart. While they waited for Lloyd to develop his plan, they talked. The Storm King was watching them from the bottom of the river. If they woke him up, he would kill them all. It was a few hours before Lloyd carried out his plan. In the village, he wondered who was laughing so loudly in the field. And that's when he saw Byron playing with the Mastodon babies, and it didn't take long. It didn't take long for Byron to notice that Lloyd was watching him. Lloyd had no idea that a man like Byron could behave like that, and it gave him the creeps when Byron immediately stood up and asked him. Byron offered to take care of the baby mastodons that their mothers had left behind during the attack, but Lloyd had his doubts because they would become wilder as they grew up. However, Byron tried to convince Lloyd that this would not happen because they were so cute and Lloyd had a hard time making up his mind. So Lloyd tried to talk Byron out of it, saying that raising them would be hard, but Byron told Lloyd that they were too cute to give up. Lloyd was out of his mind, so he let Byron keep the baby mastodons, and it made him so happy that he fell to the ground.
happy that he fell to the ground and started playing with them again. As Lloyd was leaving, he thought that Byron would somehow find a way to tame the Mastodons. This would be a good asset for them, considering that the orcs had returned to their village because of the attacks of the domino monsters. He ordered one of his officers to gather five warriors and go with the orcs to their tribe, because he didn't want to lose his asset. Valilardi then told him that preparations for the operation were complete. Lloyd smiled and shouted to the cavalrymen that they would wake the monster, and only cavalry could do it. He praised them for their strength, and the soldiers cheered. And Lloyd continued to praise their bravery, and again the soldiers greeted him. With loud cheers. Then Lloyd ordered them to bow down to the shovels, and they did so without hesitation. They began to march forward, shouting even more about their shovels, and Lloyd went ahead Lloyd was in front. Meanwhile, Javier stood silently behind, watching the soldiers walk away. He felt sorry for them, because Lloyd had them wrapped around his finger. After Lloyd finished his simulations, all the soldiers started working. He changed the terrain so that the shores of the lake would not break and cause a flood. Once the relief was ready, he waved Javier to his position atop the relief and told him to start exploring the spot he had marked. Javier plunged his sword deep into the ground and used his mana to blow it all up. The explosion was so strong that the debris flew into the air. After the explosion died down, the ground began to shake and several trees began to fall down the hill. Dust flew high into the sky and could be seen from afar. It was exactly what Lloyd had predicted. The explosion was enough to cause the natural explosion was enough to cause the natural dam to collapse. So he ordered the cavalry to take cover. And suddenly the lair, which was floating calmly on the water, began to shake. Lloyd had foreseen everything, and now he was sure that the Storm King had woken up. The lair exploded and split into two parts. But Lloyd never thought it would be so huge that they would be in danger. A pair of eyes looked at them from the water, and Xavier stood behind a tree, his mind on full alert. Valilardi watched from the ground how tall the monster was as it rose to the surface. The water burst and Lloyd was confused to see that the monster looked like a beaver. Meanwhile, all the soldiers, including Valilardi, were also shocked, but not at how scary it was. That it was scary. They all thought it was magical because the monster was screaming something that no one could understand except Lloyd, and the beast was furious. Looking at the monster from the ground, he wondered if it wasn't a summoned creature like Padong, Bell, or Hippo. Nevertheless, Lloyd is now more confident in his strategy, considering that the beaver's main job is to repair dams. Suddenly, the Storm King turned and looked at Lloyd, causing him to crouch lower to the ground hoping he wouldn't be noticed. The Storm King spoke, and Lloyd understood him perfectly. He knew where he was hiding because he could smell him. He told him that he would not just fix the dam, but kill them all because they had disturbed his peace. Lloyd began to sweat, knowing that the Storm King was smarter than he had expected. Valilardi approached Lloyd and asked him what to do next, but Lloyd was scared and couldn't put on a serious face. The Storm King angrily scooped up water with his hands and splashed it on everyone. The cavalry tried to escape the great wave of water that would have covered them if they had not moved to a safe distance. To a safe distance. However, they were too slow, and all of them drowned, except for Xavier, who immediately jumped out of the water. Out of the water. His sword flashed with bright orange fire as he channeled his mana into it, and threw it toward the Storm King. But the Storm King was quick to deflect the attacks, so Xavier changed his strategy and aimed to kill him. His sword glowed bright green as he prepared for his next attack. He swung his sword as high as he could to get the right momentum for the strike. At this point, Lloyd yelled at him to stop because he had a plan. Xavier spotted him and stopped immediately, while Lloyd knew his plan if the Storm King was a summoned creature. Xavier was still hanging in the air when the Storm King was about to attack him, but he quickly swung his sword. 
and his explosion hit the Storm King instead of him, and this made him angry. The Storm King tried to catch Xavier, but he quickly dodged and attacked the Storm King at the same time. Meanwhile, Lloyd was able to swim slowly behind the Storm King. He was glad that Javier was able to distract the Storm King long enough for him to get close to him. But suddenly the Storm King turned, and he immediately dove underwater. Lloyd realized that the Storm King was very aware of his surroundings, and he needed to be careful about approaching him. Meanwhile, Javier tried again to attack the Storm King with a powerful explosion. But the Storm King waved his tail and blocked the blast. But Javier wasn't done yet, because he quickly switched to his aura and attacked him again. And with a simple jump, the Storm King was able to dodge his attack again. When Javier landed on the ground, he became even more agitated. Javier stood and prepared for another fight, while Lloyd was still underwater. He knew that he couldn't distract the Storm King with a simple attack, and that he could hurt him if he used all his powers. He didn't know what to do. Javier gritted his teeth and shouted, calling out to the Storm King. His cry was so loud that the cavalry and Lloyd, who were still in the water, could hear him. His voice even echoed in the air, and King Storm took notice. He was disappointed that Javier had unconsciously called him a mother, even though he was actually a male. But that didn't stop Xavier from speaking in his own language, because it was a good distraction. The Storm King had no idea why Xavier called him an octopus baby and acted like a bully, but Xavier, who of course did not realize he was yelling, kept talking and yelling. It wasn't until Xavier unknowingly called the Storm King ugly that he let his guard down and Lloyd couldn't climb on top of him. When the Storm King noticed Lloyd, he was already on his head. He could not reach Lloyd because his arms were too short. Suddenly Lloyd jumped off his head. He flipped over in the air and threw a blue sunflower seed at King Storm. It was the same seed that Podong had eaten to make himself smaller. The seed landed right in Storm King's mouth, and while Lloyd was still flying in the air, he wished his plan would work. The effect of the seed was immediate, and the Storm King became smaller immediately. Lloyd was happy that his plan had worked, and the Storm King, much smaller, came to the river bank, to the river bank. He was surprised to see that the tree had become so big, and someone had grabbed it. Lloyd picked him up off the ground and held him tightly with a terrible expression on his face. However, the Storm King tried his best to get out of Lloyd's hands until he managed to hit Lloyd in the face with his tail. Storm King managed to escape from Lloyd, and he immediately ran away. It was hard for the cavalry to catch up with him because he was moving so fast, so Lloyd told Padong, Bell, and Hippo to follow him. Padong was able to outrun King Storm, but King Storm threw a jab hitting Podong in the face. Instead, the battle in the challenge realm was interrupted. The blow made Podong angry, so he struck back and hit Storm King with all his might. They became angry with each other and began to fight. Hamlong saw this as an opportunity and wasted no time in attacking Storm King. But the Storm King is very nimble, so Hippo couldn't hit him because he jumped to the side. So Hippo got hit and the Storm King ran away. But Lloyd stopped him before he could get away, and because he was moving too fast, the bell, who was sitting on his shoulder, fell to the ground. The little bell gracefully got up and, in the eyes of King Storm, who had been sleeping underwater for five hundred years, he saw her. He sees how beautiful it is, and is so enchanted by it, that he does not even try to escape. Lloyd was confused to see that the Storm King was not trying to escape as he thought. Then Lloyd saw the look on Storm's face and realized that he had won. He offered to talk to him together. Storma stood there feeling defeated, but that didn't stop him from being as charming as possible in front of the bell, and he agreed to talk to Lloyd. Lloyd smiled because he knew that his plan to catch King Storm was a success. Lloyd brought King Storm to his manor. He told Storm to shout as loud as he could once in the morning and once at night from the other side of the lake. But when Storm asked Lloyd what he would get out of this deal, 
he started scratching his hair and said he had nothing to offer. But Lloyd smiled, saying that if he did, everyone around him would be happy, including Jingle Bell. Lloyd knew that Storm liked her, so he used that to his advantage. Bluebell smiled broadly and agreed with Lloyd, and Storm was again hypnotized by her beauty. Storm immediately agreed to the deal, and Lloyd was glad to be able to use him. After all, he knew that the bell had no feelings for Storm. So he decided to take everything he could from him, hoping that he would be forever lonely for the rest of his life. But he realized that he had never been in a relationship either, and they were both lonely. Realizing this, the man picked Storm up and hugged him. The beaver tried to pull away, but he couldn't because Lloyd's hug was so warm. When Lloyd asked Storm if he could call him Beaver, the beaver said he could do as he pleased. Suddenly, Greg burst into the room, supposedly to accompany the orcs to their tribe. He told Lloyd that on the way, they had met one of the orcs, who was running for reinforcements because their tribe had been attacked by the Megalani. Meanwhile, in the tribe of Sand and Steel, the orcs were fighting the Megalania, and Akush was at the front line, trying to attack the giant monster. He flew into the air, holding a sword in each hand, and came down hard on the Megalania's head. But this did not hurt the monster, as it looked at him with hatred, letting him know that he was in big trouble. Megalania swung its tail and hit Akucha with it. He tried to defend himself with his swords, but the blow was too strong. He fell a few feet to the ground because he could not repel the attack. Several other orcs approached the leader, worried about him, but Akush ordered them to continue fighting. Meanwhile, Lloyd ordered Greg to gather the white cavalry at the village gate, but Greg realized that they would be too late to help the tribe, but Lloyd assured him that he would take care of it. The beaver was still in Lloyd's hand as he ran with Xavier. They were in a hurry, because Lloyd thought this was a great opportunity, an opportunity to stop this domino of monsters. The man was laughing at the fact that he had a chance to strike. So he gave Storm a red sunflower seed to make him bigger. The villagers were amazed when they saw the beaver get bigger, because it could block out the sunlight. The beaver jumped, and Lloyd encouraged him to do his best to win the heart of the bell. Xavier was left bewildered because he did not understand what had really happened. The excited beaver jumped higher and higher, leaping over the forests and hills in one jump. The white cavalrymen clung to Bung's fur in terror as the massive beaver leapt through the forest and into the mountains. Meanwhile, the megalomaniacs continued to attack the orc tribe, who fought back fiercely. As the orcs lined up to attack the monster, it was at this point that the beaver leaped over them and landed right in the front line. Akush held his ground, as the impact of Storm's landing was, was strong enough to carry the man away with the wind alone. He did not realize what was happening. Meanwhile, the beaver stood menacingly over Megalania, who looked like a bug compared to him. Then Lloyd stood on the beast's head and told Megalania that they would have nothing to eat if they went west, because they would become prey themselves. Megalania's attention was suddenly drawn to the fact that the beaver quickly withdrew his hand to his back. Thanks to Storm's quick hand, before they could escape, he easily threw them into the air. Megalania flew through the air for many miles, before finally crashing into the forest with a loud crash. His work was done when the seed's duration came to an end and made him shrink. When he turned around, he was surprised to see the bellflower standing next to him, causing his cheeks to turn red. Bangul encouraged him, which made the beaver's face redden even more. Immediately afterwards, Balalardi approached Lloyd, asking what the cavalry could do, since everything seemed to be under control. It turned out that Lloyd needed them for something else, but before he could say what it was, Akush approached him. He told Lloyd that they no longer had a blood contract, which confused Lloyd. Akush took a deep breath. The other orcs followed Akush's lead, pledging their allegiance to the tribe of Sand and Steel and the barony of Frontera. Lloyd was pleased and grateful for their loyalty, so he offered them to carry out his grand plan to revive the tribe. However, Akush, not knowing the details, remained puzzled by Lloyd's cryptic words. 
Meanwhile, in the east of the desert, in a kingdom called Asfahan, a reed field had been burned in the past, causing a domino of monsters to appear. One of the tribes of these monsters, possessing some intelligence, witnessed the day Lloyd threw Megalania away. Rumors began to spread about a beast from the west that was so huge and terrifying that it seemed as if the monster could devour everything on the planet. And the demon who controlled the beast looked like the embodiment of hell itself. The beast and demon they were talking about were none other than Lloyd and Storm. Meanwhile, in Asfahan there is a large and luxurious palace. The Sultan listened to a report from one of his warriors that an orc tribe had moved into the Magentano forest. He then asked him about Magentano's reaction, which was without any problems. When the Sultan was about to release him, he tells the Sultan about another problem. The monsters they had driven away by burning their field had returned and attacked their borders. The soldiers fought them with all their might. But the monsters seem to be running away because they are scared. So the Sultan ordered all the soldiers and weapons to gather to fight them. The Sultan can't figure out if Magentano is behind the monsters attacking them, but it seems impossible that they could fight off full scale monster attacks. He then begins to think about the possibility of a demon existing in the West. Meanwhile, in Frontera, Lloyd gives the lone sharks who have been harassing his family for a long time a paper, and asks them to sign, IT.IT is a receipt for the full payment of the family debt, as well as a check for the total amount of the debt and interest. The loan sharks could not believe what they were seeing as Lloyd pushes them to sign it and leave. After they signed, they walked away in fear, and Arcos saw everything that happened. He goes up to Lloyd and asks him if he has just paid their debt, to which Lloyd shows them the entire receipt, asking them to hang it on the wall. Arcos immediately hugged him and cried, feeling grateful to Lloyd. He feels sorry that he made Lloyd work so hard to pay off their debt. He feels like a worthless father to Lloyd. Listening to his father pour out his heart like they don't deserve to be his parents, Lloyd asked him if he loves him. Without a doubt, his father loves him with all his heart. Lloyd told his father that his love is enough to be his father, and since he has already paid off their debt, he gets a new title that allows him to receive low interest and many benefits from every investment he makes. When the sun reaches its highest position, Lloyd walks silently down the hall to meet Xavier, who informs him that the orc tribe has moved up the east mountain without any problems, accompanied by white cavalry. Xavier was puzzled by the fact that Lloyd did not look like his usual self, and as Lloyd walked away, he thought about his accomplishments. He bit his lower lip because he had nothing to worry about anymore, because the debt was paid. He just didn't know why he was so calm about it. When Lloyd went into his room, he looked out the window, where the sun was shining through. He remembered how Arcos had cried when he told him how he felt. It reminded him of his own father in his world, and how sorry he was that their life had been difficult from the beginning. This thought brought him to tears. He wished he could have helped his own father when he could have taken care of all the problems in this world. He gritted his teeth to keep from screaming into his pillow and crying. Meanwhile, Xavier can hear him crying from outside the room as Lloyd cries louder. Xavier decides to leave Lloyd alone giving him some space to pour out his feelings because he deserved it after all their troubles. A few days later, everyone in town cheers when Lloyd passes by. However, Lloyd doesn't know what to do with all the congratulations, so his face turns red and he snaps at them to get back to work. Javier tells him that he can brag as much as he wants because people in the city wouldn't be able to smile if it weren't for him. Lloyd replies that if he acts arrogant, no one will pay him any more. He decides to ignore all the shouting when suddenly Byron runs to him in a panic. Breathing heavily, Byron told him that a large number of people from the south were arriving in Frontera. Lloyd asked if they were soldiers. However, Byron told him that they were all refugees. Lloyd was stunned by this unexpected news, wondering where they could have come from. He thought that after all their debts were paid, he had nothing to worry about, but the sudden appearance of these refugees left him with many questions. As the group of refugees approaches, 
Byron, Xavier, and Lloyd intercept their path, and one of them asks if they own the town. Lloyd says that the Lord is his father. Nicholas says that they are people from the south, from the barony of Certino. Looking at the group, Lloyd notices that most of them are dirty and wounded. Nicholas tells him how his father saved them all. And in the middle of his words, Lloyd stops him. He asks if the men who attacked them were monsters, and Nicholas says they were. Xavier says that it must have been the dominoes of the monster that went south. It was exactly as Lloyd had thought before, that every estate near the desert had been hit hard except Frontera and Lacona, and all because he managed to tame the Storm King, and the monsters went elsewhere. Obviously, the refugees could not go north because there was only the sea. To the south was a completely different country, and to the west was too far. The only place they could go was to Frontera or Lacona, which is right in the middle. Lloyd wonders how many of them are there, as they kneel and beg for help. Xavier was thinking the same thing, whether their estate could take them all. Instead, Lloyd smiles madly and thinks about what a wonderful situation this is, which made Xavier question his thoughts. He asks him what's going on, and Lloyd explains that so many people joining the barony could increase tax revenues. This shocks Javier that Lloyd can only think about money, but he ignores him and instructs Byron to take care of the refugees. All the refugees are grateful to Lloyd, and he goes to tell his father about it, and Byron asks Xavier not to be angry with Lloyd. Byron added that even if he doesn't understand it now, he can just watch his actions and eventually he will understand. Javier couldn't say anything to that, because Byron was right. Back at the castle, Arcos is surprised to learn that more and more refugees are coming and worries that the estate won't have enough money to take care of them all. Nevertheless, he wants to take them in, but the livestock is depleted and Lloyd has objected to him. With a big smile, he claims that there are enough cattle on the estate to feed them all. It turns out that Lloyd has been keeping all the dead horses. So he takes his parents to the barn where he keeps them, and his father feels bad about feeding people locusts. He is surprised to see his wife eat the locusts without hesitation, without thinking. She then assures him that it tastes like shrimp, and the orcs also eat them without any problems. After she ate the locusts, she wanted to add some seasoning to erase the meaty flavor, so she asked Lloyd if she could be in charge of the kitchen. Lloyd smiled, telling her that was exactly what he wanted her to do. In an empty field, soldiers and orcs worked side by side to build tents. When they finished, Lloyd ordered them to gather more ingredients for the kitchen. A moment later, the soldier guarding the entrance informs everyone that new refugees are arriving. Faster than Lloyd expected, so he orders Pa Dong to start digging to build a heater for the refugees. With the help of the steroid seed that helps him grow to such a huge size, Pa Dong quickly digs the ground. Just then, Bear arrives and reports that the men in charge of the heating system, who are working with Ban Gool, are doing it with full dedication. They are working faster because they know that refugees are arriving in the barony from all directions. In the kitchen, the maid is worried that the aftertaste is too strong, but Marbella says she has already dealt with it. She shows them an old legendary cookbook that Loy got from the Dark Wizard's cave, surprising all the kitchen helpers. While at the manor, Lloyd watched the number of refugees in the tent worrying that there was not enough land. He was scratching his head trying to think of an idea to make the refugees permanent residents of the estate, and a moment later, he heard a child crying. He saw a toddler begging his mother to come home, but Lloyd knew they no longer had a home, and that made him sad. This brought back memories of when his family had just moved to a new place, and he smiled broadly as he talked about his home. It was just a tiny apartment on the outskirts of the city, but it was his home because his parents were there. And now, looking at the crying boy and his mother, he promises to build a house for them. Then he stands up, and Xavier watches him from behind, smiling because he has witnessed his master's kindness. Lloyd then told him that they had a big project ahead of them. Xavier asked if there was enough room in the mansion to accommodate them all, but Lloyd assured him that there was, 
because he would build an apartment. He wants to build it because in Korea, an apartment is a common building and only requires a small plot of land that can accommodate many living quarters. Construction costs are reduced by standardization, and having blocks in all directions improves insulation. As Lloyd looks down at the river, he activates his skill to determine that this is the best solution to ensure that the refugees have a good environment to live in. He models the best way to build apartment buildings around the river, and it is at this point that he smiles happily that he can increase the amount of tax. His unpleasant smile grows wider as he thinks that when this project is completed, project is completed, he will be rich and imagines himself swimming in a pool of money. Later at the meeting, Lloyd explains to everyone his plan to build a residential complex. But before they start, Javier argues about the name of the project because he is annoyed by the name, Honey Apartments. Meanwhile, Byron feels like he's been awake all day because he dreams that Lloyd will torture him to death with his work. So Lloyd just told him to ignore it. Before he explains that Tullo is a complex of old buildings with many living quarters on each floor. Floors and common areas for water, toilet, and dining in the middle. He also said that the most important thing about this project is that if they build a steel gate to block the way to the square, it will be a strong fortress that cannot be broken. Hearing this, Valilardi applauds, and everyone else is surprised that Lloyd has thought of it this far. Xavier then expresses his concern about the limited budget of their estate. This irritates Lloyd instead, so he lashes out at him and asks Xavier if he is accusing him of being limited by money. However, when Arcos asks the same thing, Xavier politely replies that they have the budget to implement the project and feed the refugees. Later that day, Lloyd and Xavier are riding horses, and Lloyd keeps teasing him for being crazy. But Xavier just ignored him, which in turn made Lloyd wonder what was on his mind. So he expressed how worried he is if he fails at something. He knows that he is responsible for everything if things go wrong, and the only person he can share his worries with is his knight. Xavier was stunned by what Lloyd said, so Lloyd tried to cheer him up by acting nasty, as he always did, to make fun of him. Xavier started punching him, wishing it was real and not just in his imagination. In a moment, they arrive at Lacona. Inside the castle, Lloyd spots Diego walking down the same corridor as them and greets him. But Diego is so scared of Lloyd that he screams. Lloyd was having fun making fun of Diego and asked if he had been kicked out of school. Diego had indeed dropped out of school, so Lloyd offered to help him get back to school but only after his family is good with the Frontera barony. Right after that, they meet with the Viscount, and he is surprised to learn that Lloyd wanted to charge more for water, acting as if it didn't cost anything. So he laughs, thinking he has already won the argument, showing the contract they signed. Instead, Lloyd asks him to come closer and takes a magnifying glass out of his pocket. Lloyd shows him a clause in the fine print that says he can change the price at any time. He was surprised and angry that the Viscount had deceived him like that. But Lloyd told him to calm down, because he would also benefit from it. If he agreed to the increased price of water, Lloyd would not report to the Queen that he was denying refugees. The Viscount turned pale, wondering how this could be beneficial, and trembled as Lloyd had more to say. Lloyd also adds that if he writes a letter to the Queen, he can ask that Diego be returned to school. The Viscount was extremely surprised, but still angry with him. He realized that he could do nothing, and asked how much he wanted for the water. Lloyd explained that he wasn't trying to extort money from him, but just wanted the Viscount to give him more with his eyes, so that their partnership wouldn't end. The Viscount screamed quietly at the vague answer. At the same time, Xavier watched from the back, knowing who he was dealing with, and could only sympathize with the Viscount. He thinks about how awful Lloyd's personality is, while Lloyd asks how much he is willing to give. The aura in the room is gloomy, the Viscount glares at Lloyd, and the latter just looks at him calmly in return. So the Viscount offers to increase it by 20%. In turn, 
Lloyd makes it clear that he is not satisfied with this proposal. When the Viscount realizes this, he decides to increase it to 30%. But this still doesn't satisfy Lloyd's wishes and makes his expression worse. The Vicomte gasps when he notices that Javier is pointing his fingers at a number that might work. The Vicomte raises the offer again to 50%, but Lloyd still doesn't agree. The Viscount doesn't understand why until Xavier shakes his head and whispers to raise the price to five times the original amount. The Vicomte was furious, shouting that asking for five times the original price was basically robbery. But Lloyd tried to de-escalate the situation, adding that four times was enough. The Viscount smiles broadly at the new figure and immediately signs the new contract. When they return to Frontera County, Lloyd jumps up and down happily. The Viscount also feels the same way with the new deal. But his joy soon faded when he realized that he had been tricked into paying four times as much for water alone. Back on the road, Xavier felt bad about becoming a blackmailer, but Lloyd jokingly tells him that he became one after helping Lloyd. Xavier then told the owner that from now on he would just do his job as a knight protecting him and nothing else. Lloyd threatened that he would no longer sing him lullabies. But Xavier confidently replied that he didn't need a lullaby because he could control his feelings better now that he was a swordsman. But when night falls, he is miserably unable to sleep. So he decides to ask Lloyd for help, explaining that he is used to the lullaby and cannot sleep without it. Xavier pleaded for help and admitted that he was wrong. So Lloyd happily rereads the textbook about the retaining wall and the science behind it. Xavier instantly fell asleep. A moment later, Lloyd got up from his chair and immediately went to work. He quickly arranges the papers on the table, activating his building modeling skills. Because he doesn't have enough knowledge to build apartments, the building behind him is collapsing. He still fails to calculate a stable structure and needs to use another skill to help him. He smiles, knowing that his skill is to keep going, so he can't fail. The next day, Lloyd instructs Byron to send a message to Count Cremo to, to ask for doctors, masons, and carpenters. In addition, to buy as much grain and meat as possible in the West so that Cremo can a cement. At night, Lloyd tries to stimulate construction, and during the day, he and his workers dig up the ground. He told Byron to accept all the refugees because his plan would work. When night fell again, he continued to, building the house and wondered if he should lower the floor level. Suddenly, his nose bleeds and he falls on the paper, but he is still determined to continue his work because he does not want to reduce the structure. The next day, Byron reported that their budget was insufficient for the project, so Lloyd instructed him to scale back or send the refugees elsewhere. Lloyd wanted to assure him that everything would work out when suddenly he lost his balance and started to fall. But suddenly he falls with a loud thud, and everyone rushes to his aid, but he is already lifeless. Meanwhile, a dozen soldiers are lined up outside the royal palace in purple, pointing their arrows at the field. Their target is the queen, standing in the middle of the field, armed only with a sword. The captain orders his soldiers to release the arrows. Immediately, Dozens of arrows flew in her direction, but she stood her ground, wielding her sword, trying to gather her strength. Her deep purple aura covers her sword as she swings it and smashes the arrows to pieces. The broken arrows rain down on the ground, shocking the warriors who are training with her. However, she is dissatisfied that she has only been able to improve her ability to manifest aura so much, and all this brings back the memory of her humiliating battle. Suddenly, she is informed that a messenger from the frontier is looking for her, and she wonders if Lloyd sent him. It turns out that the messenger's name is Xavier, and he kneels down and reads Lloyd's ambiguous letter. While the queen wondered what he was up to this time, Xavier read that Frontera had taken in refugees from 17 estates after the attack of the domino monsters. The queen heard every word of praise Lloyd wrote, and wondered if he was being sarcastic. She imagines Lloyd kneeling on the floor crying when Xavier tells her that Lloyd doesn't have enough money. 
She is surprised at how Frank Lloyd is in his letter, when Xavier reads that Lloyd wanted the fund to be three times what she has in mind. The Queen is shocked and thinks Lloyd has gone mad, to which Xavier adds that he is not. It looks like Lloyd is speaking directly to the Queen through the letter. She is annoyed and continues to imagine Lloyd telling her that he wants to build a house for refugees so they can live and make a living. Again in the letter, Lloyd tells her that his budget is insufficient, and the Queen, hearing this, orders Xavier to stop because she understands what Lloyd wants. She explains that in order to deliver the huge sums of money, she will need to seek the advice of financial experts and get approval from the stubborn elder. After hearing the Queen's response, Xavier pulls another letter from his pocket. The Queen becomes curious when she hears Xavier read that Lloyd intends to use the building as an invincible fortress to keep them from being attacked by the enemy from the east or the domino monsters. She is surprised that Lloyd has thought this far ahead, and even tells her that the kingdom will be in a much better state after the project is completed. This made her believe that this project will strengthen loyalty to her and increase her influence. This project has too many benefits that she could not just ignore. Suddenly, Javier said, Bingo! Exactly as Lloyd had told him, and it was as if Lloyd had read her mind. For a moment, she thought deeply. Before she decided that she would fund Lloyd's project, Javier also adds that Lloyd wants Cortigas to come to Frontera. Back at the refugee camp in Frontera, Greg shouts, urging everyone not to relax just because Lloyd is sick. Greg used to be a nobody as a soldier, but he was there from the beginning. He saw Lloyd beat up their traitor, and he was one of the soldiers who was kidnapped by the Dark Wizard. Greg has been there every step of the way. He gives the family more blankets, and when he leaves the tent, he sees Emily walking by. Then he scolds her for not taking a break, keeps working, and tries to take away the blankets she brought, but she doesn't give in. They both laugh as Greg chases after her. And the orc who helped Emily during the monster attack is sad to see what is happening. Dot he remembers that his friends made fun of him for liking Emily. This upsets him. So he throws his flowers and walks away when Emily spots him from behind. Suddenly, Lloyd wakes up from his dream. And it turns out that he was dreaming. Bavaria is right next to him. And Lloyd is so pale that it worries him. Lloyd dreads the day when he has to pay the soldiers' salaries, and this makes him feel even worse. Lloyd coughs in his room, thinking that he will get all his money afterwards, and Byron tries to reassure him that they don't have to pay him now. But Lloyd doesn't want to delay. In the hallway, Javier heads to Lloyd's room to report. Lloyd turns pale because he doesn't want to postpone his paycheck, knowing what it's like not to get paid on time. He would rather die than delay it, and he speaks as if he were on his deathbed, losing consciousness. Bavaria panics. He screams and calls for doctors when Javier enters the room. He says that Lloyd has fainted, so Xavier pulls out the checks from the and tells Lloyd that they have received the money. Suddenly, Lloyd wakes up bright and shining, and Bayer watches in horror. His illness is over because he has received the money from the kingdom. And... Standing in his bed with a crazy smile, he orders them to start working again. A few days passed, and Byron announced that the building was almost finished, so they had to keep their spirits up. Progress was rapid, and they managed to build a retaining wall around the perimeter of the complex building. While they wait for their overlord, Lloyd models the plan he's been working on to summon the building with his skill, in real scale on the site plan. He tested it for resistance to a landslide and typhoon, although all buildings withstand all disaster simulations. Lloyd was pleased that his designs worked and moved on to the next simulation. He raises his hands to the sky and simulates a meteorite falling directly on the complex. The meteorite blows up half a continent, and Lloyd laughs hysterically at how funny it looks. Noticing that Xavier is watching from behind, Lloyd asks him what's wrong and they start to fight because Lloyd always twists Javier's words. Then Javier tells him that Cortigas and thirty other dwarven artisans have just arrived in Frontera, so Lloyd immediately greets him. Lloyd needs them 
because he needs concrete to build a sturdy apartment, and he needs the gnomes to build a cement mixer. Cortigas expresses his displeasure that Lloydnicky has not been offered the job and instead tells him to get to work immediately. Lloyd explains that he does not neglect his manners, adding that the best way to greet them is to show them a drawing they have never seen before. Cortiga snatches the blueprint from Lloyd's hands and begins to work. Lloyd and Xavier also immediately start working. Together they use a mana blast to blow up the earth. The earth begins to collapse as the combined mana blast seeps into the ground. The cement mixer built by the dwarves is driven by Padong, who enthusiastically runs around the barrel of the machine while whipping up the concrete mix at the other end. Meanwhile, the orcs bend the rebar, exercising to build muscle. Lloyd then explained to Byron how to fill the cement block to make it nice and strong. As the building got taller, Lloyd used Storm as a crane to deliver materials, and the presence of the bell kept him encouraged. Several days have passed, and Lloyd instructs Byron to keep going as they watch the building continue to grow. Lloyd still has to think about building a heating system that could be run throughout the building and connected to radiators in every room. The problem is that the system can only distribute the steam so evenly, and as a result, there will be no heaters on the top floor. Lloyd racked his brains every night trying to find materials that could distribute heat evenly, but he couldn't find anything. One night, as he was writing down everything he knew on his paper, he noticed something. He smiles as he finds the solution in his notebook. He remembered the time when Xavier fought the dragon in the novel. The dragon was angry with Xavier, and although he was already skilled with a sword, he was still too weak to fight, and he was burned by the dragon's fire. He is engulfed by the fire, but he stands his ground, looking at the dragon. The dragon is stunned that Javier manages to survive in full armor. It turns out that the armor is made of the hardened sap of an Elencia, which is the strongest insulating material in the world. The next day, he takes Javier to find this tree. I in the middle of the journey. Javier asks how far they have to go to find the materials, and Lloyd explains that they are from the Alencia tree, which grows in the evergreen forest, where the elves live. Javier immediately objects that the elves despise humans and cannot be negotiated with. But Lloyd knows the story from the novel about how Javier conquered them, so he makes him feel guilty. Therefore, Javier has no choice but to follow his overlord as he wonders how Lloyd is going to convince them. Although Lloyd was not going to convince them, he smiles slyly, proudly declaring that he intends to steal him from the elves. Javier is extremely annoyed and wants to kill Lloyd. As they approach the evergreen forest, Javier holds his sword tightly, and they walk between the beautiful flowers that have bloomed in the middle of winter. Lloyd warns Javier that all elves are connected to the forest, so they must be careful and move quietly. But Javier is allergic to flowers and and immediately sneezes when he inhales their scent. Lloyd is annoyed that Javier has to be quiet when he sneezes, but Javier argues back, saying that he is just beautiful, so everything he does looks cool. Lloyd was even more annoyed by his answer, so they start arguing about meaningless things. Javier was laughing at him because he knew Lloyd couldn't compete with him on looks, so he changed the subject to nonsense. Having no argument, Lloyd tries to hit him, but Javier easily blocks every punch using only one hand. Lloyd suddenly stops and tells him to hold his breath because they need to be inconspicuous. Lloyd explains that they need to go to the center of the forest, but the elves are already lined up in front of them with their bows drawn. He is surprised that the elves have already spotted them, and one of the elves says that they have made a lot of noise at their door, so they will be caught. Javier expresses how bad the situation is, but Lloyd thinks otherwise. He tells Javier that the situation quickly escalated when the elves shot arrows at them. Javier immediately gathers his mana to swing his sword ruthlessly. He breaks in half every arrow that comes their way while Lloyd hides behind him. Javier doesn't miss a single arrow, and the elves immediately realize that he is a master swordsman. When the arrows stop flying, Lloyd runs away and tells Javier to meet him by a tree. 
Javier is worried that Lloyd won't survive on his own. But Lloyd says that as long as Javier distracts them, he will be fine. One of the elves shouts and orders the other to ignore Lloyd, the ugly horse. Lloyd feels a sense of sadness when he learns that the elves find him less attractive than Javier, which leads them to chase Javier into the woods. Javier notices how fast the elves are moving through the forest, and one of them is right above him. It lightly taps the leaves to jump higher into the sky. He doesn't know much about elves, but Lloyd was right when he told him that they love their plants and have a special way of walking. Lloyd explains that he shouldn't attack the elves directly, but rather take advantage of their love of plants. Take advantage of their love of plants. Javier immediately realizes that she is aiming her arrows at him. He stops running because he is suddenly hiding behind three of them standing at his feet. This upsets her, so she moves back a little and then shoots at him without hesitation. Javier dodges her by leaning back, but more arrows are flying at him, and he deftly dodges each one. Javier throws himself trying to run and lose them, but the arrows keep coming from both sides, making it difficult to dodge. He continues to run frantically for his life, and realizes that the elves are leading him somewhere with their attack. So he sets his sword on fire with the help of the sword aura and prepares for a counterattack. Meanwhile, Lloyd finally reaches Alencia's tree and slowly reaches for his shovel. Lloyd activates his kill energizer to keep himself from getting tired for 20 minutes as he runs his mana through the shovel and starts digging into the ground. He digs quickly, and in no time, he reaches the foot of the tree. At this point, Javier doesn't notice the elf captain stop following him and chasing after him, and thinks she's going after Lloyd. He keeps running and is shocked when he reaches the lake. He hides in a corner because there are no plants around the lake, so he has nothing to hide behind. Soon the elves come up from both sides and shoot arrows at him. Javier decides to direct his mana blast at the lake and the water effectively neutralizes the incoming arrows. When all the arrows sink, Javier emerges from the water unharmed. The elves wonder what kind of power Javier has, and one of the elves assures them that no matter how strong he is, they still have Melika. From the depths of the forest, Javier notices someone approaching. It's a muscular elf with a bigger physique than the others, and she's aiming for Javier. She lowers her bow to the ground aiming her giant arrow called the Dragon Sniper at Javier. Javier has no choice but to defend himself, and when the bow quickly shot at him with tremendous force, it split the lake. He doesn't have enough strength to stop and barely manages to hold on to the arrow that pushes him back. Despite being pulled across the lake, he holds his sword tightly. Raising his foot above the surface of the water, he takes a perfect defensive stance. Using all his strength, he pushes at the arrow until he deflects it. He is amazed that it was able to deflect his mana sword with its strength alone, and he doesn't know what to do, because if he kills one of them, they will hunt him down for revenge. The elves bring another dragon sharpshooter, and when Javier looks up, it rains arrows on him again. However, he is still worried that some of the elves who followed Lloyd are trying to figure out a way to fight without killing them. However, he has a bigger problem to worry about, because Melika has already aimed her arrow at him. He pulls out his sword again, and cuts off every little arrow that comes at him. In the midst of all this, Melika releases her arrow. Javier, gathering all his strength, uses his mana sword to deflect the arrow flying around him. Javier refuses to give up as a massive arrow flies in his direction, and Melika is already releasing another. Swinging his aura sword, he spins it to control the arrow's momentum. It works, and Javier manages to deal with it. Using this arrow, he tries to block the second one with it, and the arrows collide, generating a powerful explosion. At this time, Lloyd manages to cut the root of the tree and steal the sap he needs from the ground. But the elven captain's squad also enters the tunnel he created by aiming a bow at him. They are furious that Lloyd dared to steal the only thing they consider sacred. Lloyd justifies himself, explaining that the lives of many people depend on him. The elves threaten to kill him, 
but Lloyd is unfazed and challenges them to kill him. Turning around, he threatens in return that if they shoot him, he will burn the mandrake that is begging for help. The elves immediately lower their weapons, and Lloyd asks them to move away if they don't want the plant to be harmed. They begin to curse him for treating the plant so cruelly, but Lloyd brushes them off as if nothing had happened. One of them pushes him, insulting his appearance, which catches Lloyd's attention. So he points his lantern even closer to the plant and tells the elves to keep moving back. Lloyd is so angry with them that with a deadpan look he keeps bringing the torch closer, asking the elves to move on. But they reach an impasse, and the captain tries to de-escalate the situation and suggests negotiations. However, Lloyd doesn't want to hear anything and starts to open his mouth. Mandragora is frightened and looks with such disgust at how Lloyd, drooling, tries to eat her. Meanwhile, Lloyd orders the elves to get out of the tunnel. When they manage to get out, Lloyd continues to hold the mandrake, waiting for Javier to arrive. He is so afraid that Javier will not come, because it will be the end for him. Suddenly, the elves begin to lose strength due to hunger, and their leader begins to lose strength due to hunger. Weera tries to keep their spirits up, but then her stomach starts to growl too, and eventually they all fall to the ground, exhausted. Lloyd is confused and wonders what happened to them, as he remembers how empty they looked when he first saw them. Then he realizes that there is no wildlife in the forest, and the domino monster has moved to the end of the mountain, leaving the forest abandoned. He knows that elves don't eat plants, so they only eat meat to survive. He wonders how long they have been starving like this. Meanwhile, Xavier still stood his ground and knew how to defend himself. But the elves began to look paler and lose strength. He wonders why they lost their strength so quickly. But this is also his best chance to catch up with Lloyd. He ducked down and was ready to run. Calling on his heart of mana, he raced straight for the army that blocked his path. Melika, on the other hand, is still going strong, she pulled out another arrow and fired a shot right at him. But Xavier has no intention of dodging and decides to strike back. And he keeps moving forward, despite the arrows that keep flying at him, hoping that Lloyd is okay. The elves in the tree warn the others that Xavier is about to break out of the siege, but they are all too hungry to move on. This makes it easy for Xavier to escape, but Melika is still chasing him firing her arrow. Fortunately, Xavier manages to dodge it. However, the force of the explosion from the arrow hitting the ground is enough to make Xavier fall. Melika does not miss her chance and quickly rushes forward to stab him. Xavier stumbled, trying to dodge every blow that came his way. He was determined to get to Lloyd, because it was his job to protect him. Melika approaches him again. She swings at him as he jumps to avoid the attack. The other elves also begin to attack. Leaves fall from the tree and float in the air as Javier steps on them. And just like that, he jumps several feet into the air and runs away. The elves are surprised that Xavier managed to use their technique, which they have been mastering for years. Xavier lands on a branch, and immediately arrows fly at him. So he quickly jumps to another branch. He is determined to get to Lloyd no matter what even when arrows are continuously raining down on his back. Javier just keeps running while Melika prepares to shoot two arrows at the same time. Soon, Xavier sees Alencia's tree and immediately calls for Lloyd. Meanwhile, Lloyd is resting, cooking meat with the elves. He hears Xavier calling out to him and turns around. He sees that Xavier is covered in mud, his clothes are torn, and he is suffocating. Lloyd is surprised to see how dirty his night is. Javier, on the other hand, is dumbfounded by what he sees. Lloyd eats with the elves as he fights them to a standstill. So Lloyd invites him to join him, and while Javier is sitting with the elves, Lloyd introduces him to Muira. She is the leader of the tribe. Javier greets her coldly in return when Muira asks if she can bring another person with her. Lloyd lets her do as she pleases. So Muira calls to Melika, who has been hiding behind a tree, to join her, and she comes and sits down next to Javier. He is stuck between the elves, 
claiming that it's nothing. Then Lloyd offers her some meat, and says that he knows the elves, who are still on guard, are hungry too. He is right. They are all salivating at the smell of the barbecue, and she just nods silently. A moment later, she feels sad when Lloyd mentions that their family is also hungry. As Lloyd continues to tell the story, some of the elves also begin to cry. He says that many of their children and elderly people are also suffering from hunger. Muira has nothing to say to this, and as if pouring salt on an open wound, she says that their children and elderly will be the first to die of hunger. Melika bursts into tears, as do the other elves in the tree who might have overheard him. Lloyd offers Muira a deal, but she immediately rejects it. However, Lloyd points out that they have already made a deal from the moment she agreed to back down so that he would not burn Mandragora. He adds that the moment she sat with him and ate with him was also an agreement. She sits there in defeat, and Lloyd smiles and says that he wants them both to survive. When she hears this, she doesn't understand what he means, but Lloyd explains to her that in exchange for her cooperation, he will provide them with meat and charcoal for cooking. He will also build them a freezer to store the meat, and Weira listens to this in silence. Then she asks what he wants, and Lloyd explains that if she rejects his offer, the children in the barony will freeze to death. He needs the sap from Alencia's tree once a month, and he will teach her how to get it without damaging the tree. Lloyd also adds that if they agree, they should divide the elves into two groups, one for distribution and the other half to help him build the apartment. Another elf recommends that Muira not agree to his suggestions, so she thinks carefully about his proposal. Then she remembers how her mother told her to trust only people who can become her friends. She sits in silence for a long time, making Lloyd more and more worried. Then she refuses his offer anyway, because she only trusts people who can become her true friends. Lloyd curses himself realizing that this is not as simple a deal as the one he made before. He remembers that when he was just Soho Kim, he was just a regular guy. And when he joined the club, people talked about him behind his back. But he didn't mind and tried his best to keep studying and succeed in life. But one day, one of his classmates invited him to eat Korean barbecue together. He told him to eat as much as he wanted, because he could not afford it on his own. He still remembers the eyes that constantly underestimated him and the offensive smile. Suho knew that the boy felt good because he was able to feed someone like him. But his charitable deed and humiliating words were nothing compared to the delicious food he was eating, so he gladly accepted it. At least he is better than the others, so he eats as much as he wants. And that's how they become friends. Now that he is in the other world, he still thinks there is nothing good about friendship and smiles as he takes a piece of beef out of his bag. Muira is surprised because it is unlike any beef she has ever seen, and Lloyd is cooking it over charcoal. When she takes her first bite of the beef, she cries because of how delicious it is. The others also enjoy the beef. This instantly melts Muira's heart, so she accepts Lloyd's offer without hesitation in exchange for a supply of beef. It's a success, and Lloyd brings the elves back to the barony, while Javier is still upset that Lloyd was able to win them over with food when he has to fight them tooth and nail. The townspeople are no longer surprised that Lloyd is able to bring other creatures into the barony. As a representative of the elves, Muira walks alongside Lloyd, seeing trees used as fences and doors. Lloyd knows what she's thinking and explains to her that each tribe has its own values to uphold, and when they are willing to compromise, the world can be a better place. She already understood this, but still thinks it's wrong. But Lloyd smiles and reminds her of the beef they will get from their deal. She immediately begins to compromise. The construction of his apartment complex is still underway, and as Lloyd looks at the building, he wonders if they will be able to finish it before winter sets in. He worries that the water inside the concrete will freeze, and when it starts to thaw, the moisture will damage the concrete from the inside. As a result, the building will collapse, but he doesn't have to worry about it because the elves help and pick up the work. They work quickly, 
and are motivated by the promise of eating beef after the job is done. When winter comes, the apartments are ready. So Lloyd immediately tests an adiabatic material made from Alencia extract. He told his men to cover the radiator with it, and when everyone on the floor was done, he ordered them floor was done, he ordered them to turn on the boiler in the basement. When the machine started up, the steam quickly went up the pipe, and the room is perfectly heated, which means his project is a success. When Lloyd leaves the house with Xavier, he announces to everyone that they should move in with him. Javier tries to tell him what should be his priority, but Lloyd just brushes him off and walks away. Xavier was annoyed that Lloyd was ignoring him and ordered Byron to prioritize families with young children and the elderly for resettlement. Lloyd goes on to say that if the refugees cannot move now, they will have to be housed in Andalus. Javier is surprised that Lloyd has thought of all this, while all Lloyd could think about is his tax revenues. When he's done, he asks Javier to go with him and meet with Arcos because he still has work to do. Javier thinks about how much Lloyd has changed and how he has changed the lives of everyone around him. As they walk down the street, they notice the royal messenger approaching. Arcos and Marbella are already there and greet the messenger as he opens the scroll. He reads out a message from the queen, who says she is impressed with Frontera's accomplishments, and she announces that Frontera's barony will be elevated to the level of a county. The envoy congratulates Arcos and Marbella, and Lloyd smiles happily in the back as he watches this happen. Thanks to their efforts in fighting the monster's dominoes, protecting the shelters, building up the east, and turning it into a fortress, Frontera will become independent, turning into a county. He also adds that the queen will finance and supply materials for the construction of the Orient, which makes Lloyd extremely excited. Lloyd immediately turns and asks Javier to go with him to the village. Arcos notices him leaving with Javier, and he cries because all of this was possible because of Lloyd, and he is proud to have him as a son. When night falls, Lloyd, along with Bayer and the villagers, walk around the statue of the queen that they have decorated and sung praises to. Lloyd is the one who persuaded them to do this so that a messenger would watch them. So when he comes back and tells the queen about it, she will be confused and angry. Meanwhile, the Viscount Lacona hurries to Frontera because he has been called by Arcos. He quickly kneels down in front of Arcos and greets him. But Arcos is humbled and asks him not to be so formal. But the Viscount continues to kneel to hide the fact that he is jealous of Arcos becoming a count. He has been making fun of Arcos at parties, and he intends to use Arcos' kindness to his advantage. Arcos asks him for help in building up the eastern region. He needs engineers, but he knows that if he asks for too much, the Viscount probably won't be able to handle it. So he asks only to send as many as he can. When he lifts his head off the ground to look at Arcos, he sees the same face that Lloyd used to intimidate him into bringing back his injury. This is the end of their encounter, and the Viscount looks so pale after their encounter that he falls off his horse, while Arcos watches him from his castle. He feels terrible for having threatened the Viscount, who is trembling as he tries to get back on his horse, but somehow he feels good after he did it, and Arcos smiled at the thought. Meanwhile, Bayaderica tells Lloyd that they have finished moving from the shelter to the apartment, because there was a message that there were reports that he got a new achievement and bonus RP for doing so. Lloyd smiles broadly as he reads the message. Meanwhile, the families are getting a full meal in the area for single Andal. Some are unhappy about this because they know they can't depend on other people forever. Some are upset that they can't do anything to support their own family and then they notice that someone is calling Lloyd. On the street, the refugees are happy and thank Lloyd for his help. Lloyd talks to everyone, including an elderly woman, and even takes a picture with a child. He smiles and waves to everyone until Javier suddenly notices that Lloyd is up to something. He knows that Lloyd wants something in return, and suddenly a table is set up in the field. A huge pile of papers is placed on it, Lloyd sits down and asks everyone to start paying their debt. 
It turns out that Xavier's guess was right. The people are confused because they don't understand what he means by contract labor, but Lloyd doesn't explain further. With an ugly face, he tells them that nothing in this world is free. Meanwhile, Xavier started getting headaches because he couldn't tell if Lloyd was right or wrong when someone approached Lloyd. It is the same man as before, and he asks if he will get the job if he signs this, to which Lloyd confirms, explaining that once he signed the contract and received the first payment, he will not receive any more offers from the county. He decides to take the job anyway, and Lloyd tells him that the work will be hard because the county is a capitalist region. Suddenly, a woman comes up and asks if she can work. Lloyd tells her that he does not discriminate against anyone who wants to work. Everyone immediately starts lining up because they want to be able to work too. Lloyd explains to them that they will be working on creating terrace farmland to provide food for themselves and to be able to own the land. He planned to turn the East Mountain into terrace farmland, and he initially wants to use rebar to build the terrace, but Bell was sick at the time. Apparently, she had been working too hard on the apartment project, and this angered Bung to the point where he punched Lloyd in the face. So he decides to call another animal, and is joined by Padong and Hippo. The messages encourage Lloyd to press the button, and he thinks the system is always on his side. He always gets animals that meet his needs, and he has a lot of RP points that he can use. When he pressed the button, he was hoping to see animals that could help him build a retaining wall for his terrace. The system immediately processes Lloyd's request, and he continues to pray for the right animals. Over time, the program grows, and Lloyd begins to wonder what it is. Suddenly, he is attacked by a powerful fire that he has no time to dodge has no time to dodge because he is too surprised. Lloyd is so shocked and upset that the system is not on his side this time. The system claims that it is never on anyone's side, but Lloyd knows that it has always given him the animals he needed. But the system laughs, and Lloyd wonders what happened. She deliberately gives him what he wants all the time so that at some point he will lose badly, because life is never easy. Lloyd is angry about this. Then a message appears telling him that he needs to go through another round. He presses the start button again, and instead of summoning the animals that were supposed to appear, there is an explosion. Lloyd starts to tap out a message, but it prompts him to press the button again. But he plays it safe and goes down to the ground with Padong and Hippo. However, the explosion he was expecting never happens, and when he looks back, he sees a giant snake-like monster appear. Lloyd immediately runs away with Padong and Hippo. He went to Xavier's room to wake him up because the monster was chasing him. Xavier manages to kill the monster, and when it's over, Lloyd joins Padong and Hamon on the ground, all of them breathing heavily. He's furious at the message board for setting him up, and then another message appears saying that he can choose the creature's skills that suit him. Lloyd is surprised by this, and suddenly a list of skills appears in front of him. He is shocked that all the skills are useless. But in the corner, he notices something about the ability to weave a web. Lloyd begins to think that this might be the best option because it would be the perfect replacement for the rebar. Another trigger button appears in front of him, and Lloyd presses it in full confidence that he will get a creature with a web. The summoning program reappears, and immediately begins to glow brightly. As night turns to morning, Javier wakes up feeling like he's had a strange dream. Meanwhile, the workers starting their day notice something in the sky. They were stunned to see a giant bird flying overhead. Its shadow was blocking the sunlight, and its feathers were falling from the sky. Lloyd was on top of this bird because he was very excited about his new animal charmer and took it with him to fly around the entire neighborhood. The workers applauded him, so he stood up and stretched to his full height. He enjoys the praise he receives and thinks to himself that he has hit the jackpot by purchasing a parrot. The bird's name is Gaumann, and it has thrown off the cobwebs from his backpack. Last night, he tried to break the web with mana, but it was too strong. After hearing his praise, he sent homing to the ground and began to weave a net for the terrace. 
but homing gives a sign, and what Lloyd feared happens. The bird flies in the opposite direction and lands in the forest. The bird's sudden stop causes Lloyd to lose his balance and fall into the snow. He yells at homing, but he calmly sits down in a tree and leans back. From the beginning, Lloyd knows that homing is a lazy animal, and when he suddenly stops because he is lazy, he is just angry because he does not know how to make him work. Last night, after Lloyd had just called homing in, he asked him what his web weaving skills looked like. But he just sighed and sat down on the ground, saying he didn't care. Lloyd was shocked at how he behaved while Pa Dong was talking to Homing. Pa Dong tried to convince Homing that work was important in life by smiling broadly at him, but Homing didn't seem to care. Then he said that he would try to do it, and for a moment Lloyd believed that Pa Dong's motivation had worked. But he was in a lazy state again that day. So Pa Dong again got out from under Lloyd's shirt and tried to get Homing to do something. Homing said that he didn't see why he should work hard if Lloyd would take care of him. Lloyd was shocked and angry to hear this. Pa Dong scolded him for being lazy, and Homing threw the stick he was chewing to stop him talking. It hit Pa Dong in the head, and Lloyd just stood there and watched it happen. Then he asked Lloyd to give him a red sunflower seed and Lloyd gave it to him. In a moment, Homing flew off in fear, trying to escape from the forest. Everyone was startled by a loud roar coming from the forest, and Homing tried to fly as fast as he could to get away from Pa Dong. But Pa Dong, who has grown bigger, grabs one of Homing's legs and holds it tight so that he cannot escape. Pa Dong then chews him up like a lunch, making him scream so loudly that he can be heard throughout the forest while Lloyd is too shocked to say anything. After Homing was shoved into Pong's mouth, he immediately spat him out on the ground. He must have done this to get Homing to go back to work, because when he offered to do it again, Homing screamed that he wanted to work again. Then both Pa Dong and Lloyd laughed because they had won. In the first phase of the project, Lloyd sent his men to dig the ditch and then asked Storm to divide the sand. Goming flew above the ground and dropped cobwebs to make a net. Pa Dong kept an eye on Homing so that he wouldn't get lazy again, and Lloyd, who was sitting on Homing's back, ordered the white troops to come from above. The soldiers welcomed him and covered the spider web with sand to cover it until they were done filling it. Then they covered the gaben wall with stones and pebbles. Lloyd was pleased with how everything had turned out and the thought that it could be done by next year thrilled him. He stood on Homing's back and rooted for the lives of rich people who had no work to be made real, because he already had the troops to do the preparatory work and his father with the Byron to take care of the paperwork. A few days later, the farmland deal was finalized and Lloyd received an additional 800 RP to his balance. A few days later, Lloyd had the best time of his life playing chess with himself. He was constantly moving pieces around, and when he beat himself, he got off. Xavier watched him from the doorway and knew that Lloyd didn't like what he was doing. But as soon as Lloyd convinced himself that everything was going smoothly, he had an idea. He remembered that his father had told him that even if things were working well, he should double-check to make sure everything was okay. He got up and told Xavier that he would sleep late tonight because he needed to check everything. When it got dark, he opened the closing spoiler window to make sure his future was going to be okay. To make sure his future would be okay, because nothing in this world is free. He pressed the yes button to find out what would happen next. He entered a dark, empty room that was gradually becoming familiar to him. He was probably in his room when he saw Xavier using a wild magic circle. His body was covered in green light and he was directing all his power at Lloyd, who was dying on his bed. He couldn't believe how sad and helpless Xavier looked. Lloyd's heart received all of Xavier's strength, but it did not help him escape death. Lloyd was surprised at how his life had turned out and didn't understand why he was so sick. His future self told Xavier to stop everything he was doing and burn everything to the ground. He asked what exactly he should burn, 
but Xavier finally gave in and took Lloyd's hand. When he was about to tell Xavier that he wasn't the real Lloyd, Xavier told him that no matter who he was, he would always be the hero who saved the barony and many people. Lloyd from the future said nothing, and his breathing slowed until he took his last breath and died. As he died, the creatures he had summoned slowly disappeared. Lloyd was shocked by what happened, but didn't let it get to him because he's seen his death before, so he takes a moment to think it over. He sees that Xavier hasn't changed much, which means that time is not far off, and he looks like he's dehydrated. Lloyd follows Xavier to the town square, where he sees something that upsets him. Dozens of dead bodies, from children to adults, lie in one place. Only Xavier was still alive, and the first thing that came to his mind was that they may have lost a battle in which everyone died. Then he saw Xavier pouring oil on the dead bodies and lighting a torch. Finally, he realizes that Xavier was ordered to burn all the bodies so that Lloyd would know that the people died because of the disease. Lloyd was afraid that he could not help because he was not a doctor and did not know what to do. Then he heard Xavier talking to Lloyd's burning body and saying what Lloyd had said before he died. Lloyd had no idea what Xavier meant when he told him to remember the emptiness. When Lloyd came back to the present, he wondered why the last word of his future self was hard to understand. Then he realized that it could be a message for himself, as he was seeing himself in the future. Perhaps the future Lloyd left this sign, because he knew that Lloyd would be able to see the future, but as Lloyd walked in circles, he still didn't know what it meant. Then he suddenly stopped when an idea struck him. He remembered the winter flashback and realized how clever a thought it was by his future self. When morning came, Lloyd met with Byron and said he needed masons from Cremo County. Byron was worried that their budget was too small to hire workers from outside, but Lloyd assured him that he would take care of everything, even if he had to go into debt again. But he wasn't too worried because his title, Get out of debt, was bringing him more benefits than usual. He told Byron that his project was as big as an apartment project because it covered an entire neighborhood. He then went on to describe his Bavaria project in detail, noting the differences between it and his previous work. This time he had to fight a cholera epidemic. He lacked a medical background, but as a civil engineer, he was well equipped to help prevent the disease's devastating effects from happening again by building the necessary sewage systems. Last night, he realized that his future self was talking about Vienna when it was overpopulated and lacked a perfect sewer system. All waste was dumped into the Danube River. The water naturally took away the waste, but the sudden freezing of the river and, as a result, the overflow of sewage led to an outbreak of cholera. In Frontera, all the waste ends up in the Prona River, and if it snows, Frontera could look like Vienna. Lloyd was upset because he had just thought he had everything taken care of, but he found an even bigger problem. But he didn't let that stop him from pursuing his life goals. And just a few hours later, as Lloyd lay in bed, his thoughts were focused on how to pay the people on the outside and get his debts paid off again. Meanwhile, the Red Orc noticed that Greg was flirting with another woman. He made up the most daring phrases to get her attention, and she laughed at how stupid he was. How stupid he was. When the Orc saw how happy Greg and this woman looked, it made him angry. Then Greg received a phone call saying that Bayern Munich was looking for him. Orc decided to use this opportunity to confront Greg. He was angry at Greg for cheating on Emily, but other than being angry, he didn't say anything and it confused Greg. Then the orc got angry with Greg for betraying Emily. Greg was confused and said that Emily was just like any other ordinary woman, which made the orc even angrier. He tried to hit Greg, but Greg used his magic to hit him first, and the orc fell down. Holding his red cheek, he could not believe that Greg had such power, and Greg told him that he could never have killed him with one blow. All the troops in Frontera had to do was learn to control and use their magic to the best of their ability, but they usually only used it to build things. 
After wiping his face, the orc stood up, and his power poured into the air. Greg, who didn't want to lose, was ready to use his power if necessary. They stood side by side, while their anger and hatred for each other only grew. Then they started to run at each other, but suddenly, next to Greg, Byron appeared and Byron began to deal with Greg for not coming when he was called. Greg could only apologize and follow Byron as he told him what to do. Greg looked back at the orc as Byron spoke. He quietly told the orc that this battle was not over yet. Then they both went to do their work. In the stables at the castle, Greg asked Baron why they had to go to Cremo. Baron replied that Lloyd had a plan to save their lives. Greg was still trying to understand why they had to go to Cremo to do it. Lloyd, who was sitting tensely in his chair at this time, gets a message that since he has many titles, it gives him different effects. This caught Lloyd's attention, and the message said that everything he had done so far would help him. Greg gathers all the workers together and goes to the house. Lloyd doesn't know what help they can provide, but the alert tells him that the effects are on. He hears screaming from outside, so he goes to the window to find out what's going on. He is surprised that all his employees came to the house to ask for work. They were shouting his name, and Lloyd couldn't say anything. He is moved by what they did and yelled at them to stop. The crowd was instantly silent, and then Lloyd told them that he didn't believe in people helping others for free. They didn't understand what Lloyd meant, so he told them that he never planned to hire them for free. Lloyd says they will sign a new agreement, and the crowd applauds again, dot he turns away from the window, and quietly wipes his tears. Meanwhile, the bird has sent a letter to the Sultan in ASFAHAN.IT is a message from a team of spies in the West. They claim that a monster in a western village can tear the sky in two, drain the ocean, and destroy the mountains and there is also a demon that scares away all the monster dominoes. The people who worked in the city could kill an orc with one punch, and the servants moved as fast as lightning. The report shocked the king. The report said that their military power was off the charts, even if the soldiers were like white cavalry, doing hard labor. The king wondered what was wrong with this place. Diego shouted at the two guys who were fighting in Lacona. He ordered them to keep fighting, despite their injuries and fatigue. He used their families to make them feel bad about giving up, so they had no choice but to do what he said. So they punched each other in the face without looking at each other. Diego sits in his chair and laughs when, out of nowhere, Lloyd starts laughing as well. Lloyd doesn't care much for Diego's behavior, so he recoils as soon as he sees him. Hearing Diego's frightened screams, the men stopped fighting. Lloyd said that what Diego was doing looked like fun, so he wanted to try it too. Diego thinks that Lloyd is going to fight him, but Lloyd calls him a fool for thinking that, because he wants Diego to fight Xavier. When Lloyd tells Diego to fight Xavier, it makes him freeze. Xavier sighed and said he would gladly do it if Lloyd told him to. He pulls out his sword and puts his power into it. Diego is afraid. So when Lloyd told him to take out his sword too, he bowed to him and asked him to spare him. Lloyd said in passing that he realized he had asked for too much. So he asked Xavier to put the sword away and asked Diego to fight him instead. Diego is shocked by his request. Without hesitation, Lloyd punched Diego in the face, and it didn't take long for Diego to be covered in bruises. Then, when Lloyd was satisfied, he wrote about what Diego had done to his guards in his letter of appeal to the school. When Diego asked him not to, Lloyd told him that since his father was a count, he had a higher pedigree than Diego. In the end, Lloyd does send a letter with the help of Homing and Pa Dong. Then he sees the soldiers that Diego had been inciting to beat each other. He told them to stop looking sad and go work for Frontera. When Lloyd leaves with Xavier, they both look happy. Meanwhile, the Viscount has just woken up from a bad dream. He is upset because he had another dream about Lloyd just before someone knocked on his door. 
When the person on the other side of the door continued to talk to him insistently, he grabbed the whip from the table and opened the door, where he saw Lloyd's scary face. The Viscount immediately fainted, and Lloyd asked Xavier if his face was not too scary, to which Xavier agreed. When the Viscount woke up, Lloyd took him to the roof and said that he would need the land behind the mountain that stretches over Lacona. Lloyd wants to demolish it to build an underground facility, which surprises the Viscount, and he wants to refuse him. But Lloyd's quick change of heart scares him after he tells him that he doesn't need his permission to do so. Lloyd wanted to build the sewer out of granite because it would last longer, so he told his workers to make a straight road from the quarry to their estate as soon as possible. But shortly after they started working, they came across Lakin's estate and immediately destroyed it because Lloyd had ordered them not to turn around. Finally, Lakin's estate is destroyed, and the Viscount can only watch in horror, although Lloyd has promised to build him a new house as compensation. Melica watched over the Viscount and Diego in a tent until their new home was ready. When she asked if they needed anything, they shrank back in fear. Meanwhile, Lloyd, watching his project, orders Byron to move the stones in Appian Tunnel, and he doesn't have to worry about destroying the forest because he is Storm, who can rip all the trees out of the ground. The orcs then cut them down and carry them away. The bonus was Bayer, who managed to tame the mastodons, which they used to carry heavy things. While this was happening, the elves continued to work on the apartment. And now that everything was taken care of, Lloyd only had to think about what to do with the dirty sludge from the sewer. He knew he couldn't tell his men to dig it up because the deadly fumes would kill them. The only way to get rid of it was to burn it, but he couldn't find a way to do that. He was worried about finding the right slave to come to the sewers every day and burn the garbage when a thought occurred to him that made him smile. The next day, Lloyd and Xavier went to the dwarf instead to collect sap from Alencia's tree to make armor. Lloyd happily replied that he agreed when Corgidus asked if they wanted to hunt dragons. When Corgidus asks who will do the hunting, he points to Xavier as the person who will do it. Xavier says nothing, but he is confused and angry that Lloyd hasn't told him anything. The next day, the dragon on the east mountain could not cut his gems so he threw them away every time he broke them. He cried because he could not make them into beautiful jewelry. The dragon wants to get married, but he could not make any of the stones look beautiful with his own hands. He could only destroy them, and knew that no female dragon would be attracted to him. But he didn't want to give up, so he picked up another stone. He starts to cut it with his finger, but it immediately breaks. Then he could steal from people or force dwarfs to help him with it. When the Dragon King married a human, he made a rule that other species would not attack humans and force them to make stones for them. Other species would not attack and force another species to do it for them, but would find the means to create it themselves. He curses the king for making such rules and prays that he will die when Lloyd appears out of nowhere and says that he understands how he feels. Lloyd tells him that the old men are lying, and that the dragon is angry that he and Xavier got inside without triggering any of his traps. He told Solita, the dragon, that they had turned them off, but that Xavier takes care of all the traps. Solita, however, is not interested in reason and instead starts throwing fire at them, chiding them for their misfortune. Lloyd and Xavier are both protected by armor, and when Xavier asks what they will do next, Lloyd replies that he has already told him. They had to hide behind a rock because the fire was raging, and when Lloyd didn't tell Xavier his plan, Xavier told Lloyd that he trusted his every decision. So Lloyd told him to fight and catch the dragon. He pushes Xavier off the cliff, even though the fire is still aimed at them. When Salida stops, he is surprised to see that Xavier and his armor are still intact. He yells at Xavier and plans to kill him by crushing him. Lloyd is just standing behind him and cheering him on. Xavier decides to ignore Lloyd and use his mana to ignite his sword. Suddenly, Salita's hand rose up, ready to crush him like an insect. However, Xavier manages to jump back, 
but Salida is determined and continues to try to kill him with his bare hands, and he just got angry because Xavier dodged his hand more than once. This fight proves to Xavier that he moves faster than he thought, which can help him in the fight with Solitaire. Lloyd knows that his plan will work because he read the book and saw Xavier kill the dragon. Salidi tried to crush Xavier again and again, but Xavier moved so fast that Salidi could not keep up with him. Then Xavier takes revenge on Salida by attacking him from above, but Salida quickly uses his tail to block the attack. Xavier is about to get hit when suddenly a magic step appears to help him avoid it. He uses it to jump to the other side. Solita is amazed at his movement and how well he can do it. Thanks to the magic steps, Xavier can move faster, and Lloyd admires that he was able to do this after only one fight with the elves. Solita is confused because he can't keep up with him, and is frightened when he looks up and sees that Xavier is ready to hit him. The circles of mana around Xavier's core become brighter, and they begin to move together. Then, before it explodes in a huge flash, Xavier directs it into his weapon. This is Xavier's mana blast at full power, and he aims it directly at Salida. Although his skin wasn't badly damaged, one shot to the chest was enough to make him cry. Xavier falls to the ground and challenges Salida to another fight. But Salida has already asked Xavier to spare him. Lloyd completely understood Salida. In his opinion, it's similar to when a person finds a bug and tries to fight it. Dot he tried to scare it away with bug spray, but it didn't move. Then the beetle started flying around him and poking him with its handle. The man was scared to see that a beetle could behave like that. And Xavier is a beetle in Solita's eyes. Solita is so afraid of Xavier that she is shaking. Solita tries to talk to Xavier and says something that makes Xavier stop and listen. Solita takes this as a chance to hit Xavier, but only hits the ground when she raises her hand. Xavier suddenly appears from behind and hits him with a blast of mana. Solita screams in pain, but Xavier continues to approach him from all sides. Lloyd can watch the fight without doing anything, and guess what Solita will do next. Lloyd knows that Solita wants to escape because he releases black smoke into the cave which blocks Xavier's view. He hides and changes himself in the smoke. Like the man who couldn't kill the bug, the next step is to leave the room. Solita, who has transformed into a man with bright red hair, runs out of the smoke and hides behind Xavier on a rock. He doesn't know that Xavier has seen him, and when he tries to teleport, he is electrocuted, giving away his hiding place. As he falls to the ground, he realizes how stupid he was to forget that he had set the trap to stop the teleportation. Then he sees someone approaching him. Lloyd says he is Count Frontera's son when he introduces himself. Salida tries to play dumb, saying he is not a dragon. He smiles at Salida's horrible act as Xavier slowly moves towards him with his sword. Dot he then swung his sword and used his mana to aggressively hit Salida from behind. This proves that he is Salida because he was on his knees and screaming at them for causing him so much pain. As Salida is human, then he will die right now because this attack is too powerful for a human to handle. But Lloyd said he only wants to make a deal with him. Salida starts to complain and Lloyd calmly told him that Xavier attacked him out of reflexes. He believes Lloyd's lie and wants to hear what he said and Lloyd smiles broadly because he managed to fool him. I in the book he recalls how upset Solita was when he fought the elves. It made him think of customers, who are always complaining about something, and only someone stronger than him could handle that kind of anger. But Lloyd knows that Solita is a proud dragon, and since he is a human and Solita is a dragon, he cannot control him with fear alone. So he told Xavier that he shouldn't have attacked such a wonderful creature as Solita. Lloyd only did it because he couldn't fully control Solita, if he couldn't make him feel good, Lloyd continues to admire Salidi, and Xavier, who doesn't understand what he did wrong, gets angry at Lloyd for scolding him for no reason. Then, out of the blue, Lloyd orders him to get down on his knees and raise his hands. Xavier was even more upset and confused at Lloyd's insistence 
that he was deaf made Xavier kneel down and raise his hands, but he kept his anger to himself. Then Lloyd asked Salida to sit on a rock and began to tell him about his proposal. And in that instant, his bright smile changed to a sly smile, as he told Salida that he knows he really wants to get married. He also knows that he has a hard time making gems that will attract female dragons, which makes Solita wonder how he knows all this. But Lloyd doesn't answer his questions. Instead, he said he could help him get married in ten years. Solita is interested in his offer. However, he decided to find out how Lloyd knew about all this, but Lloyd kept confusing him with romantic ideas about what he could do with his future wife. Solita can imagine everything, so when Lloyd gives him a contract, he signs it right away without even reading it. After he signed it, Lloyd immediately took the paper away. Then he told Solitao that dragons have a rule. If he breaks the agreement with a human, the Dragon King's breath will be used to destroy him. At this moment, Solitao realizes that he made a terrible choice by making the deal with Lloyd. When they arrive at Frontera, the farmers see that Lloyd has brought someone else instead of a dragon. They didn't know that the guy with the red hair was a real dragon. Lloyd is thrilled because he convinced the real dragon to sign a deal to continue burning waste in the sewer system. Lloyd brings Salida, who continues to blow smoke into the air, to Corgitus. Salida is angry with Lloyd because he thinks that Lloyd is trying to trick him by introducing him to the dwarf. So Lloyd tells him that Corgitus knows how to make jewelry by hand, and that's part of their deal. In return, he has to burn waste in the sewer every day. Solita is upset that he has to clean up human waste because he is a dragon. As if reading his mind, Lloyd told him that even if his job is too easy for a dragon like him, he can learn the skills needed to make jewelry, and it will be more profitable for him. He smiled slyly telling Solitaire that he would never marry if he had to put his pride on a pedestal and give up the contract. Salidi agrees with Lloyd and arrogantly calls Corgid a dwarf, but he immediately bows down to Corgid and asks him to teach him. Corgid thinks about how good it would be to have a dragon as an apprentice. Salida tells him that even if dragons are the strongest creatures in the world, Corgid will still be the best master. Salida asks Lloyd for help, but Lloyd watches him, silently applauding Solita for adapting quickly to the situation, so it shouldn't be a problem. Solita agrees, even though Corgitus said he would be difficult. Suddenly, Corgitus yells at Solita to get his things right away. Solita is surprised that he had to do the previous work, so Corgitus scolds him. Solita runs and gets his things right away, and Lloyd is happy that he can make a good deal for everyone because Solita will get the best teacher of the craft, and Corgid will be pleased to have a dragon as his student. After Solita received his gems, they set to work. Soon after, Corgidus yelled at Solita again and hit him on the arm because he was trying too hard. Lloyd remembers having to sign contracts even though he knew they were bad deals. He believed that people like him didn't have many options. Watching Corgidus scold Solita for falling into the same trap, he thinks that such contracts are like murder. From his point of view, the deal should be beneficial for everyone. He sees Solita repeatedly breaking stones, but all he does is throw them away. Lloyd, being Lloyd, took the jewelry and kept it for himself. He considers it a bonus for himself. Eventually, he receives a box full of oddly shaped jewelry and a message that he's made things right. Solita always lost to Xavier in a fight, and he lost Dot-Eye in the story. He was wounded before he died in his dent. Lloyd had just found out about it, and then received a message saying that Arcos was happy because Lloyd had paid his bill, and now he could do things he hadn't done before. Arcos creates small figures of Lloyd and his brother Julian, who graduated at the top of his class. Lloyd is proud of what he has done, and asked for money and returned Dot on the messenger board it was written that he should go and get the money himself. But he really needs to improve his skills, because the area he can cover with is he can only cover 729,000 square meters, 
and his project was designed for an entire county. Standing on the hill, he raises his level to get a wider range of estimates. Lloyd kept raising his level until it evolved into a more sophisticated design with a range of over 3 million. He is happy with how it turned out and suddenly receives something called construction guidelines. After that, Lloyd is skeptical of the message that urges him to try it, like a salesperson trying to convince him to buy a product. However, Lloyd does what he is told and opens one of his projects. When Lloyd uses the rule skill, his design is projected into reality. Behind him, he is shocked to see his design transform into a life-size hologram. The message said that his employees could see the hologram and use it in their work. Lloyd immediately realized how much this skill would help him and wanted to try it out immediately. At night, he meets Xavier in the field, draws a circle on the ground, and asks Xavier to dig inside the circle. Xavier wants to know why he has to do this, but Lloyd just told him to do it first. As Xavier dug, the image showed how deep the ground was. Then Lloyd told him to dig outside the line. The green hologram suddenly turns red, and Lloyd's horrible face appears, scolding him. Xavier is sick of his annoying face, and Lloyd is angry. But that doesn't stop Xavier from insulting him. Since the workers can see his horrible face, they will be motivated to do their jobs right. Xavier unexpectedly asks him if he will lie again about having gotten this skill as a secret talent or from a dark wizard who gave him magic tools. Lloyd knows he can't keep lying to him, so he asks Xavier which story is more believable. Xavier tells him that the second story is more likely and that Lloyd must be wearing a chain that looks like a magic amulet. He turned around and walked away, saying that he would believe this story as well. Lloyd told Xavier that he would answer all his questions, even if he couldn't tell him everything. Xavier replies that the most important thing is that Lloyd saved everyone in the neighborhood. Xavier looks Lloyd in the eye and says that's all that matters. Lloyd is surprised by his words. He thanks Xavier for his trust and says he will continue to do what he does best. The next day, Baron asks all the workers to repeat his motto as he leads them to the sewer system construction site. The workers shout that safety must come first and Baron threatens to kill them if they get hurt. Lloyd wonders why they are getting crazier by the minute. However, Xavier doesn't say anything because their boss is getting even crazier and completely oblivious to this fact. Lloyd plans to build small sewers all over the county that will be connected to the main pipe. He is going to use Podong to dig the small sewer lines. But Podong can't build the main pipe by himself, so he sends Jingle Bell to convince Storm to dig the rest. He manages to dig a huge hole with just one shovel. One of the workers accidentally digs outside the line when they are scooping up the earth, and everyone is shocked to see Lloyd's face scolding him. They are shocked and stop working for a while. And then they applaud loudly because that face motivates them to work harder. They all deliberately make mistakes to see how Lloyd will react to them. When Lloyd sees what they have done, he angrily orders them to get back to work immediately. They return to their workplaces in fear. Lloyd asks again why they are becoming so crazy lately, but Xavier doesn't know what to say, because it is obvious that Lloyd's madness is contagious. After several heavy rains in the spring, the small sewer project has been running efficiently for three months. The project has been moving along quickly thanks to Lloyd's good ability to give directions. As spring approaches, Lloyd tells Byron that they will build a sewage treatment plant on the other side of the field. Byron is worried because mastodons live in the area, but Lloyd reassures him that everything will be fine as long as they don't make him angry, and with Storm on the job, they are also safe. But since they are working in the field, there are no mastodons around dot at the same time. Lloyd was playing a game with himself again. He imagined that he had caught a criminal. Padong looked at him sadly, and he was lying on the ground happily. Then Padong told him, that he had found something strange. When they were digging a hole, the workers saw that there were dead and buried mastodons in it. Lloyd goes to take a look because he is curious. When he sees a mastodon, 
he is surprised and decides to take a closer look. As he gets closer to the pit and sees the dead mastodon, he realizes that it has been killed. He doesn't know who did it or why. Then Storm tells Lloyd that he smells something, and Lloyd orders his workers to dig it up again. Lloyd is shocked by what he sees. They are slowly digging deeper and wider. Inside, dozens of dead mastodons are carefully buried. He tries to remember something similar in the book, but all he can think of is the chapter about Namrin, where Xavier figured out how to use mana blast. Then the mastodon started releasing a horrific form of magic into the atmosphere that Lloyd recognized as corpse explosion magic. He told everyone to stay away, and soon the dead mastodons exploded. At the same time, everyone ran faster to get away from the place where the mastodons were buried, and they made it in time to avoid the huge explosion. But Lloyd knows that the fire will catch up with them anyway, so he decides to stop it. Dottie stopped and turned around, ready to protect his staff. Without thinking twice, Lloyd uses his magic blast to stop the explosion, but Storm jumps in front of him and blocks the flames. Lloyd is afraid that Storm might have been hurt, so Lita is busy carving a piece of wood and can feel the magic from where he is sitting. He immediately realizes that the explosion was caused by necromantic magic and wonders if he should help Lloyd. But he sees Xavier heading toward the field, so he goes back to working on the sculpture, because Xavier can help Lloyd alone. At that moment in the field, Storm faints, and Lloyd is worried about him. When the workers suddenly notice something, one of them immediately reports it to Lloyd. The dead mastodons come to life with glowing purple eyes and rush at him. They all run to Lloyd, who is holding a beaver in his arms. Lloyd orders everyone to run and tells the white cavalry that this will be their last day and motivates them to fight for Frontera County. Lloyd stops them and orders them to retreat. Lloyd asks Byron where the little mastodons are, and he tells him that there is one in the field. Lloyd calls Pawn for help, and the hamster rushes to the mastodons to stop them. The hamster uses its skill and fights all the mastodons. Lloyd was shocked and confused when he learned about such lightning-fast skills of the animal. Soon, the Padong was outnumbered and exhausted. As he tried to defeat the undead mastodons, he was completely defeated by them. Lloyd started shouting to the undead to show that Lloyd was holding the little mastodon hostage and licked it as if he was going to eat it. The mastodons were excited and rushed to rescue the little mastodon. Lloyd managed to attract their attention, so he carried the little mastodon on his back and started to run for his life. Soon they were joined by a padong, and Lloyd ordered him to take them to the forest at the end of the valley. The soldiers had mixed feelings as Lloyd had saved them again. It soon became cold in the forest, and soon he was grabbed by Xavier and asked if he could take him with him ten kilometers north. Padong was exhausted, and soon the undead mastodons caught up with him. Lloyd used a mana blast to attack one of the animals. When he attacked it, it exploded but there were too many of them. Padong got scared and stopped as they were at a dead end. Lloyd got scared when the mastodons approached him from behind. So he used his modeling skill and was sure that they could not climb higher. He was confused but calmed himself down and moved forward to face the evil creatures. Lloyd orders the Padong to stay close to the wall as much as possible. Then he turns his shovel around to use the triple mana core blast attack and misses it on purpose. The shovel falls down, and soon Lloyd is on his knees as well. Lloyd uses his supercharged skill and absorbs all the mana from the surrounding mastodons. We see Lloyd and Xavier on the training ground, and Lloyd shows him his triple mana core attack. Lloyd has used all his energy, causing him to fall to the ground. Lloyd uses his supercharged skill to try to concentrate his mana production. Lloyd thinks he has succeeded in absorbing Xavier's mana, but the messenger told him that his short body cannot handle this type of mana. Then Lloyd begins to vomit red liquid and falls to the ground in a moment. Xavier is confused and asks Lloyd if he's okay, 
but today he used the supercharged skill to absorb only mana from undead mastodons. The messenger goes on to tell him that he has exceeded the amount of mana he can absorb, and also his manly heart is being forced to expand, and soon he has received a large amount of energy, pushed himself, and tries to absorb more mana. His heart took damage, but the strong mana he absorbed is used again after a few cycles to heal his mana heart. Lloyd was able to increase his skill level, and now he was a sword expert. The man picked up a shovel and is preparing to fight the evil spirits. The system reports that he has a new skill. Heart of Mana! Lloyd was furious. He orders all the undead to kneel, and strangely enough all the mastodons knelt before him. Podon was surprised by what happened before his eyes. Lloyd fed him a blue seed, and he returned to his normal size. The messenger showed him that he would be able to dominate and control any evil with less mana than him. Lloyd steps on the mastodons and starts moving to a safe place like a boss. The messenger informs him that his skill will only be used when he faces the evil spirits. When Lloyd looked back, he saw that many mastodons have regained consciousness and are preparing to fight Lloyd. And soon the system displays a timer showing how much time he is until the end of his control over them. As soon as he saw the timer, Lloyd started running for his life. Soon time is running out, and Lloyd is surrounded by mastodons. Lloyd grabs the little mastodons trying to save him. When they attack Lloyd, he is saved by Xavier, who has arrived on the scene with a homing gun. Xavier pulls out his aura sword and asks the homing to move forward, but the homing was too lazy to move. But once he heard the pot on, he had no choice but to move forward. Xavier breaks the valley wall to bury all the dead, but forgot to let Lloyd in. Lloyd was hanging in the air all this time. Xavier managed to bury the dead, but there was a huge explosion. Lloyd was shocked to see such massive destruction. They all stopped at the hill, and Lloyd thanked Xavier for saving his life. Xavier got angry with Lloyd because he always risked his life for others and told him that he should value his life more because all the people in the area were counting on him. Lloyd asks him what will happen if he doesn't save all the workers, and Xavier tries to explain to him that he didn't mean it, but Lloyd told him that he has to do it, otherwise everyone will be in danger. Then Xavier said that he didn't need to fight alone because now he has many allies. Xavier asks him if he plans to do it in the future Lloyd said, that he will still do it as he wanted. Xavier was excited, but calmed down and told Lloyd that he would always be on his side. The system informs Xavier of his closeness to Lloyd. The system informs Lloyd that Xavier's affection for Lloyd had increased for the first time, and as a reward he received 270 RP points, and Xavier's reading score for Lloyd had also increased, and now he was not a person to be protected but respected him. The messenger tells Lloyd that Xavier promised that he would be willing to die for him if he was on the verge of death. Lloyd was happy and told Xavier that he knew what he was thinking. Lloyd is trying to find out who is behind all this ruckus about the undead mastodons. He thinks that the necromancer must have used his black magic and asked Xavier to find some clues as to who was behind the incident. Lloyd guessed it from the novel and swears he will make whoever is behind it take responsibility for the damage. Subsequently, all the workers work hard to find clues Lloyd told Xavier that they cannot resume construction because it would be dangerous to dig recklessly. Then one of the soldiers comes and tells Lloyd that the Earl of Cremo has come to visit their county. Count Cremo was standing in the manor house of the fronters, and he had come to propose marriage to Lloyd. However, Lloyd told Cremo that he was not his type, but the Count explained to him that he had come to his daughter's wedding. After all, he thought that Lloyd had become so famous unexpectedly, and that he wondered if there would ever be a man better than him to be his son-in-law, although he was sure there would be. There must have been many nobles who would have liked to make him their son-in-law, which is why he approached him so quickly. Lloyd tries to explain to him that no one had made him such an offer, except for Count Frontera, showing him all the letters of offer. Lloyd was shocked to see that there were so many. 
Cremo told Lloyd that they were all insincere, and he should not think about them, but just get married. Lloyd asked Cremo to apologize, but he refused. However, the Count told him that he had to get married now, because he was already 27 and still single, so people started to think that something was wrong with him. At this point, Xavier was trying to keep from laughing Cremo's daughter was also there, embarrassed and pale. She introduced herself to them, and told Lloyd that she was ready to sacrifice her body for the prosperity of the family. Lloyd was depressed because he knew she didn't want to marry him. Xavier then used his mana to try not to laugh and struggled with this feeling. He asked Cremo to respect his daughter's wishes and not just trade her for fame. Cremo was convinced and told his daughter that he was sorry for making her upset for the sake of their family fortune. The girl was very happy at his words and hugged him. Count Cremo then thanked the Frontera family for reuniting him with his family. Everyone applauded, wishing everyone to live with love. Lloyd was sitting on the couch in depression. The man was depressed and wondering if it was a happy ending that he didn't get married. Lloyd looked at Xavier, who was trying his best not to laugh. He struggled even more than when he fought the giant, and in the end all requests for a political marriage were refused. At the royal court, a servant informs the queen that Lloyd has rejected all marriage proposals. The queen expected this, because if Lloyd accepted the proposal, the lady would simply reject him because he was like a potato. After that, the woman starts laughing uncontrollably, and she orders the royal servant to cook her potatoes for dinner. The woman asks the royal messenger if they will have someone to visit Asfahan to learn more about the domino monsters. She thinks long and hard and orders the messenger to send Lloyd to Asfahan. Shortly afterwards, Lloyd found a goat's head at the scene of the incident in the county, and Sir Byron informs him that it is somehow connected to the incident. Lloyd examines the goat's head and realizes that this pattern was on the flag of the kingdom with the Empress. He thinks about it, but was not sure because everything has changed from the original timeline, so the future will be changed. The man suspected the dark sorcerer Conavaro, because he was the one who unleashed the Namoran barrier and led everyone to their deaths. Lloyd asked Sir Byron to resume construction work and take care of all the problems as he would be away on business. The young frontier was going to Namarin to find more clues about who was behind it. In Frontera's district, about 10 kilometers to the north, there was a liquid waste dumping site. Lloyd asked the Padong to lift the lid off that structure. Lloyd then asked Salad to go ahead and do his job. Salatasm uses his powers and lifts up the human feces by rolling them up, turning into a dragon shape, and burns the feces with his terrible breath fire. Lloyd told him that soon the whole world would know the story of the dragon, who gladly used his powers for the sake of human hygiene. Solita was furious and asked him not to tell anyone that he had managed to build the first collective sewage disposal system for the lower part of Asia. And thanks to him, the concept of public health begins to take shape. Then he received a new title that gave him immunity to infectious diseases that were spreading in the district. Xavier asks him when he plans to leave for Namrin, when they were walking and saw a huge number of carts parked in front of Lloyd's mansion. Lloyd had a very ominous feeling, and soon the Earl tells him about the marriages that had recently been rejected all of whom had sent their daughters here because they thought he would change his mind if he saw them in person. The man made sure to give them a nice place to stay. He also made a symbolic card. Lloyd knew that he was very happy about it, and the Count told him that this was his age to see his grandchildren, and the whole continent was wondering if something had happened to his eldest son. Lloyd was depressed that the messenger was making fun of him. Lloyd waited in the room and thought, that it was not the women who liked him, but their parents, because the first lady was surprised to see a man next to her and immediately offered him her hand in marriage. But she must have mistaken Xavier for Lloyd and asks him why the servant is sitting on the couch. However, when Lloyd introduced himself, the girl was upset and ran away. Then a second lady entered the room and the same thing happened again 
and she ran away. Now a third lady entered the room, and Lloyd was shocked to see that it was Count Namarin Sillian's eldest daughter from the novel. She was Xavier's mistress, but sacrificed her life to protect the people of Namrun. She was complimenting, but Lloyd knew she was wrong again. She was embarrassed, because she knew the person sitting in front of her was Lloyd. They were both shocked, and she told him that she knew he was in a hurry because of work in the county. Then the girl got up and was about to leave, but Lloyd stopped her and asked if there was a sudden influx of people in the area or anything else. And she tells him that many refugees came to Nam Run because they lost their homes to monster attacks. Lloyd was excited and knew that soon a barrier would be deployed that would suck in all the refugees. Lloyd planned to take all the refugees to himself, but some refugees did come to Nam Run and knew that if San Navarro's plans went according to plan, thousands of Nam Run people would be sacrificed, and the night that would bring death would be hellish. He realized that he could prevent the destruction of the entire territory. Lloyd and Xavier were ready to go to Nemurin, and then Xavier with a full basket of letters, and asks Lloyd if he has received any of them, and Lloyd confirms his words. Xavier sits down on the ground and offers one letter to Lloyd, but he rejects it and asks him not to give it to him. Xavier was disappointed and upset when Lloyd left. As the men were riding to Namrin, Lloyd asked the princess if there was any trouble in the county and told her that there would be a big problem if they did not secure the edges of the kingdom with anchors. The princess thanked him and said he was on the spot. When they reached the kingdom, the princess introduces Mr. Conavaro to Lloyd and explains that he is the one who brought all the refugees and has been helping them since they were brought here. Lloyd notices the symbol on his shirt and is now ready to avenge the county at the Count's estate. The Count welcomes them, but he too confused Xavier with Lloyd, as he looked more like a king than Lloyd. Meanwhile, the princess told the Count that he was mistaken, that Xavier was the wrong one, and said that the one who was next to Xavier was Lloyd. She starts yelling at her father, and takes Lloyd's side. Xavier was embarrassed, but still starts teasing Lloyd when the princess tells the king why they're here. Lloyd was going to beat Xavier. But later that night, Lloyd tells Xavier about the demonic pattern he saw earlier on Conavaro's shoulder and asked him to gather evidence so he could prove that Conavaro was a bad man and save their county. Xavier looks strangely happy, and Lloyd asks him about it. Xavier tells him how hard it must be for him to be so ugly, and a fight breaks out between them the next day. Lloyd was sightseeing in Amorson County. He was shocked to see the same patent shirts being sold on the open market. Lloyd asked Xavier if he had found anything suspicious, but Xavier replied that he suspected the Conavaro because he had protected his home with an expensive magic castle. Xavier thought about destroying it, but he was afraid that he would be found out immediately, so he left it for now. Lloyd thinks about it, and thinks about stopping everything before the barrier is deployed, because he didn't know what kind of spell was being cast on the city, since nothing was said about it in the novel. Lloyd thinks that if he teaches Xavier to become a Grandmaster, he will become a being who can get rid of the barrier, and the Knight of Hell in an instant. But he realized that it would be impossible to teach him in such a short period of time. Xavier told him that he would soon do some research and find some clues about the Conavaro, and asked him to show some trust in him to build an anchor system in the Nanran Hills. Lloyd sends a messenger pigeon to Master Cordigius so that the work will be done faster, as Lloyd was going to check the details on the construction site. He heard about a beautiful woman in the distribution center, and hears praises about her body, and looks Lloyd thinks about her, but something is wrong as there was nothing about a beautiful girl, and now, he had suspicions, and decided to check it out himself. When he went further there was a huge line of people waiting to see her Lloyd breaks through and, surprised to see that Xavier was undercover dressed as a girl with long hair, he was disgusted by the way people commented on his body Xavier saw Lloyd from a distance, and was shocked. Lloyd used body language to show that he respected the servant's fetishes, 
and made fun of Xavier. Xavier tells him that he was undercover. However, Lloyd was still skeptical. But before he left, he told Xavier to do his job. When Connavaro was talking to someone in an encrypted way, which led Xavier to confirm his suspicions. Lloyd was at the site where he was supposed to set the anchors. He used his scouting skill and found a skull underground. He thought about it and searched the entire area and finds more skulls and starts digging them up. Cannavaro met with the cult members and told them that they would begin to execute the plan they had discussed. While Lloyd was examining the skull, he realized that without realizing it, the Count had successfully gotten himself into trouble. Lloyd used his absorption skill and cleared the mana from the skulls. When he picked up the skull a crystal fell out of it, he applied his scanning skill to it and was shocked because its price was higher than Sir Byron's annual fee and ran to collect the other crystals from the skulls. The man realized that he could hire 30 Byrons instead of just one to give his buyer a rest. After collecting all the crystals, he put them in a bag that was heavier than expected when he left the place. Then the man tries to talk to the skull and try to determine how he died. He bows and offers him his thanks for giving him Mr. Byron's wages. He picked them up and said he would provide them with a good place to rest. It is late at night and Xavier is trying to explain how he ended up in that dress. Lloyd interrupts him and said, that it's okay because everyone has their own preferences. But Xavier tries to explain to him that it's not. But Lloyd told him that it's okay. Xavier doesn't say anything. So Lloyd asks him how he knew about his new preferences. Xavier was agitated and yelled at him. But Lloyd continued to tease him. Xavier told Lloyd that there was another door under the mansion that led to a dungeon. Lloyd began to tease him for his new preferences which made him even angrier. Cannavaro was shocked when he heard the news that all the skulls were gone. Then everyone started to think that their plans had turned into ruins. Cannavaro stops them and said that he has a plan, and with a smile on his face, told them that the night of hell would come here as planned. The next day, Mrs. Xavier spills a bucket of water, and the owner asked her to go inside and dry off, because some guys were staring at her body. Then Ms. Xavier went into the Cannavaro house. The man changes his clothes and conceals his presence, then runs to a secret door and hides there while Cannavaro opens the door. Xavier analyzes the magic, because now he was going to open the door before he left here Lloyd was sitting with the crystals and was all pumped up to get more free money. Meanwhile, in the mansion, Cannavaro came out of the secret room where Xavier came from. He went to the door and repeated the same magic spell to open the door. He enters the room, and while walking down the hallway, he met a mutated orc. Xavier dodged his attack and responded with a mana strike, but was shocked and extremely shocked as it had no great effect on the orc. The orc launched another attack and successfully hit Xavier. Although he blocked the attack, he was forced to retreat. Soon many undead orcs appeared, then Xavier drew his daggers and was ready to take them on. Now his suspicions were confirmed, as many orcs appeared. At the same moment, Xavier saw a bald man spying on him. When he noticed Xavier, he quickly closed the door. Xavier bravely fought the monsters and killed all the orcs. When he kicked in the door, the bald man flew down and found himself on the ground wanting nothing but mercy, because Xavier had broken his leg. Xavier then asked him what a Cannavaro was, and the man replied that he had no idea what it was because he was just a hired undertaker, and the Cannavaro had ordered him to take care of the bodies in the medical room. Xavier asks him about the bodies, and finds out that all the refugees died of disease, so Xavier breaks his other leg and is going to report it to Lloyd. When Xavier reaches the master's room, Lloyd is not there, so he decides to save Cannavaro first and rushes to the morgue to find the culprits. Xavier appears out of the blue and pulls out his aura sword. He was confused because there were no people in there anymore. He realized that it had already started. Meanwhile, purple clouds spread all over the state of Nimrin and Xavier felt a huge pressure, 
as if something was sucking his mana dry, he ran outside and saw that the barrier had already been deployed and everyone who was outside was being sucked out of mana. Xavier was furious and decided to find Lloyd quickly. At the Count's manor, all the men were lying on the ground because of lack of mana, and the princess rushed to meet them, wearing a strange necklace that somehow made her immune to the barrier. Then the dark wizard, who was all pumped up and had an evil smile, thought that they would soon conquer the world and out of nowhere Lloyd intervened and asked him what he was doing there, because there were more than thirty people around him casting some spells on the darkness. Lloyd was very angry and asked him again. Lloyd told the magician that he would leave because he would not talk to him, but the young frontier had some other plan in mind. Lloyd made a powerful swing with his shovel and hit the magician right in the face and was surprised as his shovel was mangled. The magician with a grim smile on his face said that he had some kind of protective spell cast on him. Then Lloyd swung the shovel again with all his mana, and this time he did some damage to the villain, but it was not enough. Lloyd saw that the magician was still in pain, so he calmed down despite the fact that everything was not going according to plan. The man wanted to try to absorb the mana from the brooch the magician was wearing, but he was unable to do so because of another type of defense spell. The mage was smiling slyly, and the smile on his face was extremely annoying to Lloyd, so he asked him if he could move because it would break the barrier or something, which changed his smile to a grim expression that confirmed his suspicion. After all, in the city hall of Nasaran, inside the barrier, the Conavaro freely passed by exhausted people who asked him for help. At the same moment, one man stopped Conavaro by taking his leg and begging for help. But he just looked down at the man lying there and kicked him in the face, calling him a slug. Conavaro, on the other hand, went to the statue of the fallen angel to begin the ritual. The man took a drop of red liquid from his finger to summon the Prince of Hell. Meanwhile, Lloyd was digging something in front of the magician and was about to execute his plan. Then in an instant the entire ground under the dark magician was done, except for a small piece where the magician stood motionless. The magician was embarrassed and did not understand what was going to happen next. Lloyd said that all the preparations were completed. Then standing next to the magician, he activated his sinister mode, looked at the magician and stood right next to him. Lloyd opened his mouth to take in plenty of air, and in a moment he blew into his ear, which made the magician feel sick, and the ground under his feet began to collapse, causing him to fall to the ground. As a result, his crystal began to shine brightly, and soon it lost its magic, making the magician unconscious. Lloyd picked up the crystal and examined it carefully. He realized that the crystal had done this because the wizard had moved. Lloyd looked at the city to make sure that the barrier was solid at first, and then lowered on one side, which made him confident in his theory. Lloyd was overjoyed to see that it had worked. Cannavaro looked to the side in surprise, and noticed a breach in the barrier wall. Lloyd stood proudly on the defeated magician holding the crystal in his hand. Cannavaro couldn't believe it, but he still continued the spell to summon the Hell Prince. Sitting on the floor in front of the statue, he continued to chant his magic words. But suddenly his session was soon interrupted by the princess. The angry girl asked him what the hell he was doing. The man couldn't understand how she was moving freely inside his barrier, but in a moment he noticed a necklace with the same crystal that made her resilient before. Then he decided to retaliate by launching an explosive mana attack at her but unexpectedly the princess was able to block and absorb it. Cannavaro was shocked by what he saw. In an instant, the girl concentrated all her mana into making a huge spear of mana using the fire punishment technique to attack him. A huge stream of orange flames was heading towards Cannavaro at the speed of light. The man did not understand how such a young girl had mastered imperial-level magic. The powerful blow left him with a huge amount of damage and later the princess came up to him and asked what he was doing there. Kanawaro was disfigured but still completed his spell 
and loudly asked that the Prince of Hell come to save him. At the same moment, the statue of the fallen angel began to crack, and a magical glow began to pour from its cracks. The princess was shocked to hear this. Then the crazy Cannavaro was about to attack her with a dagger, but Xavier appeared from the ceiling and made a powerful swing and cut off his arm with one precise blow to save the princess. Cannavaro was terrified. His face was full of uncontrollable terror. His arm flew to the side. Xavier was about to strike him again, but Cannavaro tried to stop him with his magic shield. But all he managed to do was twist his arm. Suddenly, the ground shook and the statue radiated light from its cracks. Xavier watched in horror. Suddenly, a large red lightning bolt appeared in the purple sky, pierced the roof of the palace and hit the statue, destroying it completely. The fragments of the statue scattered powerfully across the palace and when they were about to fall on civilians, they were immediately blocked by the princess with her earthly shield. A magical wall appeared between the stones and the frightened people. They all covered their heads with their hands to protect themselves and their loved ones from a possible collision. Xavier stood with his sword in front of Canavaro, who announced that he had won and now they would all be doomed to die. The smoke cleared, and the monstrous metal arm of the Hell's Prince appeared and the floor broke under the weight of it. In his hand was a red magic sword. Cannavaro and Xavier looked at it in horror. In a moment, sparks of rage flew from the eyes of the great metal knight. Cannavaro could not understand where his hellish prince had gone, and he was without legs. Cannavaro found out that the barrier was completely removed before he could complete the ritual because he didn't think he was prepared enough. Xavier looked at the Hell's Prince with horror and wondered if he could overcome him. After that, the Hell Prince asked Cannavaro what he wanted, and Cannavaro pointed his finger at Xavier and ordered him to destroy him. Then the Hellish Prince rushed to destroy Xavier and swung his huge sword at him. Xavier was prepared so he was able to block the attack, but the enormous pressure from the attack was too much for him to bear. In a moment, the Hell Prince teleported behind Xavier's back and was about to strike one last blow, but he was prevented by Princess Yaka, who attacked him using the Wind Dagger, and as a result, Xavier was able to dodge the attack. The Hell Prince was angry with the Princess for preventing him from doing what he wanted and attacked the woman to destroy her. Xavier used his Aura Blast to attack the Hell Knight and managed to decapitate him, and his body flew away. Xavier continued to stand at the ready waiting for what would happen next. And soon the body of the metal knight turned into ashes. Cannavaro did not believe it, because it was impossible in his opinion. It was then that Xavier pointed his sword at Cannavaro and thanked the princess for her help. All the people started to wake up and carry each other to a safe place. Xavier told Cannavaro that they would have to talk about the details in the palace but in any case, he would have to be punished. Cannavaro was tense, but soon an evil smile appeared on his face. Xavier was confused, because the man told him that Xavier knew nothing about this creature. And when the man looked back, he was horrified to see the Prince of Hell rising from the ashes, and he was ready to continue the battle. Cannavaro explained to him that his mortal attacks were not enough to destroy the Hell Knight, because he was immortal. Then the Dark Knight told Xavier that he did not expect such strength from him and apologized for underestimating him. He told Xavier that he was Xyrencius, the first commander of the Legion, who serves the Lord of Hell and announced that this would be his last battle. Xavier introduced himself and said that he would soon send him back to where he was. The Hell Prince rushed towards Gabriel and attacked him. Xavier had a hard time fighting off the attacks and was soon cornered by the infernal creature. Xavier dodged another attack, but soon the Hell Prince appeared behind him and Xavier blocked an attack that hit the Hell Knight. Xavier dodged all the attacks and was about to attack him which forced him to teleport. Unable to keep up with his opponent's teleportation skill, he continued to bravely resist him. Xavier waited for him to return, and soon the Knight attacked him again. He realized that the infernal Knight was just swinging his sword from side to side. Xavier was at the end of his rope 
and realized that he needed to rest for a new attack. Xavier managed to repel the attack, but the evil creature did not leave him alone. Then he was going to counterattack the knight thinking that if he had two legs, he would move differently. But since he was moving only through the air, he had only one way out. At the same moment, Xavier swung a powerful punch across the floor, demolishing all the tiles under him. Since the knight teleported back to the Savior, it was left to prepare for his appearance from any direction. Just then Xavier noticed that the knight's sword appeared from the ground. The man wanted to strike him with his aura sword, but the Hell Prince grabbed his leg and threw him to the ground. As he fell, Xavier tried to gather his mana to strengthen his body. His opponent's anti-mana blocked his own mana. The force of the blow caused Xavier to break the tiles in the palace hall. This caused Xavier to scream in pain. Then the Infernal Knight threw him to the ground again. As a result, Xavier was severely injured, and the Hell Knight thanked him for fighting so well. The Knight was about to deliver the final blow, but he did not have time, because Lloyd distracted him by telling him that he would return to Hell when the Summoner died and ordered him to leave Xavier alone. The Prince of Hell was confused and scared because Lloyd had a very scary face. Lloyd started to count, but the Hell King attacked him. Lloyd managed to avoid the attack, but Connavaro was severely wounded. Then the Hell Knight told him that it would be just fine if he was still breathing. Lloyd was confused as his plan had failed miserably. Xavier stood up and was about to attack the Hell Knight from behind but he forced him to retreat. Xavier was all exhausted and lying on the ground, and meanwhile Lloyd was yelling at the Hell Knight and asking him to fight him instead and ordered Xavier to keep his head down. However, he ignored him. Lloyd was frustrated and launched a mana blast at the creature, but his attack was easily deflected by the Hell Knight and said back to him, the Hell Prince was just about to attack Xavier, but Lloyd intervened in the battle by jumping on his back. Lloyd was able to reach him. Then the Hell Knight told him that he was a fool for touching him like mana, because the mana from Hell had polluted his heart, and he would soon die from it. Lloyd told him that dying was indeed a terrible thing, but he had already purified the black mana many times. The Hell Knight was scared when Lloyd laughed at him, and the messenger told him that the mana that flowed from the Hell Prince strengthened his heart, but still, he would not be an equal opponent to the Hell Knight, and the Hell Knight would not ignore him because he considered him a threat to himself. Lloyd locks him up, but the Hell Knight had other plans. He pierced his own body to get rid of him, but luckily Lloyd was able to dodge the attack and mocked him. The Hell Knight was annoyed by this and tried to take him down. Soon, Xavier was back on his feet and ready to attack the confused Hell Knight, who tried to block the attack, but was hit in the stomach. Xavier tries to hit him again, but he started to teleport quickly and dodge all the attacks. The Hell Prince was frustrated because Lloyd was still clinging to him even when he teleported Lloyd because he knew that Xavier was moving faster than before, but he also could not match the mobility of the Hell Knight. He knew he was going to lose when a messenger appeared out of nowhere, with a suggestion to activate the messenger contract, which confused him even more. He that from now on the system could give advice to a person personally, and the system. Xavier had a hard time keeping up with the teleportation that Lloyd was doing. Lloyd held onto his back, and out of the blue started singing a song that made the Hell Knight think it was some kind of ancient magic, as he felt like someone was scratching his brain with an iron nail. Lloyd continued to sing the song, and the Hell Prince tried his best to take Lloyd away from Lloyd's signal Xavier to attack, but Xavier cannot stand his singing. Soon Lloyd guesses it, and finally realizes that his parents forbade him to sing in front of others. Because one day in music class, he sang only the beginning of a song, but before he finished the next line, the teacher picked up the organ and threw it at him, and when he tried to sing at Christmas in church, the pastor poured holy water on him and told his parents that he was possessed by evil, and now he was using his terrible singing to save the world. The Hell Prince was frightened by his singing and fell to the ground. Xavier used his mana to not hear or see the last blow. Lloyd was happy 
that they got rid of him. But Xavier told him that it was not over. Xavier asked him to look closely at the person around them, because he noticed a dark man near them. And when he asks Lloyd to go back, the man told him that it was not over. However, Lloyd told him that it was okay because he would not survive. Lloyd starts to move towards the night of hell and Xavier tries to stop him. Lloyd bets that if the knight survives, then Lloyd will become his subordinate for a year, and if he does not survive, then Xavier will have to disguise himself as Mrs. Xavier when they return to the county. Lloyd then picked up his shovel and attacked with all his mana. Afterwards, the man lay on the ground drained of mana, as he used his ability to absorb dark mana. As he was absorbing the mana, the Hell Prince told him that it was too much for his body, and he would die from overload. Soon Lloyd started coughing up red liquid because the mana was too much for him, but he still pushed his body to win the battle. Xavier and the princess began to drain their mana so that he would survive. I in the darkness, the princess used a healing spell, and because of this, Lloyd is sure that this time he will finally defeat everyone. When the dark mana was absorbed and purified by him, he announced that the exorcism was complete. And when he fell to the ground, the princess began to worry about him. But Xavier assured her that he always ends up like this, but he will be fine. Meanwhile, the messenger informs Lloyd that he has defeated the main commander of the Legion of Hell. Because of this, the King of Hell is looking for him. When it was already night outside, Cadavaro was arrested and taken to prison, and the rest of his sentence was to be handed down by the queen herself. But the bigger problem was that the construction couldn't move forward because all the workers had lost their strength because of the barrier, and Lloyd was stressed out trying to find another way to continue building. Then he remembered that earlier, when he woke up, the messenger told him that he had absorbed some of the power of the Hell Knight, so his skill of dominating evil spirits had improved. Lloyd was excited because he knew that if he used the evil spirits, he could gain full control over them and that would be the jackpot because it would be more economical and efficient for the county. At the same moment, the messenger told him that he had gotten a new skill as a horrible singer, but the Lord needed something cool, something like the power of hell, and then he struck a cool pose in front of the mirror. Suddenly out of nowhere there was a knock on the door. When Lloyd opens the door, there are a huge number of magical skeletons without heads standing in front of him. Lloyd asked them who they were, and they started to perform an ugly transformation in a moment that disgusted Lloyd. All these ugly creatures apologized and used a poster to communicate with him, which said that they were people who had been killed by the Conavaro, and they were wandering around the city when they suddenly felt a power that could give them physical form, and the beings who came here thanked Lloyd for calming their vengeful souls, which shocked him to no end. And they also came to learn that Lloyd had buried all the skulls he had found and prayed for their peace. They also told Lloyd that they had no memories of their past lives and no goals, and if they wandered in the open world, they would be cast out, and eventually all the dead bowed down before him and begged him to take them in and give them a chance to pay their debt to the man. Lloyd told them that there would be a lot of work to do, and when asked how much money they would need, the dead man replied that he did not need a salary or food, because that is not what such creatures are for, since there is no use for them in such things, and only required a place to live a cubic meter coffin. Lloyd was drugged and announced that from now on the undead would be called the Frontera County Skeleton Squad, and was truly happy, because his dream of free labor had finally come true. Xavier woke up from the chaos and saw the dead, but now, he didn't care because it was too much for him to handle right now, so he went back to sleep. The next day, Frontera's skeleton squad worked tirelessly. Dodd Lloyd enjoyed this scene as all the work was done without any pay, and Count Namarin fainted when he saw the dead working for Lloyd. Lloyd explained to the Count that he was a spellcasting genius and summoned all the creatures with his brilliant eye, and the Count was extremely surprised by this. Soon winter came, and the construction continued without a single break. Xavier carefully examined his hand and remembered how the princess helped him get out. And then the princess appeared out of nowhere. 
Xavier thought she wanted a project report, but the princess told him that she was there to meet him and told him that she wanted him to teach her how to use the princess's hand, how the princess died in the novel also no one helped Xavier because everyone thought he cursed mana, and if they helped him, they would end up like him too. If he helped him, they would end up like the princess and other people close to him. But he changed everything, and now Xavier was happier than ever which made Lloyd proud of himself. After a few days, the construction was finally completed, and as promised, the Count paid ten times the cost of construction Lloyd thanked the Count before leaving, and everyone praised Lloyd for his bravery Lloyd the Count asked Lloyd if he will be his son-in-law and inherit the Namron Lloyd rejects his offer and told him that he is the heir to the Frontera estate Lloyd refuses the offer and assures him that the Namron has his great heir. As Lloyd is leaving the state, he asks Xavier if he wants to stay here. Xavier told him that he was a knight of Frontera Manor for the rest of his life and would never leave it, and they set off for Frontera Manor when they arrived at the manor the Count and Countess were there to greet them. When Lloyd tried to explain to them about the creatures, the Count saw Xavier's outfit in the form of Miss Xaviera because he had lost a bet, but they were not interested in that. The Count hugged Xavier and comforted him that he had not made a mistake and they would always love him as they did before. Xavier was having a hard time, and Lloyd was enjoying the scene from behind, because now Lloyd had all the cash he needed to just lie around and enjoy his lazy rich life. Suddenly, a royal messenger appears and announces that Lloyd must go to Asfahan on a special mission. Lloyd was shocked by this visit. The envoy also said that they were leaving right now, and Lloyd had been kidnapped by the royal guard and sent on a mission without his will by the envoy. Lloyd was crying like a baby, and Xavier was trying to comfort him night standing in front of him. He asked Lloyd why he was so upset, because he should have been happy to be appointed to this honorable mission, to which Her Highness Lloyd replied that he could not hold back his tears because he was very happy and then Lloyd began to cry even more irritated him. A few days earlier, the knight had asked the queen why she had chosen Lloyd to be the envoy, and the queen told him that he had been appointed a diplomat and said that she was sure Lloyd would easily handle Asfahan, but he would make a lot of noise and cry, but he would make a lot of noise and cry because he dreamed of a peaceful life in the village. And she also knew that Lloyd was the one who had won the night of hell she told him to be calm, because Lloyd would get what he wanted. Lloyd was in tears, which made the knight question the queen's decision after a few days they finally reached the country of Asfahan, where at the royal court the soldiers inform the sultan of their arrival, and he orders them to give the guests all the hospitality they deserve. The sultan was furious that the guards had treated them improperly. The knight wanted to meet with the sultan as soon as possible, but was refused because the sultan was very busy and told him that they would have to wait for more than six months. The knight was very angry now. The guard dropped something for which they could have gotten everything for free in Asfahan and walked away. The knight was angry and decided to take revenge. He told the royal messenger that they would have to send a letter to the king. At night, the royal messenger asked him if he had seen Lloyd anywhere. But the knight ignored the question, and soon they disappeared. At night the poor boy was selling torches in the kingdom, but he could not sell any that day a stranger came up to the poor boy and asked him if he was looking for a place to sleep for the night, and it turned out that it was Lloyd. Lloyd was standing in front of the most expensive hotel in the capital and told the boy that this was his hotel, but he had nothing to pay for the night there. Then Lloyd asked the boy to sign a contract and then the whole hotel would belong to him. The boy got scared and asked Lloyd who he was. And Lloyd with an angry face told him that he was a man with the grave of the almighty Samarkand. While pointing to the parish cemetery Lloyd found himself in a very expensive restaurant, he announced that he was going to feed all the people in the neighborhood and once again showed the pedestra. Later on he was in a silk shop where he asked the owner to give him the best silk he had and get everything from it. While showing him the Padishar again, he was in a port and asked the owner to give him all the ships they had as he was going to buy them all. As soon as he bought all the ships, 
he sent them to Frontera's estate, and soon merchants from all over the county came to him. And every merchant in the city came to him and asked him to buy everything they had, and so Lloyd bought everything with the mercy of a Samarcandite. However, when he was about to buy even more goods, a royal soldier came to arrest him at the royal court. Soon Lloyd and Xavier were presented to the sultan. The sultan was angry with Lloyd and asked him if he had spent their entire annual budget. Lloyd introduced himself to the sultan, and he recognized him with an angry look because he was the one who turned over the monster's dominoes and found out that he had spent all the money just to meet him. Then he got angry because he knew that he had to stop the coming war, because when the war started, the first obstacle he would face would be their estate, and even if he wanted to destroy Frontera County with all the forces of the kingdom, his victory was still not guaranteed, so he thought about destroying it right then, but Xavier could just blow up the entire capital if he laid a finger on it. Lloyd knew this, so he smiled at the sultan, and Samarkand had no choice but to negotiate. Samarkand was furious with Lloyd's rudeness, because he felt threatened by this man. So the sultan was silent for a moment looking at the bound men, and then sighed heavily, and ordered his soldiers to release them. This was Lloyd's first victory. Afterwards, the sultan asked him if he enjoyed using the padishir for his own pleasure. And Lloyd raised his hands in the air, and knelt before him, and began to praise the sultan for being able to use the padishar. The sultan was even more angry, but embarrassed because he sensed his sincerity. Lloyd said that he was sincerely grateful for the opportunity. After all, it allowed him to imagine that the president had given him his card at his whim. Because for Lloyd, there was nothing better than a pile of money and jewelry to stand on. The sultan asked him if he was not afraid of suspicion from the Magentano, because he had taken on a very responsible national mission. And this surprised the sultan because of his arrogance in this matter. Lloyd was not afraid of suspicion on the part of the Magentano, because he willingly accepted the favor of the ruler of a hostile country, and that he had no problem because the money the sultan gave him was not comparable to the queen's money. Then the sultan irritably asked him if he gave him enough money, would he not go over to the enemy and betray the queen, to which Lloyd shamelessly agreed. However, Lloyd added that the temptation of money might call into question his loyalty to the sultan. At first the sultan looked at the men kneeling before him with a fearsome look, but after a moment he laughed out loud for the whole room. The sultan said he was ready to listen to Lloyd because he liked his character. Lloyd gave the sultan a sly look and considered this his second victory. Later, Lloyd asked him if he wanted war, and he said he did. And then Lloyd told him that perhaps he wanted to remove the overseas rebel forces whose strength had increased with the onset of the drought. After all, he could put an end to it. Lloyd told him that he would end the drought if he wanted to, and in return, he could talk to the special representative of the Magentano. The sultan was surprised and asked Lloyd to tell him the details. Lloyd gave him the contract, and it meant that he had one for the third time. Lloyd laughed at the sultan and told Xavier how he signed the contract. Xavier was amazed because Lloyd was the first person to ever cheat the sultan of such a sum. However, Lloyd said that it was much cheaper than a possible war. After all, Asfahan's territories were suffering greatly from drought, and the Samarkand did little to solve this problem. At night, Samarkand met with one of his daughters, Saratsit, and ordered her to accompany Lloyd, as he was leaving for Kandahar province soon and said that she should make him her husband at any cost. The next day, Saratsa asked Lloyd to let her join him, as she had been appointed his escort. Lloyd told her that he already had a knight, but she insisted on going with him. Then Lloyd remembered that she was the princess of Asfahan, but didn't understand why she was appointed as his bodyguard, and out of nowhere she struck a stylish pose that shocked Lloyd as it was unexpected for her. But then he finds out that her father was behind it all Lloyd had a plan to solve the drought problem. By building a Persian-style underground waterway Lloyd knew that there was a fresh water source in the mountains ten kilometers away from the city, and thought to use it soon they. 
reached the capital city of Kandahar Lloyd was tired from the journey, and finally decided to rest. But the princess would not leave him alone and continued to strike a stylish pose. Lloyd woke up and asked her what her problem was. She told him she was just trying to take care of him. Lloyd recalled the novel and realized that she was the youngest of the four Saratza desert princesses, a prominent prosecutor who had reached the level of a master fencer at a young age. At a young age, she never appeared in public, so people did not recognize her Lloyd now pretends not to know who she is and also has to somehow stop her seductive operations Lloyd asks her to rest in his room, but she refuses because she is ordered to be his escort and she will accompany him day and night, she will be with him day and night Lloyd told her that she does not need to accompany him because he has his own escort. He had his own knight escort, who was a highly skilled swordsman, who was much stronger than her Lloyd starts bragging about his strength, which humiliated her Sarazai got angry with him, and Lloyd taunted her, and asked her to kill him Xavier was disgusted by his behavior, as well as Sarazide Sarazide was so angry that she punched him right in the face Lloyd asked Xavier to save him. Xavier did save him, but it seemed that Xavier was really enjoying the sight. The princess was deeply offended and cursed him before leaving the room, and finally Lloyd announced that the mission was successful. Lloyd was angry with Xavier because he did not help him. Xavier apologized and told him that he thought he was having fun when he was being beaten by Sari Sid, so he did not interfere the next day. The next day, Lloyd and Xavier were going to prepare for a construction project, but were interrupted by Lloyd telling her that he could not afford to bring her with him because she would be in the way. Sarisa still insisted on accompanying him, but Lloyd humiliated her and mocked her for not being a sword master. Sarisa was angry and wanted to hit Lloyd, but he started singing the Star Spangled Banner. He sang to lull Xavier to sleep, and she fell to the ground in a deep sleep. When they left the palace, all the villagers saw them with sly eyes. Lloyd knew he had to do something to gain the support of the villagers if he wanted to keep the construction going. Lloyd calls everyone to a meeting and orders Xavier and Padong to build a fountain in the center of town, and ordered Goming and Bubin to go with him one kilometer west to the glaciers. When they reached their destination, Hippo drank a lot of water, and when they returned to town Padong finished the construction, Goming carried it back to Hippo poured water into the well. Then the villagers were very happy to see the water, and ran to get water. Lloyd came up to them, asked if they were happy, and announced that they were free to thank him, because he was the one who had built it all. The villagers were still skeptical of him, because he was a stranger, and so they started throwing stones at him. Lloyd dodged all the stones, and continued to show off. As Lloyd passed through the village, he noticed that there were many stubborn people who refused to even touch the water the well was filled again by Lloyd, and as the villagers said, Lloyd came out of nowhere again trying to gain their acceptance, but the villagers, still skeptical, started throwing stones at him. At night one of the families, who refused to touch the water, but now they were happy to drink it, when suddenly out of nowhere Lloyd appears and starts advertising himself which scared them and soon Lloyd reached everyone who used the water and started advertising himself the next day it seemed that everyone was hypnotized and followed Lloyd. Xavier was disgusted by this, and Lloyd told him that it was a continuous imprinting effect, and now he was a good guy to people. Lloyd tells Xavier a bad joke, but he could not understand it, which made Lloyd depressed, but now is not the time to be sad, because he managed to win people's trust. Lloyd asks everyone to line up as he was looking for workers to complete the construction of the underground waterway. One of them asks Lloyd if he will provide them with food. Lloyd tells him not to worry and shows him that his padishar in the royal capital of Samarkand was having a hard time, as the purchases Lloyd made with the padishar would soon exceed the funds in the royal treasury itself later. Lloyd and Xavier tried to scan and find underground tunnels that the rebels were using to escape oppression the rebels were using to escape oppression Lloyd knew he could use these tunnels and turn them into water tunnels since digging 35 kilometers for the waterway would be too much 
but he couldn't find them today and went back to the hotel since he had something planned in his head. At the hotel, Saratsit and Xavier were arguing since Xavier wouldn't let her into Lloyd's room. Saratsit was worried about Lloyd because he wanted to be alone today, because there were forces preparing an uprising in this country, and it was dangerous to leave Lloyd unguarded inside. Lloyd waited patiently for someone, and soon his guests came to him. Saratsit pulled out her sword and ordered Xavier to stand aside, but he refused to go against his master's order. She had no choice but to break through. But all her attacks were useless because Xavier was able to block all her attacks, and so he warned her not to raise her mana by force, because her body cannot handle this type of mana, and told her how to do it properly. But she was not in the mood to listen to his teachings, and continued her attacks somewhere in the kingdom of Asfahan. The rebels captured Lloyd and interrogated him about what he planned to do to their kingdom, but instead of answering Lloyd started laughing which confused everyone. And then they decided to reveal him, but when they opened his face, everyone had a strange look on their face Lloyd told him in a joyful tone that they were all hostages, not him. And before he was to reveal his true intentions, they had to first find out how he got there Lloyd asks the leader to untie him because his wrists hurt, but he denies it, and asks not even Lloyd assured him that if he tried to escape, he would be instantly beheaded because he was against the elite forces that had rebelled against Samarkand. The leader asks Lloyd because he was very calm, as if he knew he would be kidnapped Lloyd agrees with a smiling face. Moreover, Lloyd knew from the novel that the rebel leader, Thurms, would soon die which would be the impetus to trigger the great rebellion the firm stared at him for a while, and told his men to untie him Thurms had a soft spot for Lloyd, as his daughter was on the verge of death due to dehydration, but was saved when Lloyd built a well, which quenched the thirst of many people who were on the verge of death, and they untied Lloyd, but Thurms was still skeptical of him, and told him not to do anything funny because his men would kill him instantly Lloyd was really drugged to fool him and made a greedy face that made the rebels feel afraid and were about to attack him, but stopped when Lloyd hit him. They stopped when Lloyd stood in a pose and started telling them about the adventures he had in the past. He told them how he saved the Frontera estate, which was on the verge of bankruptcy because of a huge loan, and how he saved the Frontera estate from the Domino monsters, and how he saved the port of Cremo from the giant lobster. Then all of their attention was on his stories. The rebels were completely engrossed in his stories and started enjoying them with their popcorn. The firms noticed that Lloyd was trying to distract them. So he stood up and started shouting at him. Because of this, the other rebels were excited and told him to sit and listen to the story. Soon the next day came and we saw Lloyd saying, I'm going somewhere. Terme was confused because he didn't know where they were going. Lloyd told him, that they were going to meet the queen he explained to him that he would ensure his safety from the emperor and give him a safe place to stay where he could stay with his people. But in return, he had to lend him his secret tunnels. I in the royal capital the queen was just interrogating the evil wizard Conavaro, who told her that someone named Targa was behind it all. He was supposed to die because of the true spells cast on him. It was then that the royal messenger told the queen that Lloyd was waiting for her. The queen was surprised because Lloyd was supposed to be in Asfahan at the royal court Lloyd, and the conditions were before the queen. The queen accepts Lloyd's offer, and said she was ready to sign a letter granting asylum to the rebels and their families. Lloyd thanks the queen, but Thurms was confused as Lloyd was able to convince the queen easily. The woman instead told Lloyd that she was quite satisfied that he was following orders properly, and made an evil face, and told him that she would see to it that those who were able to work until everything was burned so that people could live in peace Lloyd was disturbed and surprised. And because of this, the queen told him about the interrogation of the Conavaro, and said that she would soon need Lloyd for this case. Lloyd was depressed by this, and was ready to cry but still he had to agree with the queen. The woman then asked Lloyd if he was a selfish and cheap guy. Lloyd was stunned as the queen stood up and walked towards him. The queen at that instant grabbed Lloyd and stared at him, 
and now Lloyd knew that the biggest obstacle in his lazy life was standing in front of him here in Asfahan. Xavier and Saratsid were so tired of fighting with each other that they fell asleep. Suddenly, Saratsid came to her senses and started fighting again, but Xavier was able to easily block all her attacks, and it seemed that he was a little bored in his case. Saratsid was able to summon an aura sword that shocked Xavier, and at the same moment, she launched a fierce attack on Xavier, who eventually blocked her again. However, then he too summoned his aura sword. Saratsid continued to swing the sword and Xavier also became more serious, but still he knew that her aura sword was still not stable. Saratsid started to attack him again, but suddenly the door opened and Lloyd returned. Xavier barely had time to dodge the attack, but because of the tremendous pressure of the sword aura, Lloyd was stripped naked. Lloyd was confused for a while. Xavier was angry with Lloyd. Because this attack, Saratsev realized that Lloyd was back and started asking questions. But Lloyd didn't want to answer because he didn't have time. So he started singing a lullaby. Saratsev tried to resist, but she fell to the ground and quickly fell asleep. Lloyd was ready for Lloyd was ready for construction and asked Xavier if he was ready. But when he returned, Xavier was also sound asleep and it was the beginning of a new project. Step one was to go around the underground tunnel, which was like a maze. Step two was to confirm the location that would need to be opened or blocked for a direct waterway. Step three was that during the day, they had to block off paths other than their waterway route, and at night Xavier had to use controlled explosions to make the blocks. And for step number four, Lloyd invited the skeletons into the core of the Frontera Kingdom as they were to be the main key to completing the construction. Then Lloyd took them to the construction site and explained to them that since there was a large amount of water just on the other side of the wall, if they dug any further, there was a chance that they would be instantly washed away due to the enormous water pressure. He told them how in the old days people risked their lives to build such waterways. Then the oldest among the workers would give his life when he finished laying the waterway for the sake of his neighbors and their descendants who would continue to live, he told them that there was no sacrifice more noble than this, and pointed his finger at the one and only thinker who had been chosen by him to do such a noble deed. He was devastated to hear this, but when Lloyd looked at him with a look of superiority, they realized that he was serious. Lloyd was more serious than ever for this Lloyd the handsome man with the pickaxe and ran away from him. He told him that he would go down in history for his great deed, but Toros was too scared for that, so he too started running away with Lloyd and asked Lloyd if an army of ghost skeletons could do it. Lloyd cursed at him because he wanted the undead to feel peace again. Thordis was really depressed about this and asked him if Xavier could do it, but Lloyd refused because Xavier only had one pair of clothes and he couldn't afford to get them wet in hell. Hell King Helkeros truly enjoyed this scene, and was looking forward to what great feat Lloyd would achieve in the future here in Kandar. After much debate, the leader of the ghostly skeleton worker squad set about completing the job. Lloyd was disappointed, because he wanted him to use a pickaxe. The reservoir opened, and a huge stream under great pressure rushed to the surface, the water reached the civilization in which everyone was. People were just celebrating when an endless stream of water rushed over them. And then a little girl with a bowl full of water ran to Lloyd and offered him a drink of water. Lloyd thanked her for her kindness and said that he would definitely enjoy it. But the child had doubts, and she asked Lloyd why he was wearing no shirt. Lloyd smiled and told her that he didn't want to spend money on clothes. After the opening of the central waterway in Kandura, they connected the waterways to all the small villages and hamlets nearby. And finally their great journey was coming to an end. The messenger told Lloyd that he had unlocked a new title that would give him 100% dehydration resistance in all desert regions. But he was disappointed because he wouldn't need such an advantage since he had completed his work and would now just be idle. At the same time, Terms approached Lloyd, and Lloyd asked Terms if he was preparing for a long journey from nowhere, and Terms bowed and thanked him for saving him and his men. Terms, 
and all his comrades swore allegiance to the Frontera family for the rest of their lives. And a messenger told Lloyd that their favor had increased, and as a result he had received RP. Lloyd made a strange expression on his face, and said he was very happy with the RP points he received, and soon terms, and his group finally went to the Frontera estate under the leadership of a skeleton squad. As it seemed everything seemed to be resolved peacefully, but soon they were both summoned to the royal court in Asfahan, where Sultan Samarkand offered Lloyd to join the kingdom, but Lloyd replied to him with strange excuses. Samarkand knew that Lloyd had noticed that Saratza was his daughter, and so he asked if she was his daughter, and if he would marry her. Lloyd refused because he believed that Saratza's opinion was more important than his own. And the Sultan knew that Saratzid hated Lloyd and would never want to marry such a man. Nevertheless, the Sultan thanked Lloyd for his help in the uprising and, as promised, he would now meet with the Magentano envoy. Lloyd thanked the Sultan for his kindness and left the courtroom. But Samarkand had other plans, as he would never leave Lloyd, and soon he wanted to make him part of the kingdom. Soon the Sultan organized a round table conference. In the kingdom, the knight was nervous as he finally found himself in front of the sultan who started a conversation and apologized for the damage done to the kingdom of Magentano because of his mistake and was willing to pay double for all the damage caused by the incident. The knight was tense as he knew that the sultan was going to demand something unexpected from him. The knight expressed his gratitude to the sultan and said that he would pass his message to the queen. But the sultan stopped him in his tracks and continued his story saying that in exchange for this he wanted them to give them Lloyd Frontera. Later that day the knight went to Lloyd and told him everything. The knight was depressing as he told him everything and it seemed that the offer was accepted by him. Lloyd made an unpleasant face which made the knight panic and start to make excuses. However Lloyd stopped him and told him that he had done a great thing by accepting the offer and made another stunning expression. At the royal court, the sultan came up with new ideas about what he should ask Lloyd to do, but he was soon interrupted by a royal messenger who told him that Lloyd was rampaging through the desert, killing sandworms right on the outskirts, in a place that was relatively small for hunting. Since Lloyd had caught one, he pulled out a shovel and attacked it with all his might, but it wasn't enough. So he asked the pond hamster to attack, and the hamster tried to nail it, but still it wasn't enough. So Lloyd asked Xavier to finish it. Then Xavier pulled out his aura sword and launched another fierce attack, but the little sandwich was still alive. So Lloyd maniacally used even more firepower and attacked him. The Sultan was watching this scene, and soon Lloyd noticed him and made a happy face. After finishing his work in the royal estate, the Sultan analyzed the situation and knew that sooner or later the whole country would become a battlefield if he kept Lloyd around. But he knew he couldn't break the contract, and he finally realized that it was all planned, and he had been robbed of everything from the beginning. Then out of nowhere a royal knight appeared and told the Sultan that Lloyd had taken his last shower and left the palace, but the Sultan expected this to happen. Soon another servant appeared and told the Sultan that Saratzid had run away, leaving a letter saying that she had much to learn from Lloyd. This was all very unexpected and fast for the Sultan, so he began to beat his head on the table and cry from the loss. The servants ran to him and tried to calm the grieving Sultan. Samarkand cried bitterly, calling Lloyd a scoundrel. On the next sunny morning of the Frontera estate, the Baron and Baroness woke up happily to see another peaceful morning in their estate. Although it was a little strange for the baron to hear the cries of a bee instead of the cries of a rooster, they were happy here. Suddenly the maid came running into their room and told the baron that they had received a letter from young Julian. Opening the letter, Arcus read that Julian had become the second best student in his class and that he would soon be working in the capital. Therefore, he plans to return to the estate soon to stay with them before he receives an official invitation. Julian also noticed that he missed them and his brother, whom he wants to be like. The Baron and Baroness began to cry with happiness, 
because they considered Julian to be no less wonderful a son than Lloyd. Suddenly, a Byron ran into their room and told them that Lloyd's belongings sent from Asfahan had arrived. Going outside, the Baron and Baroness stood near a giant mountain of chests with their son's belongings. While Arcas was signing the receipt for the shipment, his wife was enthusiastically examining the jewelry and valuables in the chests. She was thrilled to see such beautiful jewelry. Suddenly she turned her head to her husband and said that they could sell them at a high price for aristocrats. At first, Arcas was a little embarrassed by his wife's behavior, but in a moment he agreed to her offer because he was a happy man. As the baron and his wife walked through the city, they were approached by the townspeople who thanked them for everything they had and wished them a good day. The baron was glad that only good people lived in their estate. However, a moment later, he saw a group of orc laborers with crusts on their shoulders. So he noticed that the orcs were also good. But then one of the orcs did not like something. In front of him stood a group of people who were also dissatisfied. Then the orc and the man bumped shoulders, pushing each other away. The baroness was seriously frightened by this course of events, and the arcane man was embarrassed by what he saw. The man proudly squared his shoulders and showed with his whole appearance that he was stronger than the orc. Then he calmly put his hands on the orc's shoulders and wanted to push him away. Something went wrong, and the orc remained standing, pushing the man away. The baron and baroness were seriously frightened because they did not understand how it would end. Then the man and the orc leaned their foreheads against each other and made a casual gaze. At that moment, the orc made a powerful swing, and the man did not realize what he was doing. The green giant tried to hit the man, but he quickly oriented himself to dodge his blow. In a moment, the orc was lying on the ground upside down. But then he got to his feet because he was not going to give up. He looked proudly at the man and beckoned him to come to him. The man sighed proudly because he was confident in himself and his colleagues. A moment later, he and his workers began to make strange foot movements. And in the end, they all naturally stood on their heads with their hands on the ground. Not wanting to lag behind, the orcs also began to dance with their backs turned to their opponents. The green giants made a weir with their hands and stood behind each other. Then the man and the orc looked into each other's eyes with both fear and pride. The ram and the baroness were embarrassed by the show. But while the orcs and humans were competing with each other, they continued walking happily, noticing that they were all good living organisms. However, in a moment, they doubted their words when they saw the magical skeletons confidently walking to work greeting their owners. But Arcus was happy because the main thing for him was peace in his estate. As the baron and baroness continued to move forward, they noticed a Salito's burning feces. There were also refugees near them who were kneeling down and praising Lloyd while looking at his statue. It all looked strange and the situation in their estate was getting stranger and stranger every time. But still, Lloyd considered himself the happiest man in the whole world. Suddenly, they heard people shouting that Mr. Lloyd had returned. In a moment, they saw Lloyd standing in a cloak half naked over the head of the coachman of their wagon. However, Arcus thought their son was the strangest of all. Lloyd got out of the wagon and saw his parents coming toward him. They grabbed their son in their arms. Although Lloyd was strange, Arcus was still happy. He could have been even happier if his son had started calling him Dad instead of Count. While the skeletons were carrying the jewelry chests, Arcus turned to his son. With tears in his eyes, he looked him in the eye and asked him why he was wearing almost no clothes. Lod smiled and refuted this by saying that they had plenty of clothes at home. Meanwhile, it was a sunny day in the kingdom of Magentano. Count Ventura reported for the queen that as a result of all the negotiations, they had documented all the information and managed to get the magic fingerprint of the Samarkand. The queen said with an uneasy expression that she did not expect him to be able to negotiate alone. The man was embarrassed and agreed with the woman. She then asked if Lloyd had forced him to say this. She also asked what he thought 
they needed for the peaceful life of their people. And the Count replied that they needed a powerful monarch and proper diplomacy. However, the Queen believed that they needed to hire intelligent people as long as they could. The man agreed with the Queen and mentally apologized to the Lord, as he considered him a future corpse. The Queen noted that although the negotiations had gone well, the Asfahan remained their old enemy. Therefore, for their relationship to be beneficial to all of them, they needed to build it on trust. Meanwhile, the Sazerai princess reached the outskirts of the Frontera estate. She knew that this was where Lloyd Frontera lived. She bit her lip and was sure she would get her way this time. Just then, Lloyd's father was calmly trimming the bushes and humming a tune. Suddenly, his peace was interrupted by the princess who addressed him. The man was surprised and asked who she was. The princess introduced herself and said that she was the daughter of the Sultan of Samarkand, who had come from the east of Asfahan. Arcas was extremely surprised and frightened by the girl's background and asked what she wanted. Saradus confidently told him that she had come to see Lloyd Frontera. Then the man asked her in confusion why she wanted his son. For a moment, the girl was embarrassed and did not know what to say. However, she said that she could only sleep when he was around. At first, Arcas did not understand the girl's words, but when he realized it, he was shocked. In his opinion, it was the most stupid thing he had ever done. Meanwhile, the husky was lying on the ground with his eyes closed. When he opened one eye, he didn't realize what was happening. He looked around and realized that he was sitting in a dark cave on some rocks next to a cliff. As he looked around, a yellow light suddenly shone on his face. The man was frightened and looked toward the source of the light. Suddenly, he saw a giant fireball hovering in the air above the cliff in front of him. The fireball began to fill the entire space of the cave, and the silhouette of a figure began to form from the fire. The giant fireman was looking down on Lloyd. Then, from inside the fireman, Lloyd heard a voice greeting him as Lloyd, and a moment later, calling him Kim Su Ho Lloyd's forehead was dripping with sweat as he realized what was happening. He nervously swallowed his saliva, because he thought he was only dreaming. But everything seemed too real to him. Then he asked the fiery figure in a frightened voice who he was. From inside his body, a voice began to come, that said he was the one who could see through. He was the Lord of Hellfire and the King of Hell. At that moment, a man in black clothes named Helcaris began to appear from the fiery figure. Lloyd boldly noticed his power, because he believed that the messenger's reminder of the King of Hell was why he began to dream about him. Helcaris laughed out loud and asked if Lloyd was not afraid of his presence. The king smiled slyly through the flames and asked the man if he still thought it was a dream. But Lloyd said that regardless of whether he was dreaming or not, he was unlikely to come to harm him. He believed that he should not be afraid because the king had even introduced himself to him. The flaming figure towered over Lloyd, who stood boldly looking it in the eye. The flaming figure, with the king inside, approached Lloyd even closer. The Lord of Hellfire said that he liked Lloyd so he suggested that it would be good for him to live with him. However, Lloyd considered it a compliment and said that he wanted to live in a small town with lots of money. The king was surprised that for the sake of such a small dream, he made such a terrible expression that even the night of hell was twisted with fear, and that he sang a song that was more terrifying than any scream. Lloyd was confused because he could not understand why this king was insulting him. Helcaris continued by saying that he was sure that Lloyd would be able to terrify all the inhabitants of his kingdom. During this, LD still did not understand why he was so rude to him. He was worried that if someone else heard him, they would think that Lloyd was some kind of ruthless king or the greatest swordsman. At that moment, the king smiled and asked the Kim dryly what he would say. Then large, strong wooden rods came out of the ground with the intention of grabbing the confused Lloyd. He asked again if Lloyd would come with him to use his talents for his own pleasure. After these words, Helcaris extended his hand toward the man. 
At that moment, Lloyd tried to escape from the strong grip of the wooden vine. However, he could not escape, and the vine gradually wrapped his body from head to toe. Then, the man's messenger told the king not to frighten him so much. For a moment, Hawkeris was silent, sitting in his chair in a hellish posture. He asked Lloyd if they were not two noisy people. The messenger said that he was capable of terrible things and asked the king if he wanted to test him. Hulk looked at Lloyd through his glasses and finally agreed. He said he was willing to play by the rules. And then the king and his figure disappeared into the darkness of the cave without a trace. The wooden vine let go of Lloyd, leaving him standing on a stone slope near the cliff. A moment later, a sweaty Lloyd woke up in horror in his bed. It took him a few minutes to realize that he had fallen and was now in his room. The man got up and thought that if he was so naked, it was hardly a dream. Besides, he did not understand who the king was talking to at the end of their meeting. Suddenly, his thoughts were interrupted by Xavier, who knocked on his door and asked permission to come in. Looking at the master, the man asked why he was sweating so much. However, Lloyd said that even in his sleep he was hot. Xavier said that he had a visitor from far away. Lloyd was embarrassed to hear this. At that moment, Lloyd made a very witty and arrogant look to show his surprise. Xavier was surprised that Lloyd didn't even ask him who had arrived. Angier Lloyd confidently said that it was Princess Saratis. He knew she would come to him because she knew how effective his lullaby was because it is extremely difficult to give it up later. Xavier was embarrassed because he knew that his master had him in mind as well. A moment later, Lloyd and his servant were sitting across from the princess, who asked him to record his lullaby in her magic lair. That was the only reason for her visit. Arcus was both pleased and saddened to hear that she meant only a lullaby. Lloyd thought about it and made a face, asking the princess if he had to do it for nothing. But the girl said with a frown that she would pay him for it. However, Lloyd continued to grimace because he had plenty of money anyway. The princess began to get angry because she did not understand what Lloyd wanted. In a moment, he quickly put a pile of papers on the table in front of her. The man said he would agree to give her what she wanted if she signed a contract. Xavier was nervous and angry, realizing that Lloyd had prepared the contract in advance. The princess was shocked to read that she would have to serve in the Frontera estate for five years, and only after that she would receive her lullaby recording. The girl expressed her indignation, but Lloyd said that since he didn't really need it either, she could not sign the contract. The young frontier said that she could become a sword master if she slept well and trained hard, and Xavier was shocked by how far the owner had calculated everything he realized that it was all for Lloyd to get free labor. However, Lloyd said with the same expression that he was helping people and making their lives better. The messenger said that Lloyd was too out of control to be the good. Then Lloyd decided to close his ears so that he wouldn't hear what the messenger was saying. The princess was furious because she realized that he had been planning this from the beginning. The girl immediately punched Lloyd in the face. And then she stormed out indignantly, calling the man a bastard. The weather was sunny outside, with gentle rays of the sun breaking through the clouds. The angry princess walked through the forest saying that Lloyd was a very mean man. She could not let him play by his rules alone. However, for a moment she thought that she could become a sword master even if she had to sign this contract. And then her father would finally notice her. The princess thought seriously about it. But then she looked around and couldn't figure out where she was. The girl clutched her backpack tightly in her hands and started to look for a way out of the forest. Suddenly, she came to a tree and looked back at the man who was nearby. His red hair shimmered in the bright sun. The princess saw Julian sitting on the trunk of a fallen tree in the middle of the forest. The green-eyed young man was sitting peacefully in the middle of the forest, looking at the ground. The princess wondered why he was sitting there. Julian continued to sit still and look at the ground. The princess continued to look at him in silence, and he looked very fragile and defenseless, 
like a little white rabbit who could be eaten at any moment. But a moment later, the boy raised his head and looked sadly ahead. Not far from him stood his carriage and his servants, with a huge stone in their way, preventing them from moving. Suddenly Julian ran up to the knight and asked for permission to help them. But the knight said that he could not let such an important person grease his hands because of this. Then the young man said that there are times when the situation forces you to anoint your hands, so he wanted to help. But the knight would not allow him to do so, explaining that their mission was to escort him to his homeland. Then Julian furrowed his brow and took off his shirt, showing everyone his body. The knights who accompanied him were shocked to see such a relief. Meanwhile, the princess was watching the Julian from behind a tree. Looking at the young man, she imagined a cute bunny with muscles. Then Julian and the knights stood against the stone and ordered everyone to push it with all their might on the count of three. The princess thought that if this young man was returning from the capital, he must be Lloyd's younger brother. In this way, he was very different from the trash she had seen. Later, Julian stopped and said that for better results they needed to dig around the stone with a shovel. He had seen it before and knew that there was nothing the shovel could not handle. Suddenly, the princess came up to him and said that it would take her all day to come up with this idea, so she offered to help them. The young man was surprised to see the girl in the middle of the forest. Julian was ashamed of the beauty of the princess, and it seemed to him that everything began to blossom around him. The girl pulled out her sword so that her help would be an advantage for Julian during the negotiations with the lord. The princess calmly pulled her hand back and made a powerful swing toward the stone. In a moment, she shattered the rock into dozens of square stones that flew to the sides, towards the frightened knights who could not believe their eyes. After that, the girl quickly holstered her sword. As a result, the road was free for travel, but covered with square fragments of stones. Julian was shocked by what he saw. He covered his torso with his shirt, thanked her, and asked her who she was. The girl introduced herself and told him that it was currently staying at the Frontera estate. Julian froze in place looking at the beautiful princess. Meanwhile, in the city, Miss Emily was walking down the road with a bag of groceries in her hands. On her way, she met an orc with a crust on his shoulder. It was a red-haired orc named Kuga. The woman kindly remarked that she had not seen him in these parts for a long time. When she passed by, she noticed that the orc looked down and was thinking. The orc was collecting his thoughts to decide how to start his dialogue. But later, when the woman was hanging up the laundry, he turned to her. Standing in front of her, he asked Emily if she loved Sergeant Gregg. The woman was surprised for a moment by this question. But then she sincerely replied that he was the most important person in the world to her. The orc gritted his teeth and began to shake just thinking about the sergeant. The woman was surprised by the orc's reaction. Just then he remembered how Gregg flirted with some girl and made her laugh. Then the other orcs laughed with them until they cried. Kuga stood still among the white sheets. He knew that this love had no chance at first, so he did not want to hurt her feelings by saying unnecessary things. When the frowning orc was about to leave, Emily wanted to stop him. However, she could only watch the Kuga walk away. Sitting in the workshop with the wooden table, Emily let out a sad sigh. Greg said, that she could plunge the whole world into sadness with her sadness. So he asked her what was wrong. She asked her brother if it would be strange for a human girl to fall in love with an orc warrior, since said it already sounded strange enough. After all, if her family found out about it, it would be a disaster. Suddenly he realized who he was talking about. The man remembered how the Kuga had yelled at him when he tried to defend himself for Emily. He broke out in a sweat and realized that this was the bastard he was talking about. Meanwhile, the Baron was sitting at the dinner table and could not stop his tears. He could not believe what good men his sons had become. However, the embarrassed Lloyd said that the Count had probably drunk too much. But the Princess said 
that she understood their father's reaction because his sons were really good. Then the girl remembered her father, who wanted her to seduce Lloyd or become a swordsman to make the sultan proud. Holding a piece of meat on her fork, she felt a little sad. Julian told his father that as soon as he got his appointment, he would try even harder. But Arcas said that everything was fine. The Baron continued to cry because he was happy to get what he wanted. He said that he would be happy if his sons were just there for him. At that moment, the girl was shocked by the words of the Arcas. A tear ran down her cheek. At the same moment, the girl got up from her seat, and Lloyd did not understand what happened. The girl gloomily left the table and told everyone present that she was leaving. Lloyd carelessly asked her when they could return to the negotiations. However, the princess said that Lloyd could forget about it. For Julian, this sounded too emotionless. He looked after the young princess and remained silent. Watching his brother, Lloyd did not understand what was happening to his face. The princess left the room and continued to cry with her hand over her eyes. At night, a full blue moon peeked out from among the clouds. Lloyd looked out of his window, because he noticed something strange. He saw the Saratus princess walking toward the exit of the mansion with a backpack on her shoulders. Suddenly Lloyd's face changed because he saw something strange. At that moment, Julian was chasing the princess to stop her. Through the glass, Lloyd saw Julian talking to the girl about something. His eyes were wide with surprise and curiosity. He noticed that the princess's face immediately turned red because she was ashamed. Lloyd thought he had hit a very big and unexpected jackpot. Julian asked the princess where she was going so late at night. He also asked if she was running away from the estate in such a way. The princess was embarrassed by the young man's words and feelings. The girl said she just wanted to go for a walk, and Julian exhaled because he was afraid she would leave. She had a very big bag with her, so he thought she was trying to run away. But the girl explained that it contained all her lunchboxes. Julian was very surprised at first, but then said that she would not sleep well if she ate so much at night. The princess said that she wanted to eat most of it, or rather all of it was for a picnic. She realized that her excuses were getting more and more ridiculous. But Julian said he was glad to hear it. After all, during dinner, he thought something was wrong with the girl. He was very worried about her. The girl was sincerely touched by Julian's concern for her. However, she said that she was fine now. They continued to stand in front of each other as the moon illuminated their figures. The princess said that perhaps she should stay a few more days. Looking at all this, Lloyd made an awfully happy expression. Suddenly, at the same moment, Xavier approached him and frightened him. Xavier wanted Lloyd to sing him a lullaby, but he never came to him. Xavier also asked why he had such a face when watching a couple in love. And Lloyd asked how the servant knew they were in love. However, Xavier knew this feeling very well because he had felt the loving gaze of girls more than once. Xavier supported his master because he realized that he had never felt this way. He also added that if Lloyd didn't envy them, he wouldn't let him destroy Julian's love. The messenger confirmed that Lloyd was capable of such a thing, but the front man got angry at him for insulting him. Lloyd said he would be a real Cupid for Julian. After meeting with the queen, he realized something. He had made many enemies with his skills and information about the future. The man remembered the queen's words that he would work as long as he could. Realizing this, he decided that he had to leave, and this particular pair was to be the key to his salvation. Subsequently, when the Bibin was in the river, the city grew significantly in the amount of development. A red-haired orc was walking down the road with a pickaxe in his hands. Suddenly, a sin approached him and asked if he was the Kuga. The orc immediately told him not to try to provoke him into a conflict because he had no desire to fight. Then the sin smiled slyly and put his hand behind his back to take something out. Suddenly, he launched a paper airplane toward the orc. 
The airplane crashed into the unyielding Kugu and crumpled a little. Sin told him to come in the evening to the place indicated in the letter to the airplane. Kuga silently read the letter carefully, turning the airplane around. He said that an orc warrior would never abandon a battle started by someone else. However, at that moment he changed his mind after snatching the letter. When evening came, the romantic Julian sat in front of the window because he could not stop thinking about her, about her silken hair and eyes that shone brighter than any pearls, and also about her sadness in her heart which was hidden behind a strong spirit. Thinking about this, Julian bowed his head and felt a little sad. Suddenly, Lloyd came to his head and asked him if this was not love. Julian was ashamed and did not understand how his brother had read his thoughts. Lloyd asked the boy if he was right. Then Julian became even more embarrassed and looked away. When Lloyd started calling him his precious little brother, Julian felt disgusted. Lloyd said that tomorrow he would record a lullaby for the princess, so she would probably come home then. Lloyd wanted to emphasize his words to Julian's attention, so he left the room and made an imitation echo that repeated that she might come home. Julian was embarrassed because he did not know how to react. Meanwhile, when Kuga arrived at the meeting place, he saw a group of workers with Greg. Behind the Kuga was a group of orcs who said, that they had to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Sin laughed and said he was glad the orcs had caught him. After all, he wanted to resolve the relationship between orcs and humans forever. The next morning, when the princess was walking around the estate, Lloyd was surprised to see her. However, the girl immediately reflexively hit Lloyd in the face, even though he hadn't said anything yet. While lying on the floor, Lloyd said that Julian was very smart so he could get an appointment in the capital soon, and maybe even tomorrow. At that moment, Lloyd used his trick again with a repeated echo of the words that Julian would leave this place. The princess was confused, and a tear ran down her face at these words. In the evening, Julian sat sadly on the bed and realized that she was leaving. The princess, on the other hand, sat in her room and sadly realized that she would never see him again. At that moment, Julian nervously tapped his fingers on the table and decided that he would not let this happen. At the same moment, Julian quickly went to the princess. At that moment, the girl also rushed to meet the boy to tell him. Lloyd, meanwhile, was sitting at the table with a corn cigar between his fingers. The city was covered in twilight, and the Kuga stood stoutly on the slope near the city. Suddenly, the orc heard a strange rustling behind him. Standing at the door, Julian thought that if he did not tell her about his feelings, he would regret it all his life, just like the princess. And at the moment when the two of them decided, the boy and the girl knocked on the same door at the same time. Then Kuga saw Emily coming to meet him, who also did not expect to see him here. After all, she came here at her brother's request. At that moment, Sin and his soldiers rushed out of the bushes in their direction and the orcs also rushed from the other side toward them. Sleepy Baron and Baroness opened the door of their room. On the threshold, they saw the young princess sitting on her knees, with her hands folded in front of her. When Kuga noticed the orcs and soldiers, he got scared and held Emily tightly to him. Sin turned to his sister and the orc to make an important announcement. Amidst a standing ovation and flower petals, the man said that today was their first day as a couple. At that moment, Princess Saradas bowed to Julian's parents and asked for his hand in marriage. Lloyd laughed out loud at the table, because after that even the queen would not be able to handle him. Soon the queen arrived at the foot of the dark palace of the wizard Targo. The queen made a wave of her hand to give a command to her troops. A moment later, she ordered them to open fire on the wizard's castle. Then thousands of fiery red arrows flew toward the palace of the wizard Targo. The walls of the palace immediately burst into flames. Suddenly, the servants in the palace began to run away because they could not understand how these arrows knew about their place. Meanwhile, the experienced magicians used their magic to defend the palace from the Magento Queen. 
The magicians and knights rushed into battle, ready missions flying in all directions. Suddenly, the scream of an unknown hideous creature spread throughout the palace. A giant clawed paw of the monster that was supposed to protect the palace emerged from the darkness. The hideous creature stepped into the light and shocked everyone with its presence. At that moment, the leader of the magicians ordered all the others to use the fiery punishment on them. The monster rushed at the soldiers, breaking everything in its path. The monster broke through the floor as it approached the knights. The queen ordered all her soldiers to retreat. Then the monster screamed loudly in their direction. The knights went out into the courtyard to wait for the queen's order. The military section reported that there were five wounded among them, and only one among the mages. But at that moment, they realized that they had lost the queen in the palace. Meanwhile, the queen stood bravely in combat readiness in front of the monster. She was holding her sword in her hands, which was glowing with a pink glow. At the same moment, she made a powerful swing at the monster. The queen launched several volleys of mana attacks at the monster. It continued to stand on its feet and fight the queen. A moment later, the giant began to exhale green magical smoke from its mouth. Then the queen covered her face with her cloak because she knew it was poison. The queen's eyes were full of rage because she realized that the poison was created by magic. It didn't matter to her, though, because she had been practicing all along to resist any poison. When the monster was finished, the queen exhaled and walked down the corridor. The woman approached the door of the ceremonial hall, sword in hand. The queen was ready to meet with the Targa magician. Upon entering the hall, she saw a giant pedestal with a large skull of an unknown creature next to which stood a man in a robe. The man looked nervously at the queen because he was not expecting such a guest. The queen proudly asked him if he was the Targa magician. The man was embarrassed to see the queen's confident face. However, in a moment, he was sweating and bowed his head in despair. The queen asked him how he dared to create a rebellion against her kingdom, because she was going to punish him for it. With a light wave of her hand, she beheaded the magician. After that, the man fell to his knees on the red carpet. When his body stopped moving completely, the woman holstered her sword and said it was over. But suddenly the queen's eyes and mine became blurred. When it passed, she did not realize what had happened to her at that moment. She took her hand away from her face, and then one of her eyes turned red and veined. Meanwhile, Julian and the Sazerite stood by the wedding pedestal. The princess was happy to be standing in her wedding dress next to her groom. Julian was also happy looking at his beautiful princess. Then Arcas cried like never before, although he tried to hold himself back. Even the sturdy Byron shed a tear when the guests applauded the newlyweds. All the inhabitants of the city, along with orcs, elves, and dwarves, came to celebrate the occasion. Lloyd was terribly happy about this event. Xavier asked his master to go home so as not to spoil such a wonderful celebration. The servant did not understand the master's intentions when he said that this would allow him to avoid being an eternal slave to the queen. Lloyd smiled and told Xavier to think better. After all, at that time he was important to both countries. Although he was a citizen of Magentano, he was also a relative of Samarkand. Laud thought that perhaps the sultan had realized what he had been pretending to be in the case of the sandworm. This meant that the sultan still wanted him for himself. So if the queen tried to use him as a slave, he would simply run away to Samarkand to be there. Xavier understood his master and cringed at his negative aura. Lloyd was surprised that Xavier didn't say anything else after hearing his grandiose plans. Although he still couldn't defeat the queen, he could use his relationship with the Samarkand to his advantage. At that moment, Samarkand was watching his daughter's wedding through a magic mirror. The sultan was moved, and a tear ran down his cheek. Lloyd wished happiness to his dear brother and princess Saratsid. Happiness in a city where there would be no constant pursuit of success. And there was no father who would put pressure on her. Suddenly Emily said, 
that she wanted the bride to finally throw the bouquet as hard as possible. Then the princess made a powerful swing and threw the bouquet with all her might like a spear. Emily did not even realize when the bouquet flew past her like a bullet. The bouquet was on fire flying through the streets of the city. And at one point a strong man's hand grabbed the burning flowers with a pink ribbon. It was a solitaire's who then carved a cute duckling from a piece of wood. Looking at the happy princess, Lloyd remembered that in the novel she died defending Samarkand from the rebels. And at that moment, she was walking happily next to his brother in a white dress. Lloyd liked that feeling, even though he hadn't made any money from it. The man's thoughts were interrupted by a messenger who appeared in front of him. He told the man that he had saved another person from a sad end. But Lloyd already knew this, so he didn't understand why the messenger was telling him about it. At that moment, the number of lives and destinies he had saved began to rapidly increase on his screen. Lloyd was surprised to see that the number had exceeded several hundred. Meanwhile, the total number of lives saved exceeded four million. Lloyd's eyes grew wide at the sheer magnitude of the number. Finally, when the counting was over, the man saw that he had saved more than 23 million lives. He did not understand where this figure came from, because he thought that there should have been no more than a hundred. The messenger told the Lloyd that he would be awarded extra points as a reward for saving lives. And if he absorbs more than 50,000 points, a new skill will become available to him that will expand the functions of the final spoiler. The man has mastered the right to use the strongest gaze in the world. This skill could allow him to use first-class strength for 30 seconds. When the workers were taking the chairs away from the ceremony, Lloyd thought that this would not be enough for him, because it couldn't make him the strongest. And although he doubted that this would happen, he thought that if he had to fight the strongest, he would lose. Then the messenger clarified that in order to use this skill, he would have to refuse his support. This meant that all his skills and final spoilers would become unavailable. Lloyd made a face because he was very upset to hear such conditions. Then Lloyd said that he would not use this skill because without his skills, all his work would go down the drain. At that moment, Lloyd was interrupted by the Count who came up to him. Lloyd said that he had played the role of the pastor quite well. In return, the Count thanked Lloyd for his help in getting the Magentans and Asfahans to sign a peace treaty. However, Lloyd said that he did not take much credit for this because the negotiations were initiated by the Count and his younger brother married. Grab made a bow and apologized to Lloyd for humiliating him and called him a real hero. Then he said that he shouldn't worry because he was really a mercenary man. He didn't want to be made into a hero and draw attention to it. It was enough for Lloyd to be a good person. And the Count told him not to hide his merits, because the Queen had already guessed everything. He then added that the Queen had sent him to this place not only to perform the wedding ceremony, but also to take Lloyd to the capital. Hearing this, Lloyd realized that this was the right moment to pretend to be sick. He pretended that he had a lump in his throat and coughed in front of the Count. The young front told him, that he was a little sick and needed to recover in the Asfahan. However, the Count still insisted that the Queen wanted to see him. This disappointed the young frontier very much. He thought that the Queen would think that her husband came only when he needed her. Lloyd remembered when the Queen grabbed him by the face and asked him if he was selfish enough to do that. But Lloyd had no choice but to go with Xavier to the Queen's palace. Following the guard through the Queen's palace, Lloyd walked towards her with a very upset face. In a moment, the man was sitting on the floor in front of the Queen with a sour face. The woman was glad that Lloyd came to her of his own free will. After all, she could have invaded his estate out of a broken heart. If she had done so, Lloyd would have immediately fled to the Asfahan, which would have hurt her more. Lloyd sat dejectedly, and tried to understand what the queen meant. Then the woman told him to stay within the bounds of what was permitted, and there would be peace. The man said that he would not dare to ignore her request, and asked what she wanted, 
thinking that he could somehow negotiate with her to avoid the fate of lifelong slavery. The woman got up from the table and said she had something to show the Lord. As the guard stood at the entrance to the queen's palace, Lloyd looked forward with excitement, asking the queen what it was. He saw giant dragon bones lying right in front of him. The queen said that they had found them in the wizard's vault and that they probably used them for some kind of ritual. Then Lloyd remembered that in the novel it was said that dragon bones could be used to make various magical objects. When he thought about it, he was already salivating over them. The woman said that if they used these bones, they would show the power of the kingdom of Magentano. The woman asked the abbot to build a large garden behind the castle and to place a statue with the dragon bones in the center as a monument to the kingdom that defeated the dragon. Lloyd realized that it was time for Kim to use his social skills. Lloyd thanked the queen for such a wonderful task and a great honor for him. And as a sign of his sincerity to her, he said that he would not take payment. Then the queen asked what he wanted, and the Lord asked for immunity from hard labor for the next ten years. At first the queen did not understand what Lloyd was talking about, but in a moment she was like an angry red lion. And Lloyd was the one who walked on a tightrope over this angry lion, keeping his balance so as not to fall into its mouth. After all, he had crossed the line a little bit. However, the man got his bearings and said that if it was too much for her, she could give him only one bone from the dragon's tail. The furious queen immediately punched Lloyd in the face. The man grabbed his head and did not understand why the woman reacted in such a way. But a moment later she smiled and said that after the blow she decided to be generous with him. The woman allowed him to take the bone but gave him something else in return. The man was sincerely happy and allowed her to strike him a thousand times or step on him. The queen did not want to kill him, so she ordered him to leave. Lloyd was pleased because he knew that he would receive an incredible reward. However, he still did not want to work. Lloyd wanted to receive money just to live his life to his heart's content. Suddenly, a respectable man came into the room where Lloyd was sitting with a pile of papers in his hands. He introduced himself as Vikind, an expert in garden design. Vikin intended to discuss their cooperation with Lloyd, but when he saw that he was so young, he was very surprised at his skill. After all, Wendo was a simple peasant and had worked for more than thirty years to acquire the necessary skills and build his reputation. He believed that the quality of his work was significantly different from Lloyd's abilities. When the windows tried to start a dialogue, Lloyd immediately said that he was just a guy who was lucky to be here and gain experience from an expert. After all, he could not even dream of working with such a respected and skillful window dresser. Lloyd said that he wanted to learn from him while being close to him. The Viscount was very surprised by the man's words, so he froze in a stupor for a moment. But in a moment, he was sincerely happy with the man's words. The next day, Vicomte showed Lloyd the plan of the entire garden to get his opinion. Lloyd expressed his incredible admiration for the Viscount's skill in depicting and detailing the plan. Then, when the Viscount wanted to hear more from Lloyd, he continued to praise his skills and call the expert a genius. Suddenly, the Viscount said that he had done everything himself and that Lloyd was useless. And the young frontline worker agreed without any argument. Later, Window left to do some research and told Lloyd not to bother him, to which he agreed. Lloyd watched the happy Window disappear into the forest. Then Lloyd turned around and walked to a hammock hanging between two trees. The man laid down and made a terribly happy expression because he realized that he had hit an incredible jackpot. It was only thanks to hard-working and competent people like the Viscount that someone like him could have fun and still make money. Later, night fell, and a big blue moon illuminated the outskirts of the city. Guards with torches continued to stand guard at the entrance to the queen's palace. There were also guards near the dragon's skull. Suddenly, a pink magical glow appeared in one of the skull's eye sockets. 
From there came the voice of the Targa saying that he never gives up. The magical glow began to expand, and the voice grew louder. The Targa said that he would take revenge on Alicia Mojantano and destroy them all.